What I do here, uh, and this is the last time I'm going to do it, I, I understand that I'm doing it right now and I'm doing what I say I'm about to not to do. That was a sentence. I shut up during these and I just listen. So I'm going to unmute this and this is the last time you'll hear me blabber over them. We'll take your question. You can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue at any time. Your phones are on mute now and the operator will open your mic uh, when we're ready for you to ask your question and close your mic after you ask your question. We ask that you please stick to one question and identify to whom your question is directed. And shortly after we conclude, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference online. First, we'll hear from Tom Whitmire. Okay, thank you, Catherine. First, I wanted to thank everybody. I know we were slightly delayed today. Uh, we didn't want to interfere with the press conference that just took place. And we'll try to keep it short because there's a lot of global events going on right now. We're respectful of your time. So we'll, we'll try not to spend too much time on this telecon today. It's been about three weeks since we got together. And so I'll talk a little bit about the work that's taking place at the Cape, kind of how we're doing in High Bay 3. I'll turn it over to Mike Boulder. He's going to talk about the actual role event, what's going to take place during the role and how that looks. And then Mike Serafin, who's here with me, will talk to you a little bit about uh, things that will take place for the wet dress rehearsal. We'll come back and talk to you again right before the roll and give you some updates at that point again. And then we'll talk to you again right before wet dress rehearsal. So we're, we're hoping to have an ongoing dialogue with you so you can ask any questions you have along the way. Uh, with that, let me go ahead and get started. I'm just going to say a few things. When we we talked last, we you know we mentioned that we had some punch list items that we needed to complete on the vehicle. That work's gone very well. They've uh, Mike and his team down in Florida have done a wonderful job uh, completing uh, the necessary work on the vehicle to prepare it for roll. And while we still have some work to do, and I suspect we'll do a little bit more after wet dress rehearsal, for the most part, that work's gone very well, and Mike and his team has done a very good job. The other thing we talked about was the flight termination system test, the FTS test. And last time we talked about that, that was the last major test that we needed to do in the VAB before we headed out to the pad. Uh, we just completed the last portion of that test yesterday. We're still analyzing the data from the test, but overall that testing has gone very well. And so we're excited about that for two reasons. One, it is the last test that we needed to do, and the hardware has performed uh, very well, and so we're very happy with that. And the second thing is that by completing that test, that gives us the opportunity to close out the vehicle and prepare it for roll. And so a lot of times in our industry, we uh, aerospace industry, we use nautical terms. I'll probably use a few nautical terms as I describe uh, what's taking place there, just so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, on the SLS, there's, and, and I'm with Orion, there's a number of things we call volumes. And the volumes is interior space in the vehicle. And we go into those volumes to, with uh, men and women, technicians and engineers, to uh, complete uh, integration of the vehicle, which is done at this point. And then we also go into those volumes to actually do test activities. Uh, and what, what we're doing at that point, like when we do an FTS test, we actually go, have to go into the vehicle, through the hatch, through some platforms, out to some avionics boxes, and we'll do an end-to-end -end test for continuity, and we have to be at both ends to do that, inside the vehicle and outside the vehicle. We also use test ports. And so why it's so important for us to have completed the FTS testing is we now have the ability to close these volumes out and get ready for the roll. Uh, the volumes are located uh, up and down the vertical stack. We have a volume in the engine section at the bottom. We have a volume at the inner tank section, which is the, in the middle of the vehicle. We have a volume at the forward segment, which is the top of the LOX tank. We have the L launch vehicle spacecraft adapter, which is a volume, which is where the ICPS is located. And Orion itself is a volume. And each of these volumes, we have a number of platforms. And so what they're doing right now is they're closing out the volumes. They're literally backing out of the volume, removing platforms as they go along, and they do inspections. And they'll do a visual inspection and then they take pictures. And what they're doing at this point is they're just making sure that we haven't disturbed anything as we've been in these volumes, doing the work of the technicians and making sure everything's ready to be buttoned up and for us to close the hatch and prepare for the roll. So those are the closeout activities that are taking place right now. That's, a, that's kind of getting ready to, if you, if you go from the, nautical uh, motif. It's kind of getting the ship ready to, to go on a journey. Uh, the other thing is that we will, as we close out the volumes, there's a large platforms that we use to access the volumes. 
These platforms are the size of a basketball court. They're very big. There's 10 of them on each side of the vehicle. They meet in the middle. And so there's 20 platforms altogether. And what they're doing right now is they're clearing the platform. So as we close out a volume and close the hatch behind us, we actually clear off the deck. And what they're doing there is a lot of equipment we leave on these uh, decks and the platforms to support operations in the vehicle, uh, tables and access points and scaffolding and things of that nature. And they're literally removing that uh, from those areas as we close out the decks. And then the final thing they're going to do is they secure the vehicle. We actually have an umbilical access arm that gets retracted back and held in place. And then we do some final um, efforts with the vehicle to prepare it for roll. And we actually have to transfer from the ground support we have in the VAB to the mobile launcher support that we have, and then we do the roll. So those, those are, uh, Captain, those are the things that we're working on in the vehicle. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and he's going to talk about the actual roll activity that's about to come up. Mike, Mike Bolger. Yeah. yeah, hey, thanks, Tom. Um, and, and just as a reminder, because I know Exploration Ground Systems as a program is a little less familiar maybe than SLS and Orion, but we're the program at Kennedy responsible for the launch infrastructure here, the ground systems and the software. Um, and then we also perform the ground operations, the, you know, the integration, the work that Tom's talking about, the processing and the launch of SLS and Orion, and then the recovery of Orion off the coast of San Diego. So that's who we are. Um, yeah, rollout. So um, something that we've been looking forward to for a really long time. Um, the crawler transporter will transport the it's, – it's over 17 million pound stack to launch Complex 39B. Um, the top of the ML umbilical tower will be about 400 feet off the ground um, when it's riding on top of the crawler transporter. So it's really going to be a sight. First motion in the VAB is planned for early evening. We're targeting 6 p.m. Um, on March the 17th. Um, we normally start rolling at midnight, if you remember from the shuttle program, but we're pulling the start forward a little bit to make it easier for our team and their families, um, as well as the media and as well as the other stakeholders to be a part of it. Um, it's something that we're all really looking forward to. Um, it takes about an hour if things go well to move from the high bay to just outside of the VAB. Once outside, we retract the crew access arm and head to the pad. We've actually had to extend it just to fit through the doors, the, the enormous roll-up doors on the side of the VAB. Um, from there, it's about an 11-hour trip from the VAB to hard down at the pad. During the roll, we'll utilize a range of speeds. Some are to gather additional engineering dynamic response data. That's one of the tests that we're actually doing as we roll. Um, the speed profiles range from about 0.1 miles per hour, so that's really slow, up to 0.82 miles per hour. The, the slower speeds are for when we're departing the VAB and as we get positioned at the pad, the 0.82 is the cruising speed, if you will, um, and it's used for a significant portion of the four-mile journey. Um, the next time when we roll, when we actually roll out from launch, we'll refer to that four-mile trip as the first four miles and NASA's return to the moon. Um, once at the pad, the team will begin lowering the mobile launcher interface platforms and connecting the mobile launcher to the pad services, such as chilled water, fire suppression, power, compressed air, et cetera. Um, following the pad connects, we'll perform testing to validate mobile launcher to the pad interfaces. Um, then we'll perform some testing that couldn't have been performed indoors inside the VAB, some, some guidance and navigation and control testing and some RF testing. Um, we'll do booster hydrazine servicing, and then we'll get into preps for the wet dress rehearsal. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Serafin. He's going to talk a little bit about um, wet dress rehearsal itself. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so for the wet dress rehearsal, there's a couple of phases to that Jeremy, test. No, uh, the not. first is really the setup phase, which starts about two days prior to the, uh, the, the uh, T0 or test window open point. And uh, really what that is is launch site activation. Uh, the, the teams come into the launch control center, activate the, the, um, the consoles that are used to provide command and control team gets settled in and uh, they, uh, they also check out all their interfaces with the Eastern Range. They check out their connectivity with Mission Control in Houston and the SLS Engineering Support Facilities in Huntsville, Alabama, um, and then begin the power up of the rocket and the spacecraft. So that's kind of phase one. Phase two is, is the actual cryo loading operation. It begins with a uh, tanking um, meeting where we, where we meet about uh, eight and a half hours prior to uh, the opening of the test window, and we look at the health and status of the vehicle, we look at the health and status of the ground site, the team's overall readiness, and then the environmental conditions, including weather, if there's any lightning or anything like that before we get into the hazardous operation. So that's kind of phase two. 
Um, and then and then we begin the cryo loading, which is which is really the the third phase. And we enter um, a fast fill phase and a slow fill phase, and then and then a stable replenish once we get both the core stage and then the uh, upper stage, the arm cryo propulsion stage, loaded with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And it's it's a multi-step process. Uh, there's fast fill for the core. There's fast fill for the for the upper stage. There's fast fill on the hydrogen side. There's fast fill on the on the oxygen side. And then we do the same thing with the uh, um, the slow fill and stable replenish. So it's a multi-step process. And then we get into the test um, activities itself after we've loaded the cryo. Uh, we, uh, we have a unique test setup. Uh, we don't plan on doing this on the real day of launch, but for the purposes of this test, the wet dress rehearsal, uh, we are going to demonstrate our ability to count and then hold within the count inside of the terminal count phase, which is inside of 10 minutes. We'll go down to about a minute and a half. We'll hold uh, for about three minutes. And then we'll demonstrate the ability to recycle back to the T minus 10 minute hold point, um, which is kind of a, 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 a stable set point that we can uh, resume a countdown from. Uh, once we get into the uh, the recycle and are holding at T minus 10 minutes, then we'll we'll do kind of our our fourth and final phase of the uh, of the um, of the wet dress rehearsal, which is the countdown leading to a scrub set of conditions. We'll do a manual cutoff at 9.34 seconds, which is just before we ignite the uh, RS-25 engines. So we're going to get very very late in the count uh, purposefully and demonstrate all the interfaces and, and hand over from the ground launch sequencer to the onboard vehicle and the automated launch sequencer. And then um, that will initiate a scrub and then the, the team will detank the uh, core stage uh, cryo as well as the upper stage, you know, cryo propulsion stage cryo, and then safe the vehicle on the pad. So those are those are the activities that we have ahead of us as part of the wet dress rehearsal. In parallel with that, we continue to get ready to fly across the board, and, and the team will be ready to fly when the flight hardware is ready. Uh, right now, we are working uh, through the uh, early phases of our flight readiness review process. I've spent three of the last four weeks sitting through a, uh, a review of the Orion spacecraft uh, that happened four weeks ago, uh, through a uh, review of the Space Launch System rocket that happened two weeks ago, and through a review of our cross-program and interfaces uh, that, that happened last week. Um, I'm very impressed with the team's thoroughness and their ability to communicate um, not only our ability to achieve a mission success, and risk to mission success, but also risk to flight safety. Um, you know, we do fly a, a very energetic vehicle. It's a very large vehicle um, under um, under um, uh, challenging conditions through uh, through ascent and through deep space and then entry and splashdown. And the team has its hands around the uh, the risk that that's ahead of us. And then also in parallel with that, since we have a little more time here, uh, we are. Uh, maintaining proficiency as part of our uh, overall team readiness, and we're conducting a proficiency training activity next Wednesday. Um, and we'll, I'll, I myself will be in Mission Control in Houston with our flight team, our engineering support, our recovery uh, team members, and, and we're going to simulate our uh, uh, three days before splashdown uh, decision gate where we pick our landing site based on weather. So we'll exercise all of our teams, all of our interfaces, and we continue to work together well as a team and, and maintain currency and proficiency, um, again, to be ready to, uh, to execute when the, when the flight hardware is ready. So, so that's it for me. Uh, Catherine, I, I guess I'll turn it back to you and see if, to, if you have anything else to add before we take questions. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin the question and answer portion. Uh, please remember to stick to one question and identify to whom it is directed. If we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. Again, you can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the queue at any time, and you can enter star two if you'd like to be removed from the queue if, if your question has already been addressed and you'd like to withdraw your question. Um, so first we will go to Gina Sinceri from ABC News. Uh, good afternoon. Just checking in, given where you are with rollout, where you think you'll be with rollout and wet dress, what launch uh, time frame do you think you're realistically looking at? Okay, Gina, this is Tom. Let me see if I can answer that for you. Um, and I think we talked about this three weeks ago. First of all, as you know, um, it was a good question. The, um, the, what the agency is waiting to do is wait to see when we have the wet dress rehearsal and see how we're doing uh, in terms of the vehicle uh, opportunities for launch. And we'll set the launch date at that point. And the reason we do that is because the, 
Uh, wet dress rehearsal is a complicated test. The mobile launcher itself is very complicated. And so we're, you know, we, we continue to evaluate the, the May window, um, but we're also recognizing that there's a lot of work in front of us and we need to make sure we get through that testing and through that um, evaluation activity before we set a uh, launch commitment date. Thank you. Our next question is from Kristen Fisher of CNN. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for doing this. My question is for Tom Whitmire, and I know we're supposed to be focused on Artemis today, but uh, given everything that's been going on, My responsibility is to prepare this vehicle for launch. Uh, so all I can really talk to today is um, the work that we need to do at the at the at the Cape to prepare for the rollout. And from that perspective, you know, we've got all the hardware, the vehicles there. So we're not going to be directly impacted. But I'm only you know one part of the agency, and therefore I can't really answer that question for you. I'm sure uh, Catherine, if you let Catherine know, she could follow up separately, and we'll get the right people to answer the question for you. Yeah, Kristen, you can reach out to me and uh, we will connect you with somebody for an answer. Um, our next question is from Jeff Faust of Space News. Uh, good afternoon. I'm um, just curious, uh, sort of a nominal timeline, how long do you expect to have the vehicle on the pad for the wet dress rehearsal? And you mentioned you would have some more work to do once you roll it back after wet dress. What sort of additional work would you have to do back in the VAB after wet dress before rolling out for launch? Thanks. I can, I can, Jeff, I'll take a, this time, I'll take an initial hit at that, and Mike Bolger will correct anything I'm missing. It's about two weeks between when we get to the pad to the point that we're able to do the wet dress rehearsal. Uh, we'll do the wet dress rehearsal. Of course, it happens a lot to do with happens, what happens during the wet dress rehearsal if we um, have to um, spend any extra time at the wet dress rehearsal. They do some work after the wet dress rehearsal. We get back into the VAB, where there's work that we conduct in the VAB. But that period of time between wet dress and going into the VAB, and what we do in the VAB is highly dependent on what we see during the wet dress rehearsal. So that's where it's really hard for me to give you a, a specific timeline. And then Mike, and I don't know if you want to add to that, Mike, uh, Mike Serafin. Yeah, um, Tom and, and Mike Bolger, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but nominally it's, uh, it's about a month uh, that we expect to be at the pad between the time that we roll out execution of wet dress and then and then roll back to the VAB. So, as, as Tom Whitmire said, there are there is some variability in that. Um, you know, there's there's some very simple reasons why it may take a little bit longer. Like we could find ourselves um, behind the timeline if if weather conditions are set up for multiple days where the the conditions are are not favorable at the pad. Um, but then there's also the possibility of um, just you know a technical glitch here or there that we'll just have to work our way through. Uh, Mike Bolger, if you have anything to add. And uh, I think y'all covered it pretty well. I think he also asked, you know, kind of what happens after that. I'll, I'll try to talk to that a little bit. Um, so let's see, when, when we get back to the VAB, obviously we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to extend platforms. We're going to reestablish access. Um, we're going to be doing some sensor removals for sensors that were specific to the wet dress test. Um, we're going to do. We're going to be doing the flight termination system um, final battery installations. We're going to be running some confidence tests and checkouts on that system. We've got some late um, crew module stows that we're going to do. Um, also in Orion, we're going to be doing a, a our last battery charge um, and a software load, topping off some GN2 um, in the. On the second stage, we've got a, a flight computer that we're going to be um, installing um, and running some tests on. Um, and then on the core stage, we've got some antenna closeouts um, and let's see, and some foam repairs that, that are built into our plan. So um, there's a there's a you know a fair amount of work still to go, but um, you know all things that I think we understand well, um, and and you know we'll look to turn around pretty quickly. Thank you. Our next question is from Irene Klotz. 
Thanks, Catherine. Um, I wanted to ask a question I asked uh, three weeks ago to see if there were any updates on it, um, if there are any operational constraints for 39A YSLS, is that 39B or any other operators at KSC or Cape Canaveral, um, and specifically if SpaceX uh, would be allowed to fly the uh, AX-1 mission with SLS at the pad? Thanks. Yeah, Irene, and that was a good question, uh, and I think we talked to Mike about that a little, Mike Bolger about that a little bit for today. So, Mike, uh, why don't we go ahead and, 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 and provide the update? Yeah, I mean, really, the, the operational constraint, um, it, while, while they're on launch day at Pad A, um, we'll stand down from activities during the launch window at Pad B, um, and on our launch day, you know, we'll, we'll, there'll be a clear of Pad A as well. But other than that, we really don't have any significant impact. You know, the pads are about a mile apart, um, and so really the only time that we have any kind of a hazard from one pad to the other is actually during the launch window. Thank you. Our next question is from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Hi. Th thanks so much for doing these uh, frequent calls. I really appreciate sort of the updates and, and access to you guys. Um, a couple quick questions. First of all, what are the weather constraints, if any, for rollout in terms of wind, rain, a desire to have a sunset in the background? Um, and then for those of us who may be planning family vacations in June, can you remind us, maybe Mike Serafin, what the window, you know, potentially is that month? Thanks very much, you all. Mike Bolger, you want to do weather constraint? Mike Serafin, you can do window. I know that might be a good way to do it. Bruh, bruh. Yeah, and it probably would be smart to follow up with the, with the specific details. We're actually, you know, it's pretty liberal. We, we wouldn't start a roll um, with any kind of lightning in the forecast. I think if it's we have a forecast of 10% or higher of lightning, we wouldn't start a roll. I believe the wind constraints are, are 40 knots, but I'm going to – I would – prefer to follow up. Maybe I'll get the information to Catherine that, you know, I, I know you're kind of being facetious about sunrises and sunsets, but yeah, um, that, that won't be a problem. But if we, if we get one as we're going up the pad in the morning, the next morning, that would be, that would be a, a pretty nice feature of the role. But um, we're not overly constrained um, on our wet weather constraints regarding role. Okay. And uh, in terms of, uh, you know, when physics uh, says that we can launch because we have this three-body problem. We've got the Earth uh, rotating on its axis. We've got the moon going about the Earth in its, in its lunar cycle, its 28, 29-day lunar cycle, and then we need to head outbound and back, and we need to meet our performance constraints uh, for the rocket in order to achieve that because we are, we are using the, uh, the, the interim crowd propulsion stage on these initial flights. Uh, we are we are performance constrained on which days we can go. Uh, we also have constraints associated with the um, Orion's ability uh, to fly through eclipses exceeding 90 minutes for power and thermal reasons. But then we also want to hit a, a, a specific set of conditions at the landing site, uh, specifically daylight, but also our range from entry interface to. Uh, to a splash down location, it, it creates another constraint there as well. So when you stack all those constraints up for June, uh, the June launch period opens on the 6th and uh, closes on the 16th. Thank you. Our next question is from Emma Tobin of Associated Press. Hey there. Um, just wondering if you have a date or more specific time frame yet for the roll to pad specifically? Yeah, Mike gave that, but we'll go ahead, Mike. Repeat that, and we'll have this. Uh, we'll have a release out later on. I think we'll get the specifics. So, but Mike will give you the specific date and time again. Yeah. Um, so March seventeenth, six p.m. We're looking for first mission. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Clark of Space Flight Now. Hi, Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. Thanks for taking my question. Um, for Mike Serafin, also interested in uh, if you could share the launch dates for July, if you have those available. And uh, just talking about the, the volume of work that you still need to do when you get back into the VAB with the vehicle after the wet dress rehearsal, um, you know, that sounds like a lot to fit into a month, but maybe I'm, I'm reading that wrong. Is, is that uh, is that one month turnaround in the VAB, um, you know, kind of an op optimistic uh, success-oriented schedule, or is there any margin in that uh, one month? Uh, 
uh, in the VAB. Thanks. Stephen, I'll, I'll take the first part of that, the July launch period, and then I'll, I'll pass to uh, to Mike Bolger on the on the VAB and, see, and maybe see if Tommy has anything to add. But uh, as far as the, uh, the July launch period, again, if you take those same set of constraints for this for this first mission, and and when you map that against the the fact that we're flying in this distant retrograde orbit, um, we would. Uh, open that launch period on June the 29th, and it would close on July the 12th. There are a few cutout days in there because of some um, constraint violations, meaning uh, meaning the the rocket could deliver us to uh, orbit and meet the the lunar insertion conditions at translunar injection, but the spacecraft conditions either due to eclipse or um, or the ranged entry interface would be violated. Um, so within that launch period that I just gave you, there's, there are cutouts on the 2nd through the 4th of July. And then uh, I'll turn it to Mike Bolger to answer the VAB um, timeline question. Yeah, so there is um, quite, a, quite a bit of work to do. Um, and, and what we've learned, you know, I think we talked to some last time, but first time flows, we, we always learn some things as we go. So um, while we're still really kind of doing the final, yeah, I would say, put, putting the, I cross my T's and dot in the I's on the schedule, um, I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to say whether 30 days is conservative or not, I guess, just because I don't, I don't feel like we have enough, we have baked it enough, if you will. Um, but I, you know, I, I do acknowledge there's a lot of work. I think it'll be in that kind of a time frame. Um, and I think maybe by the time we get to, you know, they talked about two more press conferences. By the time we get to that that second one, I think we'll have a really good feel for that, and we'll be able to tell you more about it. Yeah, and Stephen, this time I agree with Mike. I know it's really, uh, it's a great question. A lot of people want to have a specific date or a specific period of time. I think you're absolutely right. It's a lot of work. Um, we haven't done wet recipe here so before with this vehicle. I'm really reluctant, to, and I know it doesn't, you know, I know it would be easier just to give you a date, but I'm really reluctant to do that. It's not fair to Mike. It's not fair to the team or the vehicle because we really haven't had a chance to send it through a wet dress rehearsal. And so we, we recognize that that's, that that is a, a, a period of time that it could be very challenging, and we would really feel a lot more comfortable and, and being and really more forthcoming with you if we waited until after wet dress. And then I think Mike, like I said, it's not that far from now. We'll be able to give you a much better estimate of the time that's required uh, to complete the work, and, and we would feel much more comfortable that we were giving you accurate information at that point. Thank you. Our next question is from Marina Karen of The Atlantic. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm wondering if the persistence of valve problems on Starliner has informed your approach to some of the closeout tasks on SLS. Um, of course, Starliner and SLS are two very different programs, but given that the common thread is Boeing and the fact that you did find a valve issue on SLS last year, have you made any new changes to your process surrounding checking out the hardware before launch? Thank you. Yeah, Maria. Yeah, that's a great question. It's a question, um, not to get into the details of the situation. You know, we have a, a group of people that work with us in our chief engineer office across all the programs, and we do share this information amongst ourselves to make sure we're not missing anything. There, anytime anything that uh, it comes across that, uh, you know, another, another program experiences, uh, that we, we, we look at that, and we've had a, a couple of those very specific looks at, at that situation. There was a couple of things actually during that mission that we looked at very specifically. Specifically, we rely on our technical authority and our chief engineering organization, which is good, to share that information back and forth. We share um, our information with them as well. And so we're, we're, we don't have anything on the vehicle that we currently have a concern on with respect to that situation. Uh, and that would, uh, so we feel very comfortable that we've looked at that. We're aware of the situations that they've experienced. They, they, and when we run into a problem, we share that with other people within the agency uh, just so they have that information. And at this time, we're not really tracking anything in that area. Thank you. Our next question is from Philip Sloss of nasaspaceflight.com. Thanks for taking my question. Um, how much uh, closeout work, so to speak, remains for things like non-conformances and or documentation before you're ready to roll out for a wet dress, you know, compared to the hands-on closeout work that you're doing in the volumes? And how much schedule margin do you have to the 17th? Thanks. So I'll let Mike Bolger uh, talk to that. That's a, it's a good question. 
Yeah, okay. So, so let's see. Um, we have definitely been keeping close track of the paper. We kind of have divided our, I think we talked this last time, divided up into three war rooms where um, we're looking at the paper related to the launch vehicle or to SLS, paper related to the spacecraft Orion, and then the paper related to the ground systems. But on the Orion side, there's really just a handful of open items um, that represent constraints. We're, we're really clean. And the SLS side, um, we've, we've got a larger number, and that's really because Tom was talking earlier about the volume closeouts that are going on. Um, and as we do those and as we do the inspections, we, we take nonconformances for lots of little things, um, safety wires nicked, we've got wire chafing, we've got hydraulic fluid on a tape. So little things that are, are pretty easy to address, but um, you know, as we back out of each area, we open we open new work. And on the ground side, kind of the same thing, although obviously we're not we're not backing out of the volumes. We've got a um, some paper close out to do. We're closing the documentation and the drawings. Um, I I really don't view it today, the paper and the nonconformance close out as the long pole. I really think Tom kind of hit it earlier. It's really going to just be the actual work to back out of each of the volumes, get the platforms out there, um, finish the inspections. And then I guess any new NCs that were to crop up would be what we would deal with. Um, we're currently carrying four days to our March 17th rollout as margin. Um, and so, you know, that that would be the that would be what we're carrying. The reason we don't have more than that is because at this point, like Tom mentioned earlier, that the powered on integrated test and checkout, you know, the more complicated work that we've been doing um, up through the completion of the flight termination system testing is really behind us. And so now it's it's backing out, it's cleaning up, it's you know getting the crawler transporter in place, it's getting the VAB platforms um, pulled back, and it's getting ready for roll. So you know we think that will be sufficient. Yeah, and we'll let you know. I mean, what we are, uh, I think, you know, Mike's right. We've actually done some preliminary inspections in the volumes and stuff like that. Certainly, if we come across something, we'll get together again. We'll explain to you, you know, kind of what happened. I think that we have some hope that <laughs> that this is a good a good set of data that we're, we're working with here and that we have the right information. Uh, obviously, Mike and his team are doing an excellent job. If something comes up, we'll certainly let you know. Thank you. Our next question is from Tim Bernholz of Court. Hello everyone. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm curious if the green, or excuse me, if the wet dress doesn't go as planned, is there any scenario where it would be run again? And I understand from our green run conversations in the past that this vehicle can only be tanked up, I think, a single digit number of times. Uh, after the wet dress, how many times uh, can the vehicle be fully fueled, and will that affect any mission scenario planning? Thank you. I, uh, uh, first of all, I, I don't, it's, I'd have to think about your question for a few minutes. I mean, obviously, you know, the wet dress is, a, it, w w just so you know, when we do wet dress rehearsal, we have launch commit criteria that we have when we fly the vehicle, and then we have criteria we use to use, do the wet dress because we know we're not flying that day. So we've actually, Mike and his team have gone in and we've conscientiously looked at our criteria for the wet dress, and we've, we've really done it in a way that would give us the best ability to complete the test, knowing that if we run into certain situations because we're not flying that day, we can continue to press with the test and get the data that we need from the test. It really depends how far we get into the test. Uh, you know, most situations, you know, we have done a hot fire test at, at Stennis, so we would really have to look at what weren't we able to accomplish, what did we accomplish, what did we already see earlier. But, you know, as a reminder, we're really checking the interface between the vehicle and the ML and the launch systems and the LCC. And so it's really situationally dependent in terms of having to do that. In terms of the number of cryo loads, I have to think that what we've reported previously is it's the number is 22. And so it's, it's quite a bit. And so I, I don't really anticipate that that's going to be something that, that's going to catch us, to be honest with you. And even if, if we do that, it really depends. Is it a full load, a partial load? How much pressure did we see? That type of thing. So it's another kind of complicated answer to your question. Um, generally speaking, it's not something we think right now is, is on our radar screen. And Mike, I'll let you add to that. Yeah, so um, Tim, the only thing I would add is, you know, for the wet dress rehearsal itself, um, if we were not 100% on all the planned objectives, and we have kind of primary objectives and secondary objectives, we would, we would really just look at the results post-test, which we have a plan to go do that, and then do a risk-based assessment. So the risk to proceeding as is weighed against the risk of repeating the test, 
and, and there, are, there are some risks associated with repeating the test, um, including just staying at the pad under the, the, the Florida um, environment. Um, we would weigh those and, and decide on a best path forward. So, so it, it's really, to, to reemphasize what Tom just said, it is very situationally dependent. Um, it may be something as simple as just go update some software and a software parameter and we can buy down that risk in a test lab. Um, if it is something that is um, unique to the pad environment, and, um, and that's the only place we can demonstrate it, we would look at whether it's appropriate to proceed at risk with a launch attempt or, um, uh, and, and get the flight test underway or if we would need to repeat the test. So again, situationally dependent. Yeah, and we did a little bit of that at Green Run too where we made some adjustments between the wet dress and the actual hot fire test. So, um, so it, it really does depend. And uh, Tim, we did do a blog post on the tanking cycles in January of last year, so you can pull that up um, for reference as well. Uh, our next question is from Mike Waddle of Space.com. Thank you all. Um, yeah, just 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 a quick question, Tom. Tom, like you mentioned that that you guys are still evaluating the the yeah like the May window. So just just to confirm, is that the earliest window? April is not a possibility anymore. And and can you just refresh my memory? When when does the May window run from and to? Thank you. Yeah, April's not a possibility. We're still evaluating the tail end of May, and the May window ends up in the 21st. Uh, but I, I want to, it goes from the 7th to the 21st of May, but I want to be really careful, once again, being straightforward with you. You know, we really need to get through this next few weeks here, see how we're doing, and I'll have a much, you know, Mike, I, we'll be able to talk to you about it a lot more uh, here as we get together over the next few weeks. So, but to answer your specific question, the May window is completed on the 21st. Thank you. Our next question is from Marcia Smith of Space Policy Online. Uh, thanks so much. I'm wondering if you look at the entire stack, core stage, SRBs, ICPS, Orion, launch abort system, the whole package, are any of those components from either Russia or Ukraine? And if they are, how many do you have in stock, just in case it's a while before you can get any more? Yeah, Marcia, we're all kind of thinking where you've got us thinking here for a second, Marcia. I'm not aware of anything on the vehicle stack that comes from those countries for this particular vehicle. So I can't think of any, and if I do find one, we'll let you know. I just, off, I'm pretty familiar with the hardware. A lot of this is shuttle heritage hardware uh, that we, you know, I used to do the shuttle program, so we're fairly familiar with it. I'm not aware of anything. Mike's kind of shaking his head now as well. Yeah, it, it, yeah I'm, I'm working. My, that's a great question. I'm working my way down the stack. Yeah, we're better going and, down the stack. Like I've, I've, I, either Tom or myself have been to a number of these suppliers. You know, I mean, the boosters are made here in the U.S. The uh, RS25s are made here in the U.S. The uh, RL10s are made here in the U.S. The, the uh, launch abort system is made here in the U.S. Now, the, the only the only thing, Marsha, and I should have mentioned this, sir. You know, the service module is provided to us from the European. It comes from European countries. It, by the way, it's a very capable service module. We're really happy to have the Europeans as part of our our. Um, and I don't want to not mention them because they're really actually a very important part of this mission. They'll be providing. It's a very powerful service module. So we do have European participation in this, but not, nothing from that I'm aware of from the countries you mentioned. And if we find out differently later on, we'll let you know. Yeah. I, I, I guess the only other part I'll add here is, you know, this we, we get asked about the value of NASA and, and the human spaceflight program. And I think the question you just asked, uh, you know, having an industrial base here in the U.S. or with partners that are friendly to us is a is a key uh, element of of this uh, of this enterprise and and uh, you know the the European service module, our our uh, upper stage, our our boosters, our core stage, our spacecraft, um, basically provides a, a path for our for our industrial base to have the technology and to have the skill sets to have the tooling to do this because if we did find ourselves in a situation where um, we had somebody out there that that had a capability that um, we were dependent on, um, we, we've, we've got that here because of this program. Thank you. We've got time for just a couple more questions. Uh, the next question is from Michael Greshko of National Geographic. Hi, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, I think this is primarily from Mike Bolger. Uh, this is the first time that you've reached through this stage in the procedure for SLS and Orion. 
Um, and from the steps you've sort of recently taken, already are there any lessons learned that will inform or potentially streamline going through these same steps for Artemis II and beyond? Yeah, I mean, any, we, you know, when you, one of the things I think we've talked about a few times is a, a first flow is hard. Um, and in a first flow, you know, you've got new folks and you've got new software and you've got new GSC and you've got new fly hardware and, and you're just kind of learning as you go. I think um, may, maybe one of the things that we've recognized is um, that the, for instance, as we've stacked the boosters, um, and put the boosters together, there is an awful lot, and really this kind of goes up and down the, the vehicle, there's an awful lot of ablative or the RT-455 that we need to apply. And I think we underestimated um, the amount that we would need to apply and how long it would take. So for a while, we weren't really focusing on that particular piece of the application. Um, and, and we got a little bit behind. And then when we got behind, we started kind of looking in to the processes that we used to apply it, and we realized that we had built in an awful lot of government inspection points. You know, when we, when we mix the ablative, um, have we mixed it correctly? Have we mixed it at the right temperature? Um, as we apply it, um, we had a number of government inspection points too. And in effect, we were kind of slowing ourselves down by just the number of times that we were um, performing a, a quality inspection as we perform that work. And, and really, kind of top to bottom, I, th I think we have learned things about our system. We've found issues with our procedures. Um, and, and after each of our major tests, we always stop and we always collect our lessons learned. We write them down as a team and we talk about how to move forward. Another thing we've talked about is um, since, since the KSC team here you know, isn't the design entity for the various flight hardware elements, um, what kind of presence do we have when we run into a nonconformance? How easy is it to get a hold of somebody and to kind of reach back and get that system expertise? You know, we, we call we call it now ship side support. How do we get the right ship side support to help us get through the process? I think maybe it was I don't remember if it was Tom or Mike mentioned earlier that for every first flow of a you know major NASA mission. We've always recognized that we're going to learn some things and it's going to take longer than the follow-on flows. And, and we're pretty optimistic that the lessons learned that we're collecting as we go through this are going to really um, enable us to process these, you know, faster the second time and then even faster the third and the fourth time to where we turn these around in pretty good order. So um, it's definitely a, a learning process for us. I think we're taking the time to write them down and I think we'll get um, faster as we go. Yeah, and I just have to add a little bit to Mike. I think I owe it to the team in Florida that, you know, a lot of this work, this, this work took place during the um, COVID pandemic. And, uh, you know, these guys have really, you know, we follow all those CDC guidelines and how we protect our folks. So we have to do contract tracing and stuff like that. But this by no means was, not only was it the first flow, but it was a very um, challenging uh, activity. I think Mike and the team, the technicians that come to work every day at the Cape and, and work on this vehicle, I mean, I can't tell you how proud I am of these folks. Um, you know, that we really have made good progress during a very difficult period of time for really everybody in, in the country and the world. And uh, we're just really proud of them as well. And I think next time on where we really have our fingers crossed that that will be one thing we won't have to deal with. And I think that will help us out a great deal as well. Yeah, hey, Tom, just thinking one other thing I wanted to add was, uh, you know, when we went through the shuttle program, the farther we got into it, um, we automated more and more software. And then the other thing we did was we documented what we called standard repair procedures. So when we were dealing with um, issues or nonconformances that recurred over time, we had already kind of a built-in place standard repair procedure versus kind of inventing it as you go. And so I think as we continue on with the missions on Artemis, we'll do the same th kind of things. We'll be automating more of the work that we do, and we'll be documenting more of these standard repair procedures, and both of those things will help speed us up as well. Okay. Thank you. We're going to take one more question. Uh, we'll take it from Will Robinson-Smith of Spectrum News. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, Tom, you just hit on a, a point that I was going to ask about, which is, uh, you know, with the COVID number starting to drop here in Florida, has it helped to uh, expedite the processes that you still have leading up to wet dress and have things started to, uh, I guess, uh, turn a little bit faster now that uh, COVID is becoming less and less of a concern as the days and weeks go on. Thanks. 
Will, I'll start that, and I'll ask Mike Bolter, who's really working the front line on this as well, to kind of add to it. Obviously, it's a tremendous relief, not only to us, but everybody in the country and everybody in the world, that these numbers are starting to go down. It was a very significant concern, and we actually had uh, team members that were impacted by this, either with their family or friends or themselves. So, you know, we're very grateful um, that the numbers are starting to go down. I do think it has helped things, and, and I like that Mike, Mike add to that, but it really is an important part of, of what's taking place, and we're really we are relieved that things seem to be beginning getting better at this point. Yeah, definitely agree. I think I, I talked at the last conference in August and September. We were going through the Delta variant. Um, that one, you know, was more severe, um, and we definitely saw folks go out for periods of time, and it did impact us. We learned some things from that. You know, we learned about. Um, it, you know, when people are at work, not only the, the basic things, but are we wearing face masks and are we, you know, are we keeping social distancing to the extent that we can, but also just about how we conduct meetings, how we, you know, how we have lunch, um, keeping people more apart rather than together. Um, it got a little quieter after the fall here in Florida until after the holidays and then the Omicron hit. Um, it did impact us again because, you know, our folks are spending a lot of time outside of work, too. Um, and so, you know, at, at certain times when those two, when Delta and Omicron peaked, we might have as many as, you know, 100 folks, not who were, who were sick, but who had been identified through contact tracing. Um, and so that, you know, impacted some of our crews, particularly if you did have a, you know, a particular area um, get hit at work, we could lose, you know, three or four people from the same area, and that impacted things. But now we do feel like, you know, and knock on wood, I, I know y'all are with me here. We're on the backside of Omicron, and, and hopefully, you know, this is behind us, and we are seeing less of an impact as we move forward. I, hey, I wanted to take an opportunity to answer the question that I didn't completely answer before, and that was Eric Berger asked about the the weather constraints for roll. So I got the I got the data. It's less than 10% chance of lightning within 20 nautical miles. Less than 5% chance of hail or wind, or, or of hail. Wind limits 40 knots or less, and temperature required between 40 and 95. So I just wanted to close my open actions while I had the chance. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's very good, Mike. Uh, with that, I'll I'll see if Tom would like to make any closing comments. Then. No, I know it's a really uh, a lot going on in the world today. Uh, we appreciate you taking some time and 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 listening to kind of where we are in the process and asking what I thought were some really good questions. Uh, we'll continue to come uh, talk to you. We'll talk to you right before the rollout, and we'll spend more information. If there's something else uh, that you want to follow up with, Catherine, fine. I know there's agency will have other, other thoughts concerning the situation, but for us today, hopefully we've answered your questions as best we could. Uh, and we really appreciate your, your having interest in our program. We really are proud of what these folks do. Yeah, I use my uh, nautical uh, expression. You know, it's, it's really when you go down to Florida, it's quite an incredible experience. I know a lot of you have done this, and you and you just see um, launches take place periodically. You know, anybody who works in the aerospace industry, I find it fantastically interesting to see something launch into space. It's just, I don't care who it is and for what purposes, you know, if it's coming off Cape Canaveral, it's just an incredible thing. And we're very proud that we'll be the next uh, in line to bring a, a spaceship that is uh, going to go on a voyage all the way out into deep space. It's going to look a little different from the ones you've seen up to now because it's a very big spaceship and it's going to have a really important journey. Uh, we're very proud of what we do for the agency. We're proud of all the folks across the country who've uh, added to this program and little communities like the one I grew up in who have people actually who've helped us out over this period of time. Uh, we're very proud to be uh, part of a, an integrated Artemis program that will have the first person of color and the first woman on the lunar surface. I think that's quite an honor for all of us. And we're really proud that, the, that there's this new kind of future coming forward uh, for this country and this nation and, and everybody on these new launch vehicles that are going to go and do these deep space missions, and we'll be one of uh, probably a few, uh, and we'll have two for the Artemis III mission, and it's really a, a credible time. So you all will get to see this at the rollout, and uh, everybody who I've talked to have really seen the vehicle, particularly once we remove the platforms and stuff, it's going to be spectacular, and we're just very excited about that, and we really appreciate you all taking the time and asking us questions today. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today. As Tom mentioned, we will have additional calls ahead of rollout as well as wet dress rehearsal. You can listen to a replay of this teleconference online by visiting the Media Resources tab at nasa.gov slash Artemis One later this afternoon. Uh, Artemis One will be the first in a series of increasingly complex missions that will pave the way for missions with astronauts 
as we prepare for human missions to explore Mars. The SLS rocket and the agency's Orion spacecraft, along with the exploration ground systems at Kennedy, will be the backbone of NASA's Artemis missions to take human exploration farther into space than ever before. To learn more about Artemis and follow our progress to the pad online, visit nasa.gov slash Artemis1. Thanks again, and that will conclude our call. This does conclude today's conference call. We thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect and have a great rest of your day. What if I don't want to disconnect? What if I don't want to? I'm not disconnecting. You hang up first. You hang up first, NASA. No, you hang up first. Golly, stop it. Shut the fuck up. No, you hang up. Strata launch is about to take off, but I'm too busy not hanging up. All right, fine. You win this time, NASA. Oh, they hung up! Yes, yes. They hung up. They hung up. They hung up before, before me. They hung up before me. Yes. Victory is ours. What? Did you guys want to see this? Then Chase will call 10 seconds. See that? And that's... And Rock will start to release brakes. And as they start their roll, they will push the throttles into their final positions. You guys want to see this? Yeah, it's no big deal. It's just the biggest, biggest plane ever devised by man. It's going to get loud here in a second. I don't know, Sancho. Build that in KSB? I, we built that already. So oh, the high desert is beautiful, man. Look at that. What a picture. What a shot from our boys at NASA Space Flight. That's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's like a big P thirty eight. Cleared the thousand foot mark and now uh Chase oh, moves windy. in close to do a down dry down and dry check of the landing gear as it is now. We're not retracting the landing gear just off takeoff. We'll be so, up at altitude. It's like a so, big P-38. So, so question, uh, for those of us who are more familiar with space terms, uh, down and dry, so down, landing gear down, I'm assuming dry? Not leaking. That's correct. Dry is because we have so hydraulics. many hydraulic systems that retract the landing gear and the struts and the brakes. There's so much hydraulic fluid running yep. around those. We look Just a flight test. Flight four. Ah. Yeah. Uh, every function of the landing gear is pa is control or powered by a hydraulic function. So mm -hmm. everything from the dampers, the struts for the landing on the surface to the brakes, the retract system. It's a great view of all those landing gear there as well. Um. Yeah, fellas. I mean, part of anybody that flies planes that have hydraulically actuated landing gear knows that part of the pre-flight check is checking to make sure that your landing gear isn't leaking. If you're leaking hydraulic fluid. Yeah, your landing gear doesn't retract, and if you if so, like you say you're going down the runway, and one of the hydraulics lines fails on your landing gear, right? So first of all, if you try to pull it up, it's gonna break, uh, or you're just gonna spray all your hydraulic fluid out because your closed loop hydraulic becomes an open loop hydraulic, and then you can't retract your landing gear, or worst case scenario, you retract one landing gear and you spray all the hydraulic fluid out the other, and now you can't retract the left gear. So, yeah, th them making sure that all the hydraulic systems are pressurized for the landing gear uh, is, uh, yeah, probably a good thing. Yeah. I mean, if you guys have ever seen a, you know, seen planes go to land on a runway, you know, like I'm, there's footage of planes landing on a runway with, like, no left landing gear. That's a hydraulic failure. 
Uh, I mean, it, it does vary. Planes are a little more complicated than that. You can't isolate it ever to a root cause, but I'm sure I'm sure that a plane with a malfunctioning landing gear can be attributed at some point to the hydraulic fluid leaking. In the air to the end of that. So I think <laughs> Do you have access to the fuselage where people do not reside during the flights? And then in general, how accessible is that once you're in the air? <laughs> yep, you would think that the world's largest aircraft... This is Virgin Galactic, right? No, Strata Launch, different company. ...around the vehicle like that, but that is absolutely not the case. There is no access to any other portion of the airplane. My aero commander, the gear was in the air held up by a hydraulics. Yep. And the reason for that is, is the cabins are pressurized. So... The fuselages are not. They are they are the same pressure as Maybe, the exterior Angry Beard. air. So in order to access those fuselages, you'd have to break that seal and, and, and relieve the cabin of its pressure. That simplified the design. So, fellas, the Virgin Galactic carrier plane can, like, basically fit underneath right here. The edges of the wings would be the thing that keeps it from, uh, like, it keeps it from, like, fitting under here. You could fit the main fuselage of Spaceship 2 and the carrier plane, like under here. The wings would be out, outside of the twin fuselages, but there's a there's a lot of space in between there. Crawl through the entire wing, but we've eventually closed that out by adding in fuel tanks and, and ribs and other structural Interesting, pieces. Interesting, Rafael. Yeah, fuel tanks would kind of prevent you from traversing, wouldn't it? <laughs> That's right. And it's well, a big plane, guys. It has. I mean, fellas, think about how strong. Think about how strong that center wing section needs to be. It has to be insanely strong. You have two fuselages hanging on either side. How does the plane not bend and buckle in the center? When when I went to make this thing in Kerbal, you, I had to make sure that that was the most reinforced I could possibly make it. And then you guys got to remember on top of that, the, the, okay, so why is this plane weird looking? Well, this plane's weird looking because it's supposed to carry a rocket here. It's supposed to carry a rocket in the center. That's why the center is open. And it's supposed to launch rockets up into space. It's a, it's, you know, in... Aerospace terminology, it's called a straddle launcher. That's also the namesake for the plane, straddle launcher. So, like, there are examples of other straddle launched planes or other straddle launch systems. So, Virgin Orbit is a good example of a straddle launcher. Uh, it's a 747 that has basically a carrier rocket strapped to the fifth pylon. Uh, and it launches that into space, which is really freaking cool. And then there's... And then there's the Stargazer. Stargazer is a Lockheed TriStar. It's an L-1011 with a Pegasus, with a Pegasus small sat launcher underneath it, which is really freaking cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really, that's the last, uh, to my knowledge, I'm pretty sure that's the last Lockheed TriStar that's flying, which is really cool. There's, all the other ones are... I don't think anybody uses TriStars anymore, but I could be wrong. So. Oh, wow. That's cool. Wow. Oh, yeah, in fact, gazer. when we built, the wing was the first thing we built, and uh, the first thing we started of the, air, of the build, and we had to build a platform high up in the air to then build the wing on top of that. And it was such a big platform that, it, that uh, we good. had to have uh, sprinklers underneath as if it were a building for fire safety and whatnot. That's right, Jared. But yeah, there were our, all kinds of plans for it. I our hope fabricators, some of them, as I hope some of them come to fruition, figured out a way to move their toolboxes and their gear up to that platform. And there were many days in which they would start their day going up on that platform. And the only other time they would come down was at the end of the day. Yeah. We even had some break areas up there to take a break. It was massive. Why haven't more strata launches been a thing except for Virgin, etc. more challenging concept? Uh, so strata launchers, I mean, I'll, okay, so Two things, Sadkovsky. One, there are more strata launchers right now in existence than there ever have been ever previously. Ever. Um, you know, we have Stargazer, you have Cosmic Girl with Virgin 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 Orbit, and then Strata Launcher. Um, so there's that. Um, there's more right now that have existed than any time previously in the future at the or in the past and any time previously in the future. Nice. Nice. Sorry. A lot on my mind today. Um, so, second part of that is strata launching is cool, but it really only makes sense if you're 
It really only makes sense if you're launching maybe a payload about this big into space. Now, why? Why is that? Well, to launch a bigger thing into space, you need a bigger rocket. And for a plane to carry a bigger rocket up into space, there's only so many planes that can carry something kind of run of the mill before you have to make something ridiculous to make a bigger to make it launch a bigger thing into space. That's what Strata Launcher, that's the problem that Strata Launcher is trying to address. The fact that, you know, you're really only limited, you can't just build a freaking plane that needs a 15,000 foot runway to take off because then you're only confined to like a certain amount of runways in the world and the whole point of this is to be able to basically launch from anywhere, right? That's the point, that's one of the pluses of strata launching because if you're only confined to launching one or two spots in the world, why don't you just build a launch pad? Why don't you just build a launch pad, right? You just build a launch pad. That makes way more sense. So, is that a chase plane? It is. Um, so, like, Silo, you either have to A, build a bigger runway a wider runway and build a bigger plane on top of that or just your small sat launcher is defined to some, using something that's off the shelf like a 747 or a Stargazer or, or a TriStar or something. You know, you want to be, you want to be, move something bigger than a small sat launcher up to 30,000 feet, you're going to need a much bigger plane. And once again, that's the problem that Strato Launcher is trying to address. They're try, they, they, they made a bigger plane so you can put a bigger vehicle underneath it. Now, Honestly, um, now honestly, uh, strata launcher could probably get you a medium duty rocket underneath it. That's what I mean about making that wing box so ridiculously strong. The reason why this plane looks like it has two, it's twin fuselage. It looks like two planes flying together. Uh, but the reason why the fuselages don't really deviate because that wing box, the, the wing that connects the, the part of the wing that connects the two fuselages, I, I, I guarantee you that's built out of some really really thick boy aluminum because it's designed to carry a rocket underneath it now once again strata, strata launchers the strata launcher right there one of the plans they had which was canceled this yeah yeah the strata launcher right there uh you 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 built this one-off gigantic freaking plane and honestly i mean don't get me wrong strata launcher could put a medium duty rocket underneath it you could put something like I don't know, maybe, maybe something like the size of Antares underneath it, like a light to medium duty rocket you could put underneath that thing. Uh, I mean, it's big. It's a big plane. I mean, this thing could straddle launch in Antares, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it is about that big. Um, so you have this big, ridiculous plane, and even this big, ridiculous, you know, twin fuselage aircraft can only move medium duty stuff imagine the plane that you, I mean, that's the biggest plane flying in the world right now, guys, by wingspan. The, the 225 is longer. Um, but that's the, that, that plane has the biggest wingspan. That's the biggest wingspan of any plane ever flown. Bigger than a 7.4, bigger than the AN-225, uh, bigger than the Spruce Goose. It has a, it has a super wide wingspan, um, and six engines. So that, that's crazy. I mean, it, it really is a beast of a beast of a freaking airplane. And even this big beast of an airplane, this triumph of aerospace aerospace engineering here, uh, can only move. Now you're going from moving like a small sat to moving like four to five tons into orbit. And don't get me wrong, it's still a good idea. I mean, Zyle, we should exhaust all of our options, obviously. Um, Astra is medium duty. Astra is not medium duty firework. Are you, stop making stuff up. Astra is about smallest of the small sats that you can fly. Um, yeah, there you go, Pramana. Thank you for the comparison picture. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the thing with strata launching. You know, you're going to have to build this ridiculously complicated chase plane. It's just easier to build a freaking pad. Can you imagine how big one of these planes and how big the runway and everything would need to be if you were going to make something like a strata launch strata launching like a Saturn V or whatever. Like can you can you imagine how big that airplane would need to be? That airplane would need to be as big as the VAB. 
<laughs> yeah, that's just not practical with what we have right now. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that couldn't be done. I don't know, man. I don't really want to click on that link. <laughs> I don't really... Uh, I don't want to look in the trap. I don't want to look in the trap. Oh, I stared into the trap, Ray. I stared in... I stared into the trap, Ray. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh God, I, st I stared into the trap. Help, help, don't cross the streams. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Going to hell in a handbasket, bros. <laughs> it's ridiculous, I can't believe this. Anyway, yeah, no, I don't know, man. I, you know, what I've been saying is, here, I'm just, I'm taking the car parts off my desk so I can lean on my desk for a change because I had a bunch of steering parts on here. Are you okay? Um, guys, all, all I'm going to say is this. I don't want to talk about anything with current events today. All right? I really don't. I don't want to talk about space current events today, except if it has to do with stuff that doesn't have to do with what's going on over there. Um, I don't want to talk about it because, dude, it... Everyone likes going from zero to ten nowadays. Everyone likes doing that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna shut this for a second. Everybody likes going from zero to ten. Everybody likes having childish, you know, over the top uh, reactions. Everybody wants to turn their nose up and feel like they're better than everybody else. Look, there's a war going on. All right, have a little bit of class. Okay, don't let's let's. We, you know, the best thing that we do, the best thing we do is just sit and wait, just wait this one out. All right? You don't have, remember, you don't have to weigh in on everything. Okay, okie okay, dokie. You don't have to. I'm not. I ain't doing that. No way. Uh, it's, but you know what we shouldn't do is have a Twitter response to this stuff. You know? Let's not. I'm not doing that today. And honestly, I told the mods to time out anybody that pushes the issue. Look, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings by timing you out. It's my freaking stream, and I'm not changing my mind about that today. You know, maybe we can talk about it another day. You know? Anyway, so, did you guys have any questions about the NASA presser? I said I would kind of review everything. Uh, any gaming today? I don't know, Benno, maybe. Uh, Artemis 1, so... What we got gaming wise today? I don't know. Um, so our Artemis One rollout is targeting March seventeenth, um, and the wet dress rehearsal will be in the last two weeks of March. After the wet dress rehearsal, NASA is going to have to review all the data. They're going to have to review everything. They're going to have to make sure you know there's no surprises there. You know, best case scenario, the wet dress rehearsal, everything goes right. But you got to remember, the wet dress rehearsal is a test. It is a test to test basically testing the procedures of a simulated countdown all the way up and it's a simulated scrub basically that's what it is um so so if the wet dress rehearsal goes 100 percent right i mean it should but you never know it's, i mean it's, it's almost like this stuff's complicated um if the wet dress rehearsal goes right nasa is tentatively tentatively targeting the end of may but it's, that might be a little bit on the difficult side, targeting the end of May uh, because of lunar lunar transfer window options. It, it's most likely going to be in the middle of June. Now, uh, what, what, is, what does this mean? What do you mean end of May? Why does it take a month to do this stuff? Well, you got to remember. I mean, NASA does allow leeway. All right. They were targeting they were targeting basically a month after the wet dress rehearsal because they got to review all the data. They got to make sure there's no surprises. OK. You gotta make sure everything works. Every, you gotta make sure everything is 100% good to go, as ready as you possibly can be. That takes time to review all the data. They might have some stuff that they need to change. This does take time. However, does it take a month? No, 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 no. Reviewing the data probably take a good couple of weeks and then making changes or lack there, or if everything went right, you don't have to make changes. That probably takes, I don't know, three weeks tops. 
So, I know what the next question is going to be. So, why are they waiting until May and possibly even June? Well, that one is a little bit a little bit simpler. That's that I can give you a more definite answer about that. The moon has to be in the right place. Yeah, there's this thing about launching stuff to the moon. Uh, if you launch something to the moon and the moon isn't in the right phase, uh, you're just going to go past it. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Um, I don't think I need to say why you don't want to do that. Um, so there is a nominal set. There's a nominal... Uh, basically, the, the, the transfer windows for launching to the moon cycles with the lunar cycles. So, you know, like crescent moon, half moon, three-quarter moon, full moon. And I'm not saying NASA has to launch at a full moon or whatever, but basically they're... They only have like maybe four or five days every month where they can launch this thing to the moon. And I know that seems ridiculous. Uh, that seems ridiculous. Oh, oh man, well that's dumb. If we can only launch once to the moon every month at the very minimum, that makes that so stupid, blah, blah, blah. Well, first of all, guys, this is a test flight. You want to improve your favorability here. Uh, your favorability, you, you want to improve the probably probability of outcome on the mission. And th that basically means you pick the most opportune time to ensure success of the mission. The other thing is that NASA's, got, NASA's not going to try to launch in a complicated transfer window on the first try. That's really stupid. That's a really good way to decrease your probability of success. So, once again, there's really like four or five days every month where it's like green, you're good, we can launch today, tomorrow, the day after, the day after that, and the moon will be in the right spot. And we can make slight adjustments to our uh, trajectory to make sure that we're in the right place. Um, so th that's why th they're going to try for the end of May, but more realistically, it's going to be the end of June. Uh, and once again, a, a couple of reporters didn't understand this and they were like, why is it taking so long? Well, the moon has to be in the right place, guy. Yeah. Moon has to be in the right place. That's, that's, that's kind of important. <laughs> like, right? <laughs> it's, a freaking, it's a moon. You've been there before. Just go at a different time. Am I right? <laughs> I haven't been following this, but how did they say they solved the valve issue from last time? Valve issue. SLS had no valve issues. What if they failed the scrub test and accidentally launched? Thermal curtain failure. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Hillness. March 17 is their tentative rollout date. They're completing all closeout functions on the vehicle right now. Basically, if there's something that you need to get at where you need to do install scaffolding inside of the vehicle, they're closing out. They're removing all the scaffolding and making sure that everything is good to go. So they're basically getting ready to roll, man. Yeah, we got a date for rollout. A solid confirmed date from NASA for rollout, which means that that's probably going to happen. So, I mean, March 17th is a lot of time. It's not a lot of time to get this fixed. Uh. Hmm. Huh. Oh, yeah, never mind. That's different. Yeah, Sile, that... Look, man, I know that the press has to ask dumb questions to get stuff on the record. They have to reiterate stuff that they already said, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That one right there, that question that was asked about Starliner, dude. That 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 question had no bearing on anything. Literally, yeah, that that was okay. Let me explain. All right, so the question that was asked, right? The question that was asked, and once again, here's the thing about reporters. They're, they know they're asking stupid questions, right? And it's important to understand that. Once again, don't go from zero to freaking 11, all right? Reporters have to ask the questions. You're not going to know until you ask. And I, I understand that, and I get it, and it makes sense. Now, with that being said... The question was, hey, look, Starliner had valve problems. Boeing, you know, and that's a Boeing design. Is SLS going to have valve problems because it's also a Boeing design? Now, I understand that you have to ask very simple questions and you won't know until you ask. With that being said, implying that Starliner has any bearing on SLS development is like saying, you know, oh, my smart car, uh, my smart car's engine is malfunctioning or no, my Ford Focus's engine is malfunctioning. Does that mean my pickup truck engine is going to malfunction too? Because, you know, they're both Fords. The, the, the short answer is no. No, because it's a completely different design. Um, 
the the valves for the nitrogen tetroxide system on Starliner, which is part of the Starliner capsule service module reaction control system, so SMRCS, is part of the maneuvering thrusters that Starliner would use to move around in space. Now, does SLS have a capsule that has nitrogen tetroxide monomethyl hydrazine thrusters on it? Yes. That's the Orion capsule, which is made by Lockheed, and the European service module, which is made by Airbus. Everything else on the system is using valves that are not for monomethyl hydrazine nitrogen tetroxide systems, at least to my knowledge. I think the ICPS might have an Aerozine 50 monopropellant system on it for precise insertion. So even then, that's made by ULA. That's not made by Boeing. Um, so Im implying that, you know, oh, Starliner had problems and Boeing made that capsule. Uh, you know, well, SLS has problems because Boeing is attached to it as well, is, uh, demonstrates a pretty fundamental lack of understanding of how space programs work. But once again, you know, you don't want to, don't go right to outrage, right? Because reporters have to ask this question. They have to ask these stupid questions, man. You don't think they, you don't think they realize that how dumb some of these questions are, but they have to get it on the record, man. That's, that's the whole point. They, they ask stupid questions on purpose. And if you're familiar with the engineering, they, the questions might seem a little bit on the dumb side, but that's not the that's not the intention here, you know. Yeah, because Ford. I mean, yeah, okay, yeah. You know, oh, I mean, the logic can be applied to anything. Oh, my Cadillac isn't working correctly. Does that mean that that Chevy truck, because they're both GM, isn't going to work right as well? Like, yeah. No, because Cadillacs and Chevy pickup trucks don't really share any common parts. Well, actually, knowing GM, they probably do, but who knows? You know? Buzz, buzz, buzz. Man, my phone is going gangbusters today, man. Well, Fozilla, Phil Sloss is the SLS guy for a NASA space flight. Phil Sloss is awesome. I like Phil Sloss because he asked engin he asks engineering questions. Those are the type of questions that I would ask. He talked about, you know, rollout dates and whatnot. And did you hear the response that he got from the NASA engineers? He got a long, extremely detailed uh, 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 response, which is good. That's how you know it's a good question. If the engineers talk your ear off. It's like you're anything that has carbon in it is organic kind of joke. Y yeah, Solar. Yeah, the, the, the joke there is that, you know, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> you know, gasoline is not organic. <laughs> I mean, it is, but it's also not. <laughs> it's not like oil grows out of the ground. You know, you have to pump it out. I mean, sometimes it does, but <laughs> it's not. It's not. <laughs> but that's the joke. The joke is the joke is an ignorance of science. That's why it's funny, you know. Uh, but see, the, the the question was not a joke. <laughs> That's why it's like, oh dear. And then I'll, I'll be fully transparent with you guys. The question that I blanked out was asking them about the ISS. Because you know, a press conference for the space launch system, which is not part of the ISS program. A question about the ISS, which is not part of the SLS program, is a good question to ask the SLS folks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's like going to the post office and say, okay, where do I file my taxes? Uh, with the IRS, maybe? We'll mail it for you. <laughs> Yeah, yes, that's the yeah, that's that's also the joke. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, my toilet doesn't work. Uh, can you help me? I'm an architect. I design houses. Yeah, but my toilet doesn't work. Can you fix it? I'm not a plumber. Yeah, but my toilet doesn't work. You should really help me out on that. That's why that's why I blanked that question. I'm just like, "Oh my god, dude." Nah, those NASA those NASA guys have way more patience than I do, man. But then again, but then again, I mean, I don't know. Maybe when you're the guy answering questions, you just answer the damn question, you know, like, I'm a people person. I am, I'm good at dealing with people. Can't you understand that? What the heck is wrong with you people? 
And then I like the, dude, I like the, there was a couple of questions that were like, hey, I know you're on step five, but when's step seven going to happen? Uh, it's going to happen after step six. Yeah, but why don't you just do step seven now? Because we have to do step six. Oh, well, how long is that going to take? It takes as long as it needs to, because we've never done this before. We can't give you a definite, definitive answer. Oh, yeah, okay, so when, when are you going to launch? I'm like, dude, what the... Help me, step six. I'm stuck. Yeah, right. <laughs> Dude. Hey, Mr. Mechanic, my foot hurts. Do you know why? <laughs> yes? No? Yeah, it's knowing, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, I know that the press is trying to... Get, they're trying to get a scoop, good scoop. They're trying to get a story. Like, I understand that, and I get it. And that's why they ask the questions that they do. But, man, can you, it, like, sometimes, sometimes I wonder, can you at least pretend like you give a frick about this and you're not just there for your job? Like, <laughs> sometimes, like, please, please, I'm not trying to be a dick. Like, Rock has the gear up. Hell yeah. How many times can SLS be filled? Yeah, goalie, that guy... Dude, that guy asked a predication. He asked a question predicated upon a guess. He's like, well, to my knowledge, SLS can only be filled up five times. So what happens if something goes wrong with the wet dress rehearsal? Yeah, to your knowledge. To your knowledge. Yeah. Like, how entitled do you have to be? Like, I'm really confused. What, what do you mean, to your knowledge? Are you, did you build the rocket? NASA was like, no, that's not right. And then at the end of at the, after the response to the guy's question, they were like, uh, yeah, we released a press statement last January that the core stage can be filled 22 times. I don't know where you're getting that from. Let's just make up stuff and ask questions predicated on made up, made up facts. Sure, why not? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm like, do you know something that we don't? Are you working on this rocket? The guy was like, oh, to my knowledge. To my knowledge, I think it can only be filled up a single digit amount of times. Like, what do you mean to your knowledge? Where did you where'd you get where'd you pull that one out of? What would you say you do here? Twenty two, oddly precise. Mm. Would bite okay, so you wanna you wanna know how complicated you wanna know how complicated this stuff gets? Everybody says it's complicated. You wanna hear you wanna hear why? Twenty two is not a baseline number for for core stage tanking and detanking. NASA didn't crunch some freaking numbers and decided, you, oh, 22 fill-ups would probably be the right amount of fill-ups, you know, in case it scrubs five or six times. You know, 22 fill-ups would probably be the, that's the nice good number. No, that's not how they did that. The 20, the, being able to tank the core stage 20 plus times probably has more to do with what payload is on top of SLS. We know that the core stage is overrated for the block for block one load factors. What is that? Okay, so what is that? Okay, what, load factor, blah blah. What does that mean in plain English? The core stage is designed to have a much bigger upper stage on top of it and a much heavier payload than just a, a Delta Four upper stage in an Orion capsule. So, if I had to go out on a limb and guess here that this core stage one could probably be fueled a little bit more, because think about it. All right. You have a core stage that has 20 tons of mass, or let, let's say Orion's 25. Let's just say you've got 50 tons of upper stage and capsule on top of this core stage. That is clamping down on it, so when you pressurize it, you're putting it through a much bigger load cycle than you would be without payload on the top. Because now you're pressurizing it and you're also clamping it down, because there's, there's heavy stuff on top of it. If that stuff is heavier, it's probably going to affect the amount of times that you can tank the vehicle. Why? Because if you tank it with an upper stage on top of it, that instead of 50 tons, it's 150 tons, and then a 100-ton payload on top of that, your core stage is going to need to be a lot stronger. And knowing NASA, they probably load-rated the core stage. I, I, not probably. They did. I know that they did. You can tell from their engineering tests. Uh, knowing NASA, they probably rated the core stage for whatever the heaviest possible thing they could think of that this thing could pop possibly launch in the future. And then probably added a safety factor, like a 25% safety margin on top of that, if I had to guess. Now, the safety margin is what NASA would use statistical, statistical analysis to figure out how much of a safety margin you need. 
And that is based off of finite element analysis, analysis tests or dynamic tests. These dynamic tests are the tests that happen at Marshall Space Flight Center. So uh, how do you know how strong it's going to be? Well, you, you know, you take a hydrogen tank. You take a hydrogen tank, you put it in a big hydraulic clamp, and then you blow it up. Yes, Signer. Oh, you think that's bad? That's just it buckling. Wait for it. That's how you come up with your load factor. And even a test like this, fellas, even a test like that is based off of math. So, what does that mean? You want to find your load factor. You want to figure out how much this thing can, how many times you can tank this thing before it does that, okay? So, NASA would do all the math out for when they think the tank is going to fail and then do this test and then see if the math checks out and it's congruent, congruent, if it's the same as your actual physical result. If they are the same, then you can calculate, you know, you can calculate the safety margin. How thick does this tank need to be? Did we make it thick enough? All right. These tests, when they blew up the hydrogen tank, these tests are designed to make sure that your math and the actual hardware are the same. This is how NASA does their testing. This is the reason why it takes so long. It's not just about pushing the tank to its failure point, right, and then blowing it up. NASA statistically did, it's, it's, dude, it's straight the R they did the math, all right, R slash they did the math. NASA will figure out the exact point after the exact amount of time when that tank will fail. And on that, on that LH2 tanking test, they predicted the failure, they predicted the failure time with a 3% deviation, which is absurd. That is absurdly good engineering. Dude, they, they were able to predict within like a couple of minutes exactly when and where that tank was going to fail, which is really damn good statistical analysis. That's the reason why this stuff takes a while. That's the reason why NASA has to take their time. They literally do out all the math. They do out all the math, all the dynamics. Everything is done out. And then they test, and then they make sure that their test reflects the math that they did. And if it does, then you can move to the next step. Now... Think about that, and then think about the guy that asked, well, you're on step five, why don't you just skip to step seven? See what I mean? See how stupid that sounds? You see, you see, you, dude, that is just, you're not even like, that's not even genuine curiosity. You just don't know what's going on. See what I'm talking about? Also, also, this test is rad. I just want to see it pop again. Woo! <laughs> That's sick. There you go. God forbid, let's say we hit this number. What do they do then? So, okay. Golly, this, so... That's actually a really good question, dude. So, okay. Let's think about this for a second. So we know that the core stage can be tanked a high number of times because of the high dynamic load factor that the core stage needs to have because of heavier payloads. So, let's think about... the thing. Okay, so think about this a little bit differently, Goli. Let me, let me put the question to you like this. You know, what happens down the road... If, you know, you have a super heavy payload on top of SLS and it scrubs four times and you, you, there's an indication of that, they, that they might exceed the load factor or the tank, the, the amount of tanking cycle cycles on the tank, it wouldn't be load factor you, you, where you might exceed the amount of tanking things because you have a much heavier payload, right? So what happens then? Well, when, it, when are we going to launch heavier payloads on SLS? Okay. Let, 
Don't give me the smart aleck response, all right? You, you know what I'm trying to ask, okay? Don't say never, <laughs> please. Don't do that. <laughs> so, Goalie, those heavier payloads and those missions that really are going to be the more complicated ones, so like um, the missions with the EUS, with gateway components, or missions where we make Mars transfer vehicles or something, those missions are probably going to happen way down the line in the program, dude. And the the whole idea is that the whole idea is that you establish capability, right? So don't get me wrong, it could happen down the road, but basically launching those heavy payloads like after maybe 10 SLS launches, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh will um Basically, the vehicle will be well understood by then. It'll be well understood, and you, it, it, it would be unlikely to encounter a scrub scenario. Now, now don't get me wrong. I don't know, dude. I don't know. Uh, you know, what are you going to do when you exceed the load factor? Or you exceed the, 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 ta the cycles on the tank? I, dude, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure that NASA would have some type of contingency, which is what the... Dude, another... <laughs> I love it how people ask why it's going to take so long, and then literally in the same breath, that you know, well, why is it going to take so long? Well, because we literally have to plan everything out. We plan for every conceivable scenario that we possibly can. Oh, so... So do you have a contingency for if it, you know... If the wet dress rehearsal is it doesn't work? Yes. Y yeah. But why male models? Are you serious? I just told you that a moment ago. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, Jack, long story short, they'll have a lot of data by then, so they'll be able... The contingency is that because you've had past SLS launches, you compare... You compare this core stage to l other SLS launches that had tanked multiple times, and see if see if this core stage is acting like the other core stages, and then you'd be able to figure out if it's okay. That's what I mean. Those heavier payloads are not going to come for another 10, 15 years after a good amount of SLS launches it ha has happened, and then you have a much wider data set to compare it to. So it you know say down the road it's 2033, right? And SLS has launched 40, let's say like 40 times. That's very unlikely, but let's just, just say. They, they have 40 launches, right? Uh, and they have one, you know, the Artemis 28 mission is doing some weird things on the pad that they hadn't seen before. They had to scrub it a bunch of times, and now they're, you know, now it's exceeded, you know, where they think what the, the you know, the, it's exceeded the amount of tanking cycles, right? Well, they have 40, fl 40 prior flights to compare it to, right? You can compare the data from all those flights. This is, and now this is what mission controllers do. This is like what mission control and launch control, uh, you know, it's not just push the button and the rocket goes. This is the kind of stuff that they do. Okay, so you have something weird going on with the core stage, or you've exceeded the allowable amount of tanking in, r tank and retanks, all right? So what the thing is, what the... The thing to understand is that the rocket is now in a mode that you haven't seen before. That the, so say they exceed the amount of tanking cycles, right? The it's the rocket's now in a failure mode that you haven't seen. So what NASA would do is use this opportunity to understand this new mode, okay? So okay, we've exceeded we've exceeded the amount of times this tank can be filled up. So we need to, now we need to look at the tank, all right? So now we're in uncharted territory from what was established at the beginning of, you know, when the vehicle was developed. We're outside of the, we're outside of the box here from what the, man, we're outside of manufacturer spec, okay? So what they need to do now is they need to understand what, what they did. They need to understand what happened. And understanding what happened when you exceeded manufacturer specifications is the most important part. You have to understand now that the, the, you're in uncharted territory, so you have to chart the territory that you're in. You can't just veer off into uncharted territory and then launch it. They tried that once in 1986. It didn't work. Okay? You have to understand what's going on with the core stage. You have to understand what's going on with the metal from the core stage. You have to understand if this could affect other parts down the road. So what they would most likely do 
is, I don't know if it would necessarily constitute a rollback. It might. Yeah, possibly. I would, I mean, if it was me, I would take it back to the VAB. It, it, what, you take it back to the VAB, you inspect it, you figure out that, you know, you can do more than six, seven, do, you know, tanking cycles, eight, nine, 10, 11 tanking cycles with a super heavy payload on the top. You figure out that it's okay, put it back on the pad, send it, and your odds are favored because you did your homework. Your odds of success are favorable because you did your homework. This is how NASA works. Every, every, every part of testing, all right? Every part of testing basically is not, the way NASA tests, you don't want to learn anything new from your tests. It's not like the conventional scientific method, like where, you know, you form a hypothesis, right? And then you, you figure out an experiment to try and prove that hypothesis, and then you do it, and then you write down the results, and then you try to disprove it, right? That's not how NASA tests, right? It's not rocket science, it's rocket engineering. These are engineering tests, not scientific tests. How NASA would do it is do the math out. Okay, we know that if we put this thing in a big hydraulic clamp, clamping with this amount of force, that it's going to fail after this amount of time and in this spot. And then you go and do the test. And if what happened on the test stand is what, what you predicted, boom, you're good. You shouldn't learn anything new there. Okay? However, however... If you do learn something new from these tests, that should be documented and that should be factored into your initial analysis. Because if you learn something new during these tests, that means there's something that you didn't take into account. And that means your baseline math for, the, for, for what you're trying to do is not right. Now, with that being said, not every single test is going to go 100% to plan. There's no way you can predict every conceivable outcome. Uh, there's no way you can predict every conceivable outcome of a rocket that has a million moving parts. That's in a dynamic environment where pressure changes, atmospheric changes happen, temperature happens, uh, you know, humidity, there's a bunch of things, right? Solar winds when you get up into space, there's no way you're going to be able to predict the dynamics of those scenarios. There's, there's not. You can't, I mean, SpaceX went to launch Starlink the other day and solar winds blew the satellites out of orbit. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. Um, so because, you know, because this is such an, I mean, because it's such a dynamic operation, there's so many things that are changing and all this all happens in the span of eight minutes. So many things are changing where the rocket takes off from is not like where it ends up, right? That's two totally different environments, like up in the vacuum versus down on the surface, and not to mention, like like I said, temperature changes. There's all kinds of stuff happening. And then, once again, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of dynamic conditions are affecting every single one of the million parts on this vehicle. So now you've got to figure out a million parts, how they're going to react through the dynamics of a rocket launch. And once again, I'm just factoring in weather, temperature, pressure, stuff like that. We're not even factoring in vibrations from the rocket engines. Uh, you know, you know, you, uh, you could have a engine pop during launch or something like you could have engine out capability. You could have, you're not taking into account like G load on the vehicle because you're going to, if the rockets are producing the same amount of thrust the entire time and your tank, your fuel tanks are draining, the rocket is let, that's less things for the rocket engines to move. That's less mass for the rocket engines to move. So your TWR is going to go up and your acceleration is going to go up because of that. There's a, there's a bajillion different dynamic conditions, all right? And then there's a million parts on the vehicle. The, the, the math goes for days. You, it's like, imagine how many lines of code that is just doing, just fig, just quantifying what, what you know about the vehicle. That's not even, like, there, there might be stuff that you didn't even take into account. It's possible. This might be stuff you didn't even, you didn't even bother taking into account. And what those are called in, and Gene Krantz talks about this in his book, Failure is not an option. What those are called are unknown unknowns. All right? An unknown unknown is something where you basically do everything right and something still happens and you still lose. Uh, this could happen in testing. It could happen during a mission, Apollo 13. That was an unknown unknown because I don't think anybody at NASA predicted, predicted the spacecraft blowing up on the way out to the moon. I don't think that's something that they would take into account. The spacecraft literally almost just obliterating itself on the, uh, you know, I'm pretty, pretty sure they didn't plan for that. 
Pretty sure they didn't. Pretty sure they didn't plan for that. Am I, I mean, am I wrong? I, I don't. I wouldn't plan for that. I don't plan for the vehicle to explode. Okay. So, you know, you could do all the testing and you could do all the math and you could still encounter something new. And once again, that's the reason why this stuff takes so long. That's the reason why SLS is taking so ridiculously long, because NASA doesn't want to learn anything new during the Artemis One test. And what they're going to do is they're going to hedge their bets by trying to minimize the amount of new things that they learn on the Artemis One test. And that takes time. That takes time. It takes time. How much time? Don't know. Depends on the severity of the problem. Yeah, firework. Turns out that it was a defect that occurred three years prior. Can you imagine trying to figure that out? How do you... How did they figure that out? How do you figure that out on a spacecraft that's 100,000 miles away from Earth? How do you figure out precisely what part failed and when? That's fault tree analysis. Learning that figuring out why you learned something new stuff. So you're basically now into rocket troubleshooting. And the thing about rocket troubleshooting is that in fault, it's called fault tree analysis. This is rocket IT work. IT people, you know what I'm, you'll know what I'm talking about. With rocket science, you don't just fix the problem, okay? So, say you work in IT. Someone calls you, hey, I can't log into my email. Uh, why can't I log into my email? Uh, I don't know. Is your login information correct? Uh, yeah, that's right. What the heck? This worked yesterday. Why doesn't it work today? Have you restarted your computer? Was there an update or anything? I don't know. Can you look for me? I'm busy taking a coffee break click so in IT sometimes like oh okay I deleted the cache I deleted the cache and I restarted the computer and now it works oh hey thanks man you're just a computer genius aren't you all right coffee time click that's not that that right there is a pain in the butt anybody that's ever worked in IT knows exactly what I'm talking about it's a pain in the butt with rocket science it's that that's just the first step. So how this would work with like troubleshooting, how the rocket science work is you got to figure out why that failure happened. Not just fix the problem. You got to figure out why that problem happened and why they can't log into their email and why the cache screwed up their login information on the email. Uh, now you got to figure out why. It would be like having to go into somebody else's code and figure out, why the caching, oh, the caching system has a problem. The email caching system has a problem after the Windows update because of this particular line of code in Windows. La, 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 la. That's fault tree analysis with rockets. You have to, you don't just fix the problem. You got to figure out why the problem happened. And that's, yeah, that's how NASA does things. They troubleshoot like that, which is, remember, you're troubleshooting a million part, a million moving parts on this vehicle. One of the most powerful launch vehicles ever devised by man has bajillions of moving parts, is susceptible to bajillions of different dynamic conditions, and on top of that, it has software governing how it flies. That's why, that's why NASA takes their time. And this is why, what, you know, when they say, ah, space is hard. Th that's what they mean. <laughs> Restarting a computer isn't a fix, it's a workaround. Bingo, Renkin. NASA can't figure out workarounds. Once again, they tried to do they tried to do a workaround fix for the space shuttle and paid for it in in the eighties. Yeah, they paid for it. Cat King, where did all the people in Mission Control go? Eh, they're working at their desks, dude. True for any repair. Yep, mm-hmm. You have to figure out why the problem happened. You don't just fix the problem. You gotta figure out why it happened. That description of corporate America is weirdly accurate. I did an internship in high school, Genesis, doing IT work for a tech company. I troubleshooted IT. Yeah, I've done that before. Yeah, that was my internship. They were, they were like, oh, EJ, we're so happy to have you here for a software internship. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. You know, software internship, internship this is going to be great. They, the company just used me as an unpaid intern and literally made me do IT troubleshooting all day. Not even like fun IT troubleshooting, just, hey, my email doesn't work. 
Yeah, so I, I got a, I did that for a whole semester. I got about six months of IT work under my belt. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I got credit for it, so whatever. I get uh, like I answered like one or two emails, internal emails a day from people that couldn't get their email working correctly, and then the rest of the day I played solitaire. Really good at solitaire though, so I got that going for me, which is nice. Yeah, see, snowing, you know, fixes the restarting a computer fixes the problem, and then you try to figure out why later. NASA can't NASA can't launch the rocket and then try to figure out why the problem happened when it's launching into space. <laughs> nope, you got to figure out why it happened first and then launch the rocket, you know? They emailed you to say they couldn't send an email. No. Uh What was it? So, they had a company mailer that employees could subscribe to a company newsletter that employees could subscribe to and some employees didn't want to subscribe to it so yeah it was literally it was literally troubleshooting it was an email troubleshooting things about emails yeah yeah god that was back in 2004 though Yeah, picnic. Problem in chair, not in computer. Yeah, <laughs> Jaka, yeah. Yeah. PC load letter? What the frick does that mean? Still don't visit the company's blog. But yeah, hopefully that makes more sense as to why, you know, some of these questions from for the press seem like, like pulling teeth to me. Like, I'm like, do you guys actually give a frick about, just actually give a frick about, you know, rocket science or are you just there so you don't get fined? Like, okay. Did you, did you, did you restart the ID10T file? Yeah. Sometimes when you switch scenes and come back to mission control, I see a GIF on the center screen where the SS is. It starts with Kerbal and what's the GIF on the center screen? I don't know. It's probably one of the past graphics that I had up there, dude. Uh, ah, Death, I understood what you said. Yeah, see, I, I just put GIFs over the old GIFs so I can switch back to them if I want to. I still have DM2's launch behind, behind the Piggly Wigglies. Uh, there's Kerbal Panic, SRV Separation, Green Run, and you can see some of the GIFs overlap, but you guys don't see that, right? Like, see, some of them overlap, because trying to get a, a rectangular GIF in a trapezoidal shape sometimes is a pain in the butt, so I just, yeah, crop it out. See? Boop. I was good with Eric's questioning until he threw the hey for us planning vacation bit. Uh, where is the. Yeah, what's behind SN8? Yeah, there you go. It's the Kerbal Lost in Space GIF. Look. Ready? Wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> and then that's the that's just the background but I like SN8 you need to help that Kerbal? I absolutely do not hey 31 what's going on? Valentina was not the imposter here look at this picture from NSF Oh. It's like a lot for one uh, flight engineer to monitor. So that's really interesting that they can actually send that live telemetry down to Mission Control, where there's entire other teams of people also watching what's going on at the plane. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's the purpose of that is so that the engineer on the scopes on the ground, they can actually pull finer detail and get into some of the data that the pilots can't be tasked with right now. 
which um, man so for example we have six seeing engines, the therefore we have six the chase plane fly up next to it really really drives home the size of that freaking thing the pilots may not holy crap look at that picture and uh the engineer watching that will be able to monitor <laughs> what the frick they, they do <laughs> look at how big that damn plane uh, is <laughs> yeah that thing is huge <laughs> That was probably the best the best indicator I've ever seen to show the scale of that aircraft. What is the chase plane? I don't know. It's a it's some kind of straight wing business jet or something, like a Gulf Stream or something. I'm sure that the chase plane was going to go behind it. Just the scale was messing with my eyes and. Yeah, see, Das knows. It was between the camera and with the chase. Das knows. Yeah, look. <laughs> Look at that thing. It's tiny. It's a little baby plane. Yeah, 31. I thought, yeah, I thought, I'm like, oh, that plane is so small because it's behind the other plane. Nope. 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 It's in front of it. That's actually, that means that that thing is actually bigger. The engineer watching will be able to monitor something. And they, they do power. Yeah, the plane, because it's in the foreground of the shot, is bigger than Strata Launcher is because they're not the same distance away. So that thing is actually even smaller than what you just saw. A little more if you fall back some and gain some safety. It looks like a lair jet. Looks like a citation. Yeah, blood. I'm not sure. It's straight wing, whatever it is. So here. Why you're not flying in the mass simulator in the middle today? Well, that is in the next flight test. Yeah, blood fam. I I think that's a citation. I think it looks like a CJ4. Yeah, that's exactly what it looks like, dude. Own mass simulator at that point. So. Today is because the focus is on the landing gear. We didn't want to put anything in that in that middle portion on that payload spot of the wing, Here. just to keep the flight test simple for today. But that is actually on the next flight, so see you then. <laughs> that's gonna yeah. Be yeah, it's, yeah, that's definitely the plane, too, dude. You'll have a visual change. Yeah, it's definitely a citation. That in that I like citations. Even, Those are fun planes to fly. I've never flown one. I, hey, Mather Point. I've never flown one. I've only flown it in Flight Simulator, and I like it in Flight Simulator. Hey, nice suspension. Reasons. Reason for that is because the payload. Is Look up N eight E B N eight E B. And that's and that's kind of in, by by intent. Yeah. Nineteen eighty one Cessna Citation two. Download the, the various payloads that we've that we've uh, characterized cool. to, to put there. What's the difference between a Learjet seventy five and the CJ four, other than being different companies? Real quick. So. The voice you're hearing quite a bit with all the technical information. Well, what's the difference between a Learjet 75 and a CJ4, uh, other than them being different companies? They're totally different designs. They're totally different designs, dude. Thank you for having me. They're, really they're, both, they're both business jets, but they're totally different designs. They look the same. Some of the experiences that I've had, and, and to uh, also relate to you that uh, we have a huge team here of a very uh, except, uh, exceptional people, and I am just one small piece in a very large puzzle. And I, I got to give credit to the to the people I work with. The team that I'm on is just absolutely great. Yep. And also, you've heard the the voice of uh, Chris Gebhardt, assistant managing editor for NASA Spaceflight. He has been chatting a bit as well. But we also see the plane is approaching the runway here. Yeah, <laughs> like, Phil. Let's see facts. if it's going to touch down or not. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> No, no, no! All, all, all good, all good. Yeah, let's see if this is a uh, a practice or if this is our touchdown. Yep. And then, lastly, my name is John Galloway with NASA Spaceflight here as well. But let's see what the rock is going to do your, with your name the is runway. Das, okay? You, you see that nose up. down attitude and that and the flaps are down, so that is a typical uh, final approach configuration: gear down, flaps down, nice and slow. Okay. Put the nose down, okay. very stable. All right. You can actually see a little bit of the uh, side slip there, I guess. What's the right yeah. terminology for that? But plane yeah, approaching that is the runway at a slight angle. A little bit of side slip. Yes. Sometimes we crab call that shark. crab angle. Crab. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She crabbing. That is a. But at this point, enough. Mason, do you call it? Is this a landing or is this? No, I wouldn't even call it here yet. I don't think I could call that until we see actual tires on the ground. So that's a why that's a big runway chat 12 hash marks how wide is the runway no googling how wide is that runway i know how wide that runway is do you know how wide that runway is you could tell from those hash marks it's not 1200 feet wide because there's 12 hash marks jesus so um 
so we sort of talk about you know being able to practice it's that, 150 you know, feet wide the day of conditions or about 50 meters wide for your oh. actual landing right mason okay yes and that that's part of the reason why uh, low approaches are so valuable yeah so um uh, sort of start no. sticking with this, and you could kind of see it there um, as as the from the different angles. And I won't answer your question by. because it's cheating. One, and you can see it right here in this view. One oh. of the noses has a little thing protruding from the top of it, and the other does not. It's a pedo uh, sensor. What, what are those, and why is it not on both sides? Uh, those are antenna, uh, and antenna? they are there on the right hand side because that's where most of the instrumentation is, right? So your your radios. Uh, Look your, at that thing slip. The um, the our radios Man, transmit and receive over different transmitters and and um, the GPS antenna. antennas for example. Interesting. I wonder what the basic navigation thing, equipment, man. and that is just to minimize the length of the antennas. If you run a wire up through that middle wing and over to the other side, for example, that's a really long ways and that's a lot of weight. No, no uh, equipment that's available for test as for, you fly, um, flying. Air use in aircraft are really designed to have that long of an antenna wire. So we kind of, for the, for example, for the instruments that aid in navigation, thirty-one. I'd such as probably GPS guess like one hundred forty, hundred fifty knots. Navigation, probably, probably less than have that. have to be very close to the instrument it's itself. So that's why very... you see a lot more sensors on the outside of the. She ain't uh, moving very fast, but then again, that's a big freaking plane. So guys, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess that pro probably approach with this thing. Like, and once again, this is a huge guess. Like, I, I don't know. It maybe the guy will say uh, probably a hundred twenty, hundred thirty knot approach to the runway. I mean, it's a, it's got a lot of wing, and it's very light right now because they're probably not testing with a full tank of gas. I mean, in fact, I can tell you just by the way it's flying that it's, it's, it's very light. You can see it kind of do this up in the air. It kind of slips around. You're not carrying a lot of payload. Itself, right? Because every vehicle, like a boat and an airplane, they have a bow wave. Either the nose, as with most jets, or possibly the wings the and in front of the pedo tubes, not and sensors. Yeah, you're a tube. Try to take that as airspeed data because it would be wrong. So we push that data boom way out in front. And wait a minute, gives, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the air data, air data boom outside of the, in, such as GPS or radio navigation. Those antenna have to be very close to the instrument itself. So that's why you'll see a lot more sensors on the outside of the Mojave. side of the, the right hand fuselage on that cabin because that's where the pilots are. Ah, gotcha. That's there's, also like, a, a, like an air data boom, right? Yeah, so the, what's sticking out, it looks like a, a, a long sword for maybe like a, a joust or something like that. That is the air data boom. And that sticks way out in front of the airplane so that it's out in definitely, no question about it, clean air. That means that is the air that is undisturbed by the airplane itself, right? Because every vehicle, like a boat and an airplane, they have a bow wave. And they kind of push the air a little bit out of the way just in front of the airplane. And we didn't want to try to take that as airspeed data because it would be wrong so we push that data boom way out in front and it is yep. guaranteed clean nice air to measure for the airspeed and the altitude out there also on that boom are these little veins that that move with the direction of the relative uh, airflow so that they can tell precisely what the angle of attack is and their beta angle which is the amount of yaw or that that crab angle we were talking about yeah. earlier and you can tell uh. if it's in any kind of side slip um, often you'll see on gliders they'll have a yaw string for that purpose and we've got a little instrument out there that is telling us that we are yawed one way or another and we have those on the fuselage yeah, too, probably. but we're using that test boom out front to make sure that we calibrate the ones on the airplane correctly see and see okay did you see the question that Chris G just asked about this? That was a seemingly, like everyone that knows anything about airplanes knows what the heck that thing does, all right? Every plane has something like that on it, believe it or not. Heck, if you look at Enterprise, the shuttle's atmospheric flight test article when it was flying, it had a, it had a sensor out in front like that. It had a huge pitot tube on the front to understand the airspeed and how fast the shuttle was moving through the air, right? That was not a stupid question. I know that Chris G probably knows what the heck that stuff does. I know he knows what that does. I know Das knows what everything, Das probably knows what everything does on this freaking plane. But one, it's not good to presume. And two, you literally have a guy that does actually know what everything does on this plane. So it'd probably be better to ask. That's what I mean when I say like press, people ask stupid questions sometimes, right? But you, I mean, you know that. 
The guy knows that, but do people watching know that? Hell no. No, they don't. That's why that was a great question by Chris. That was a good question because that, you know, everybody knows what a pedo tube does, but you know, and Jack's saying about the, the, you know, air data arm, right? Everybody knows all about that stuff and what it does, but he also went into, he went on a kind of a thing about how, you know, it's measuring the plane's angle of attack and it's measuring its beta angle. It's measuring how much side slip it has. It's doing much more than just getting the airspeed and being an antenna. You know, that's the, those are the good kind of questions where you ask a question where the, the person you're interviewing can springboard off of that and you can, you can end up asking a question about something that you know about and then learn something more after that. That's that's why I like Chris. He always asks questions like that, and so does Das. They they do a very good job doing that. They're seemingly stupid questions, but they lead to something, and you end up learning something new, which is really really cool. Utilizers up high, and we actually have a couple of configurations we looked at and studied. No pilots are what on the right hand, down the left hand side of your screen, right hand screen. side. There no is a left. very slight weight. Yeah. advantage to having two standard right, tails Dave, separately not I do that conjoined. when I interview people too and it's, it's just smart. enough it's of an advantage that we decided to simplify our design by going with two standard tails sort of in a cruciform yeah, right. configuration if you look at them straight on um, sort of like a cross uh, and that's because it just had the slightest weight savings to the to the overall design also we did a ton of concurrent design and build on this aircraft, meaning we knew what we were building, but we didn't know how we were going to design it. So as we were designing it, we were also building it. Well, at the same time that we were doing that, they were building the hangar, and pretty soon the hangar became the limitation because it was oh. <laughs> the pace of the hangar was was in a little bit different than the pace of the when we built the tail in the plan, and. Uh, we did those studies for quite a bit, and, and actually there's a, a lot of trades on those. It's not just weight, but there's some aero advantages. Um, there's some uh, system reliability advantages and, and that kind of thing. But it really did make it a much simpler. Just imagine we built those tails on the ground where it's easy to access. You can stand on your feet and work on them. If we were to build the conjoined tails, that would be way up in the air, and that gets... <laughs> Now we have to build scaffolds and it gets to even just the considering what it would take to build a conjoined tail as one of the aspects in that. He's talking about why example. there's two separate separate gotcha. sets of horizontal yeah, stabilizers I, instead I mean, of just one going just over the like top. A wonderfully fascinating engineering puzzle. It that's is. And, and I've, not, I've given like talks it. about it before and I, I have this portion in one of my favorite talks that is it's called the, the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. They're and all one of my favorite sayings in there is don't that. reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. So that's Those why we have 747 engines. landing gear. And, and we landing have 747 gear. wheels and tires. See? And uh, we use the, the uh, hydraulic actuators from the 747. We saved a lot of design work and a yeah. lot of, of uh, design time and build time by utilizing some of those systems. Quite literally not reinventing the wheel. Quite literally, it is. It really is that. Um, here's another fun interview question. Then, um, do you know why the sides of the fuselages are flat? And uh, it's a very simple question. Is it to minimize principal... the airflow disturbance? Uh, you one would think it's all about aero, right? It's it's all about the aero, you know, the aerodynamics of the aircraft structure. It's not. It's because you can build a flat panel on a table so much easier than you can build a uh -huh. curved panel. <laughs> And so, so we took a little Touché. bit of, you know, the, what are the disadvantages of having a flat sided airplane? And we basically said, okay, what can we do to make this easy? And you'll notice there's a compromise. The noses kind of turn circular and become more of a cylindrical cone shape, I guess, conical, cylindrical ish. And uh, the sides, sometimes stay that's a boxy. design constraint. And they I wouldn't are have guessed, I wouldn't have guessed structure. Built, you know, they're panels that were done on flat tables just to, to make it easier, a simple, quick build. And, uh, and it worked really well. Yeah, it's great. It's exactly what you said. It's the simple ways, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was uh, going by. He I, said it. It sounds like a simple question. I said maybe for a principal mechanical engineer, it's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do Got a chase plane? It's a citation <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Mason, we kind of talked a little bit about what their options were here, and what do we understand about this next approach to the runway? Is I mean, land, firework. Is it, is it Ford dry motor? 
This one Joker's does 52. have the possibility yeah, that it's a lower There was a time approach. where that was there were that two was the right, that was the right move. The cards, it was easier to make. And that means that there could be up to two, but there will probably not be more than two. Gotcha. That's, that's oh, something yeah. to talk In fact, about. this is going to be a low approach with the option to go ahead and land. And that really what that is is it's a sight picture thing. So yep. the pilots will decide as they go. They they actually is this think of it as a dress rehearsal. They are rehearsing an actual landing all the way to the point of deciding to go around. So right. they they speak to each other, they communicate in the cockpit. All their intentions are that of an actual landing. What we call right? a full They're stop just, landing. Shin, there's However, just that's just two planes right holding the point hands. Of, that's all of decision height, they'll say either go around they won't say anything and they'll continue the landing but go around is a is a very pointed term it's a very you know like we have a few words in the cockpit that are actually There's very the important and they mean stuff right. and uh and so go around is one of those and um and they, what it is is they they manage the resources in the cockpit so the the pilot flying and the pilot not flying will share the workload in bringing the engines back up I to mean, power, I'm sure there's a, making sure the airplane is stable, sure the speed a cross is feed accelerating, option, and they'll fan. climb out. And then also Chase helps them with there's that. There's probably a center tank, if I had to guess. By listening to those calls on that hot mic I was talking about, and Mission Control follows along too. And they help evaluate the, the uh, decision to go around or to proceed with a you know, going into a full stop landing. It's a beautiful orchestration of those three entities, the chase plane, the mission control room, and the pilots flying. And uh, meanwhile, quietly in the back, the flight engineer is, is busy keeping an eye on the systems and configuring it for uh, the, making sure that when they put the flaps down that the hydraulics are, are good and monitoring the pressures and the temperatures and then watching you know, brake temperatures once they do land and, and for you know, making sure that um, all the systems are still online for this. That's an important uh, point to make real quick. The fact that the rock did a go around, right? It didn't land on the first try. If you were on a commercial flight, you may think, oh gosh, we did a go around. It's terrible. Up. Something's wrong. But this is normal here. It's part of the test cards, like you right said. Shots. It's a chance Very for the normal. pilots to practice the approach in this massive aircraft airplane. This plane doesn't fly 50 times a day or anything like that. Right. Uh, so it's a great experience building time. It doesn't mean that anything went wrong or anything like that. Just a completely normal thing there with the go Absolutely around, right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely right. And and that can happen even in the event, you know, in a commercial flight as well. If, if something the pilot isn't satisfied with during that approach, they always carry the option to go around. And that is a safety call. That is a call to make sure if that they don't sure, proceed into something don't force not it. so safe. You'll and crash. in our case, the mission control and the <laughs> pilot and the, rule between the pilots, mission control and the chase, they keep that scenario well characterized. And the go around really is a practice oh, session no. for the pilots go to free. get a good approach feel, get, Fact. get, get sight picture. All right. Because remember, their practice is in a simulator for the most part, which is very Look high fidelity and very thing. good for them. But this is the real deal. Oh, and, man. and having this flight time is very valuable. Yep. And here we go, uh, approaching the end of the runway here. Will All right, so he commits. Around, is the question. Yeah. <laughs> so our pilot flying today is uh, Mark Things. And, Mark. Uh, he's known as Gidro. And uh, co pilot today is. Oh, a little Evan bit Thomas, of ground effect going on flight there. engineer is Jake Riley. And together they are the uh, flight test he's, team he's not, that has I don't think uh, he'll done, commit. They completed I flight three just, and now they're on go flight around. four in the same positions. Yeah, it's it no like good. they're going to go around again since they didn't yeah, use their you, Did you see the ground that, effect start to mess with that thing? Around. It started yes, doing this. That is definitely a go around. Yep. It's just floating over oh, the runway. Oh, look sort at of that surreal, thing. That thing is huge. Wow. I just have to say, I mean, after all this time of working on it, it just looks so great when it does that. I never get tired of that. Yeah. So as it sort of See how it's kind of doing this through the air? Light, very light. About the back, uh, the back pilot is on the starboard right side, right? Connected. And we've got another sort of wing. The side that has the antenna on it. You'll see it when it flies here, by. There's an antenna coming uh, out of asking, the nose. Uh, why do the wings not have winglets on the ends for improved efficiency? Oh, well, that's interesting. Straight wings. Notice on those aircraft that do have those those winglets, they are usually a swept wing configuration when they do that. This airplane has a straight wing configuration. It's uh, what we affectionately refer to as a Hershey bar wing. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind right. of that. It's supposed to be, you know, more of a, a rectangular shape when looking at it from the top. 
Uh, this airplane has a straight wing, and it does actually right, have Villanova. winglets. They're very, very small. And what those winglets do is it sort of trains the vortices shed from the wingtips into a more... Uh, it's an antenna cell box, bit, you know, but also it's the pedo. Vortex yeah, it. I made that mistake, We're too. not so worried about They actually efficiency. asked them. They said, I mean, what's the thing coming out of the front? Engines, he said it's the antenna, and it also functioned as the pedo sensor. Throttle. It's yeah, it, efficiency. Pedo tube. Fuel efficiency was not part of the mission of this aircraft, Sorry, so we that. didn't really spend a whole lot of time changing the, the winglets and going for, you know, a fuel efficiency gains in any way. What we did want to do was have a wingtip that shed the vortices in a way that they were far away from the tails and that they made you know stayed in a safe uh, area so um uh, so there, there are actually looking give us closer. a size there comparison are with tiny little winglets they're kind of an that's a citation too tip. and nice. uh actually you know while we're speaking of that if you notice that there's this wing has what's called polyhedral so the middle portion where the two fuselages mount are, is straight and then approximately 65 feet in from the, each wing tip is what's called a dihedral break, where the wing is actually kind of bent so upward like just a little bit. Regular private and, jet. And uh, that dihedral break is uh, wings go up like uh, this. Only I think it's only about three degrees. It is part of what makes the stability of the airplane what it is. It helps with that, and therefore um, we don't need any any more. No stability augmentation in that direction where things are it's a pretty basic wing design and it was mostly selected for the ease of build um building a swept wing like such as on an airliner that's very difficult yeah. and uh, takes a lot more time yeah so this was a little simpler to build a straight wing yeah, well, I mean, and, and, and it's interesting. Like, I, I find myself getting lost in your answer sometimes, Mason, because I'm learning so much. <laughs> oh, about, thank you. Uh, about about all of this. So I, I don't want you to take my, like, oh, wow, he's not saying anything. Like, I'm just, I'm digesting it. And I forget sometimes <laughs> I have to talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, because, well, because it is interesting, right? Like, how different wing designs affect the aerodynamics and the stability. So things that you're just sort of used to seeing, because that's how commercial aviation has developed. I don't know, Alex. To every single type of I don't aircraft. know, John. That's absolutely right, and we took a lot of our of our hardware from the 747, which is an operational commercial airliner that flies quite a bit faster than this aircraft wings cause here. More drag. But it wasn't for those reasons that we took those parts. We were we were looking for those because they fit the bill for at higher the speeds loads bandit, or yes. the the function of the Straight airplane that we're looking sub, for. You know, for example, that landing here, they, they were better than all swept from wings 747s do. and from our donor jump. aircraft and. Therefore, their retraction systems, like the hydraulics that move them up and down, they're all part of the original 747 application. So, and fellas, a, a swept wing, uh, swept wing design is for something that's going to go fast into high subsonic, transonic, and supersonic. That's where you really want swept wings. But also, swept wings aren't the end all be all. Like, oh, my my, my airplane has swept wings, and that means it can break the sound barrier. That's not how that works. The Bell X1 no, had straight wings, and it up. broke the sound barrier. Um, the first plane to break the sound barrier had straight wings. So uh, what a swept wing does is that it makes the plane, it basically handles a little bit better at higher speeds because uh, the, the way the air, it's basically the way the air goes over the wing. A straight wing or that Hershey bar wing that Mason was talking about there uh, is very stable at low speeds. Straight wings are very stable. Um, uh, at, at low speeds be, because once again, it's, I have to kind of start describing how the air flows over the wing. Uh, basically the air can slip over, a, over a, a swept wing at uh, a low speed. It can basically move sideways on the wing. Like if you have your swept wing right here, the air that comes at it moves this way uh, a little bit. And at lower speeds that makes the, well, it makes plane not very stable, but at higher speeds, that's, you know, the wings can cut into the air better. Uh, but so at slow speeds, you have a wing like that. I mean, this thing ain't going to, this thing isn't going to go fast. It's not going to go faster than a 747. That's for sure. Uh, because it doesn't, it's not designed to that straight wing is way more stable and it's especially stable because those straight wings at low speed, high altitudes generate a lot of lift. Well, not even at low, high altitude. It, they just generate a lot of lift at low speeds. Because the wing can really, instead of having air go sideways over the swept wing, the air goes straight over the straight wing. And if the air is going like this, right, uh, the air is going over the wing like that. Uh, 
if it's basically going perpendicular to the wing, the wing can work better. That's the best way to describe it. You don't get any air moving sideways over the wing, because air moving sideways over the wing means you're not going to generate as much lift. Yeah, air moving sideways over swept wings is a real big problem. That's uh, It's a real big problem because it makes the wings make a lot of drag. It's something that they actually figured out with... Hey, truck. Uh, it, with the first generation of... Uh, uh, like, well, maybe not first, second generation of jet fighters. So if you look at a MiG-15, for instance, right? MiG-15s have these obnoxious wing fences over the wings. And it's it's something that I'm going to show you and you're not going to be able to unsee it. Look at the... Look at, look at that. It has little... Wing, these are called wing fences. There's basically a, a strip of sheet metal that's perpendicular off the wing. That was that was MIG's way of trying to get air to flow straight over the wing. But if you notice, they're only right here. They don't have wing fences going all the way out to the end because they still wanted to get the advantages of the swept wing. See what I'm talking about? Yeah, big wing fences, wing fences on there because they yeah they didn't figure out. They were trying to figure out, you know, why the swept wing didn't work as well. I mean, the F-86, the F-86 is kind of the same, but the F-86, because of its wing design, has much smaller wing fences on it. Because, you know, the Americans did a little more research with aerodynamics there. Uh, that and the MiG-15, honestly, is not designed to be super refined. It's designed to w just work, and it's designed to be good enough. So instead of redesigning the wing, they just said to put some, put some fences on it and kind of, I think that'll work from there. See what I'm talking about? The F-86 doesn't have that because of how the wing is shaped. Uh, so, yeah, basically, you know, with a straight wing, it's going to be much more man maneuverable uh, and stable at lower speeds. And with this swept wing, it's much more maneuverable at higher speeds, which is why fighter jets have swept wings. And like, if you look at planes that aren't, that are, you know, if you look at like, see, see the sweep angle on those wings, compare that to like a sweep angle on a 737, right? 737s do have swept wings, but they, they're not, they're not swept like that. That's, that's almost a, that's like a straight wing with a, with a slightly, slightly swept edge. See what I'm talking about? It's not like a super swept back wing like an F-86. See what I'm talking about? That's almost a straight wing. Why? Well, you're not doing any dog fighting in that thing. That's why. Even though, even though newer versions of the 737 probably could. Uh, so I swear, if somebody makes a Max joke, I'm gonna kick you in the face. Um, but anyway, let's go back. Let's go back over to the test. F-14 has both. Yeah, cake. That was something that they were. Yeah, exactly. For a while, they figured that you know they were like, oh, why don't we just make the wings move back and forth, and then you get all the benefits of a straight wing, and then you get all the benefits of a swept wing. Well, in an F-14's case, it would have been a delta wing, right? But uh, but see, here's the thing. You want to see you want to see something cool? Here, let's look at let's look at an F-22's wings. Check this thing out. Look at an F-22's wings. Is that a swept wing? Is it a straight wing? Or is it both? Or is it a reverse swept wing? Where the tailing edge the tailing edge of the the tail edge of the wing goes forward. Like uh like an X-29. An X-29 was a NASA test plane, and they tested reverse sweeping the wings. This proved to be a little bit more stable, believe it or not. It proved to be more stable at high speed. The plane was way more maneuverable because of that, right there. You see with a swept wing design, you see how the air moves out over the wings, and then you see with the reverse swept wing design, right? It forces air in towards the fuselage, much more stable. Now, that looks ridiculous, am I right? Looks pretty, that looks pretty stupid. And then, you know, there was the Su-47, which was the same idea. Yes, the Burkut is a real plane. It's very weird looking. Right? And then you look at an F-22, and it takes the best of a swept wing, the best of a straight wing, and the best of a reverse swept wing, and combines it all into one shape. That's why it's like diamond-shaped. Pretty cool, huh? You could literally see... 
uh, understanding and the elaboration on engineering and aerodynamics through the generations of, of planes, which is cool. Also F-22. Yeah, all, also F-22. Uh, the pilot, and as instead, this, this will be the first time. Um, no, that... actually, this is the same as Flight 3, so he was in oh, the okay. same seat in Flight 3. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Is, that, is there a component of that, like, training up a, a second of pilot course, to, Senator. you know, to be able to have the skills? What are the disadvantages of that type of wing? Absolutely, um, yes. Both both pilots, it's kind of funny how they call it pilot and co-pilot. Uh, probably not very, really, not too incredibly stable at low speed. As a, as a company, as a team, we don't really, you know, label it that way we but, have pilot flying and pilot but honestly like the f-22's wings being like swept in the front swept in the reverse swept in the back and basically straight in the center right is that you get a wing that's pretty much good at doing everything but not necessarily like super specialized in one area and that's what the f that's what the f-22 and the f-35 are supposed to be they're supposed to be pretty much good at everything you know coming up is the actual landing let's yeah. let's see if look we at the, look get at the this angle. one is going thing, to be the landing i slipping. think of, of course, go. they would have the option to go around. The so Jack's camera here is on the tower, and the plane is almost pointed right I at agree, the tower as it approached there. Then it's straightening it out. That's a big one. So the runway, fellas, is 150 feet wide. It's about as big of a runway as you'll get. Oh, 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 man, look at the ground effect. So what happens is air is being compressed between the plane and the it's like ground. decided to go around again. And that's why it's doing he this. It's called to go around. Yep. See, he tried to take it in, and the plane started doing this because the ground effect started to take it. And It's the about a 10 to 12 minute cycle time. And now the reason why the ground effect started to take it on, like, you know, you'd think that if the plane's going parallel to the ground, right, you're going to get the ground effect across the whole plane, right? Well, no, it's windy. So it, it'll only affect, it'll affect one side more than the other. That's why when he come every time that every time the pilot gets near the runway, you know, the plane kind of does this a little bit. He'll take that into account and he'll probably trim it out the next during the next landing. For training, given the uniqueness of this aircraft. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, yes, I know what you mean. Uh, I, uh, I would first like to acknowledge that uh, there's that only one cockpit came from the Academy of Model Aeronautics. I am a model on, airplane uh, uh, yes. aficionado <laughs> my whole life, and uh, I actually credit model aviation to my career. So, um, oh, nice. so cool. yeah. So anyway, um, thank you for that from the Academy of Model Aeronautics. Hey, right. the, the flight sim that we have is a unique build entirely, and that's because the systems on this airplane. What's are where the cockpit different. should be on the we, other side? utilized as much of the know. interior portions of the cockpit of the 747 as we could so like the instrument panel is pretty much the same thing and like the pedals and the and the yoke and the seats and all that we took directly from the 747 so we may, took the opportunity to make a simulator just the same and we've got this simulator that's in a cool. room that's a fixed base simulator so the that's floor really cool, and actually. the nose the of the airplane is sort of represented but it's fixed it doesn't move and outside the windows of that simulator is this semi-hemispherical screen where uh, cameras point to it and, and they, they show the exterior portion. It's so a good they time actually, on the East Coast, or on the West um, Coast. Look at the clock. Uh, they actually kind of give you that, as you're sitting in the, in the simulator, you actually get kind of the feelings. Your inner ear yeah, doesn't staples. do anything, same, but you got your the same brain idea is like, on, wow, yeah. I, it feels like you're rolling and... and, and Turning, you know, and it feels like you're everything is there. And in fact, um, I've had many chances to learn how to fly this airplane by mm -hmm. getting in that simulator and and landing it and, about, and doing Christian. takeoffs and such. And it is really great because the systems are represented. So you flip a switch and the gear goes. Uh, you flip the gear handle up, for example, and you 31. look out over that left fuselage and you'll see the graphic of the landing gear retracting. How cool is that? That's neat. And. Uh, uh, so there is a, um, it is really interesting how um, that simulator does, even though it's fixed, you sit in it and you roll and turn and you oh, feel no like cake. you're moving. The brain just puts you, puts you there. It is high fidelity in, in my opinion. Awesome. I'm sure the, there are some systems in it that could be better represented, but for the most part, anything that's critical 
they do it all. And what's really great about our simulation Strata is launcher. that it's connected to our mission control room. It's the ROC, so it Strata Launcher. It practices Gracious. the mission control team and the flight crew team just the same. Because you have to practice the mission control uh, jobs and the, and the responsibilities at each scope. You have to practice those just the same as pilots would go practice in the, in the airplane. You need to have the communications and the, and the ability to, you know, judge what the system, you know, is doing and if it's in a good configuration or not. And so they commonly have what we call sim session days. And those sim session days include the entire team of the mission control and the flight crew in the simulator in two separate buildings. It's really cool how they tie it together electronically and they, it looks like a real flight. It is every, they even have radio calls in it just like a real flight. It's absolutely fascinating. Those that are fans of flight simulation games, eat your heart out. It's awesome. <laughs> you see people posting up pictures of their home simulator, right? And they have all these screens and stuff. You should just like post oh. up a picture of the big simulator. Oh, yes, so. yes. It is It is absolutely great Most stuff. Most likely, Blood Flames so is much test fun to fly. Yeah. Where are they flying? They're, so, folks, if you're just, just trying to bring it in for a landing, landing this huge saw. aircraft you see in the air is the ROC. It's the Strata Launch carrier aircraft designed to do uh, testing of things that need to be carried up into the air, various hypersonics and things like that. The plane has a lot of capabilities and a lot of cargo yes. capabilities. Yes, and she. today mm -hmm. they performed a couple They're of tests hands. for the first time ever, retracting all of the landing gear. On flight three, they actually re retracted uh, a subset of landing gear, but not all of the Grace, landing aren't there gear. There's enough bad so things going on right now. We don't need four, to review. We, we don't saw need to be reminded earlier, of a couple today. times for we the need first time today. the rock oh, flying clean, no landing gear protruding from the bottom of the the vehicle, the airplane there. And now we've seen a couple of go arounds. That's a Cessna you can citation. See from our cameras that the winds have been not exactly a small as we progress airplane. into the afternoon here. Again, always at the is, pilot's man. discretion whether or not to land. Like Mason was saying, plenty of fuel here to to go around. But we continue to watch them basically get some experience in flying this massive aircraft out there at Mojave today. Mason, thank you so much for all the insight, all the technical information. Um, That's folks, awesome. Mason yeah. is with Strata Launch. He's a principal mechanical engineer with Strata Launch there, providing us some fa fantastic, awesome not only technical there. insight <laughs> today, but a team insight. Some of the some of the things and the way that you feel when you see these tests pr proceeding and the gear retracting and flying clean for the first time. Thank you so much, Mason. I, thank nice you so us. much, and I have had a great time with you. This has been a really good experience, and, and of course, a great for? flight yeah, test. Launching and, rockets and, and as I mentioned space, before, the emotional paycheck from a good flight test is always worth it. Emotional and, uh, paycheck. Happy to like share that. it. Really happy that uh, Strata Launch has taken the position of letting this go out on the public airwaves, and and uh, I'd like to give a shout out to um, our CEO and our CTO. Our CEO is uh, Dr. Zachary Crever. Our CTO is uh, Dr. Uh, Danny Millman, and those guys are, are uh, absolutely instrumental in helping us set up what we want to make as our public image, which is that of flight test yeah, and right? uh, solution making. So I just want to thank those guys for uh, being such a Chat, great a leaders maker. and helping us get to a great flight test today. Couldn't couldn't agree more. Thank you yeah. so much to everybody at Strata Launch and for, for allowing oh, us to be such a public yeah. thing. I can't, that, Flight test is so cool. It's the bleeding edge of technology and of our, of human yeah. knowledge. And we're expanding that envelope of human knowledge today. And you guys are, are sharing that with us. And so just yeah. I know I know I'm biased because we're the ones bringing the feed out to everybody. So of course I'm going to be appreciated. But absolutely, I think it's 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 the right thing to do. And it's super cool that you guys are open to this and i'm just floored that we're able to partner with y'all and and do a stream like this so thanks well, and oh and just i really appreciate about mason is like i can hear the enthusiasm and the love that you all right. have for this and that's part of what we all love to bring is not just that i mean certainly the technicality of what is going on but but that drive and that passion from the people who make it possible so so thank you for for helping to bring that from the entire strato team oh thank you so much thank you yeah and folks, if you want to keep up with what Strato is doing, some of our mods have put a couple links in chat. You can follow Strato Launch on Twitter. It's uh, twitter.com slash Strato Launch. Pretty straightforward. Click on the link there and toss a follow over their Twitter. We are typically, uh, you okay, typically we're get some announcements and things that we are have going the on. Combination. Of course, what's going on today as well. Stop but on. hop on over to Twitter if you're a Twitter user and toss a follow to Strato Launch. But I don't know. And yeah, there's that link again. 
<laughs> yeah, as they sort of roll around here to realign with the, with the field, um, uh, 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 we've got a question here asking, um, specifically to you, uh, addressed specifically to Mason. Um, since the standard 747 is two engines per wing, is the innermost engine mounted on the spare pylon that comes on a 747 that you. was intended for I texted engine you the grocery transport. list. And oh, I hope this you is, understand that. Yeah. Right, drive safe. I think I got it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is one of my friends. You Thank know. you, Rich. Um, uh, yes. The 747 has a mysterious fifth pylon, right? They all have four engines, but occasionally you'll see a picture and you can actually Google this, the 747 fifth engine. And what that is, is there's a ferry a mount for ferrying an engine and it, it's when they do that it's not plugged in it's not running it's not consuming fuel or making thrust it's just along for the ride and what i think they use that for was transporting an engine from one airport to another on a regularly scheduled commercial flight and that is is they can take the engine off of a, you know for example use a send an engine to an airplane that needs one in some other place and they could do that without interrupting a flight schedule perhaps and um so no for the, our airplane we didn't actually use that mounting position at all we just used the the regular pylons for the um the four normal engines but that fifth pylon is one of the oddities of the 747 that i am always fascinated by the the design of that 747 is is absolutely spectacular and that is one of the little neat little niche curiosities that they that they have so yeah some yeah that's the question think, rich i think at the time it, it, like when the 747 was debuted there was no real some uh some other computing strata launcher company decided to take that fifth pylon and attach a rocket to it true story Yep. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Love 747s. Mason is right. The Fight 747s are or anything like that. literally one of yeah, the Chadley explains around. Structurally, we just didn't need that fifth pylon at all, that fifth mount, but um, we did use the same pylons and we built our own structure on the inside of the wing that handles, that accepts that, that original Boeing uh, uh, pylon. So that could... makes it nice too because if we we have spare engines too because we bought two 747s and we stripped their their parts and used what we could from them oh, so therefore so we cool. have a couple of spare engines <laughs> in the so hangar because cool. they come with four each oh that's so I neat somebody could do the math for us on that uh how many engines could the rock ferry oh, hello. if it needed to ferry <laughs> engines it could carry quite a few engines i bet how much oh, i love those our, pictures yeah ferry those, those photoshop ferry engines <laughs> The Edits Photoshop, like that. Yeah. Like 15 engines yeah. in the pylon in the middle of the uh, two fuselages. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and, and <laughs> so two fuselages, uh, which is great. So um, but Mike Hancock is asking, um, so does that mean that the simulator has an extra cockpit to one side? Oh, that's, that's funny. <laughs> it doesn't in reality, but it does graphically. So it's you just the one cockpit in a room. But you look out over there, and I don't know how the, the people that we've had several um, uh, simulator engineers um, work on this because it's a big project, but they somehow added that nose to the graphic in the, in the copy. And you, as you're flying along, it stays right there and it's kind uh, of gear up, similar. and the, the, the landing gear will retract and gear down, and it'll deploy. But the best part of it is, is you can release the payload and launch the payload, and it drops and flies out in front of you and climbs up in a way. So, um, <clears throat> shut up, uh, shut up, Nick. That's really not true. It's fun to see that in the simulator. Okay. You can take okay, off, it is, like, it just me. It, I'm not a pilot. Uh, so, I. I don't know if they put it on easy mode or what for me. That's but a good question, Biram. Take off and um, I'm right sure over, there is right to over an the extent. mountains. I'll just hit release. Plane definitely and, and flies a little bit happens. like this we've, with we've the rocket the on it. Yeah, to do that. of course. That's a lot of fun. You can trim it out, though. It's just so cool to see the graphics you can, you can kind of play the rudder. 747 has a big rudder. You can yep. trim, you I want can to point this out really quickly here. This is the runway cam. It's actually situated at the end of the runway, and you can see the crabbing there, how the fuselages are not pointed right down the runway. And if we look at Jack, who's on the tower, the two fuselages are almost pointed directly at Jack, yep. who is on the tower off the side of the runway. This thing has six 747 in engines I'm using on the it. terminology there, correct, right? And you absolutely are. Yes, that sounds great. And they're just compensating for a little bit of a crosswind. 
Yep. And as they near the surface of the runway, they'll oh, watch the ground effect that's going to take the plane and try to move on the runway. Watch. When they get close to the ground, air is going to get compressed between the plane and the fuselages. Yep, there it is. See it? See it? See you take the plane and try to lift it up. There you go. He's going to... Guy's going to compensate for it. Bring her down. Oh, man. The ground effect's nasty, dude, with that wind. There we go. Woo! We've got smoke on both uh, sets of landing gear there. It was you a see, beautiful landing. See the ground effect? Try to take the plane and flip it over? It's because it's windy. And the rock Dude, she's a beast. Look at that out thing. There at the, uh, Mojave Air and Space Board. I love the bit of clapping and cheering that you could hear in the yep. background too. That always, I, I love the uh, the the ambiance that that adds to everything. Yep. Oh, congratulations, test team, for making such a great test flight Good today. Good job, guys. It looks very successful. Yeah, a little windy up in Mojave today. And that cheering is coming from the rest of the team. That is uh, getting to watch because uh, they, yeah, also, so they also get to uh, uh, participate in watching. You know, our, our company believes Birds. fully in, in that emotional paycheck idea that I was talking about. So we on. actually set up viewing areas for our employees to enjoy We've made watching this the thing fruits before. of their labor. It's and about that hard Wow, land. is it rewarding. No, that the pilots are on the right. Like butter. Like, wow, there was a crosswind and everything. It's, it's been <laughs> gusting like crazy up here at the top of the tower. And that landing looked I sent him as exactly. Yeah, yeah. I said easy. Even we talked last time about how sometimes yeah, one set 31. of gear will touch down before the other set. And I'm sure if you roll back the tape and you look at it, it clearly one touched before the other. But the two clouds of smoke were almost together, right? It looked like the whole thing just sort of yeah. just down to the runway. Well, there's there's a, a lot of wheels that have to spin up. What a big freaking plane, <laughs> and, dude! And because Six, sometimes seven, there's a little bit of angle of attack, the 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 aftmost, the rearmost wheels will spin up a little bit ahead of the of the forward ones. Yep. But that's mm -hmm. by design, and that is absolutely normal. And also the trucks, the individual wheels, they tilt. You know, like zero, he's probably going to go up, like dropping up a bomb, two, and then right? Lay down when bombers drop bombs, bombs they actually end up for going each up. Of the trucks, but, like this, because uh, they appeared to be a very good landing and you're changing the weight. A good center line performance so you're you have a dynamic excellent. mass congratulations <laughs> ivan and, how much thrust and, uh, from six Hidro seven forty seven engines very good job here jack is actually uh, zoomed in and this is actually the side of the plane that the flight crew is on correct it is correct and that just under that window is there's kind of a square shape the outline on the top there just under that is their is their cabin door so it's kind of a little round door that's what they get in and out of <sighs> Yeah, they're Pratt and Whitney engines. So, so what that they'll would be do a, here is, from is a they'll, they'll sit for a little bit and they'll ch monitor JT9's engine temperatures the and they're doing a shutdown procedure and so that the ground crew right. can approach and check on uh, wheel temps and get ready to tow back. Oh, no, that's oh, thanks, Heidi. wheel temperatures. Um, can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about that? Why, why, why is that something that, that you'd be interested in? Well, that is something we want to be interested in because that is what the our truck drives that, that home. Look at how big wheel that temperature or brake temperatures are. You know, we're trying to stop a very big, heavy object, and we don't want those brakes to over. I'm going to go over here. But also, we're using it. Whoa, we know through math that man. the brakes will heat up to a certain level, a certain temperature if they're operating properly. So that is a measurement of how <laughs> well they operate, huge. and uh, it works really good. So. So uh, they just monitor those temperatures to validate their math. Oh, nice. Hey, we were talking about that a second ago. So Mason, I, Hell we've yeah. got the rock back Hell on the yeah. ground here. You can see the, the truck is actually approaching, like you said, going through all How their long checklists stay to in save flight? the vehicle. Um, when do we, when this thing we carries a lot of fuel, man. To launch on the results of it's designed today's to move tests. a big rocket up no, to 30,000 feet. Later on today, feet. they will be, be giving a press conference, and they will have a I don't know, uh, Cider, a conf maybe. A, be Probably added the capability. Handing out the information that talks yeah, about right. exactly how successful the flight test was. Of course, me sitting here listening to, launch, the, Joe. to the hot mic and, and uh, the help from Grace that I've had today, we're not actually able to tell how well the test points were performed. That's something that we do in post processing and data analysis in the days to follow. Oh, twin tugs, drummer. So we do take There's several your question days answer. to kind of evaluate what all this data is. It's an toe bars. unbelievable amount of data that gets streamed from, <laughs> that's stored from these flights. And this thing they're is so used cool. For a Look at how big that freaking so plane is, We take is, a few man. days to evaluate that and measure just exactly how it went. Sometimes It'll mean that we go retest something, and sometimes it means that we're good. All and five it includes the tanks so and Boca are in it place. It just depends. But uh, yeah. for this one today, Hell we'll get yeah. kind of a qualitative assessment of the flight from the crew later on this afternoon. 
And uh, you can expect that in a formal press conference release and our social media releases as they come out. They will engines make comments on that. Uh, Jax, how much of his office seven forty seven? Absolutely makes sense. And like we said, folks, uh, if you back up the video, they actually talk about it. Th- those are seven forty seven engines, seven forty seven landing gear. Uh, they have seven forty seven avionics and control systems. The cockpit is a seven forty seven. They just took the cockpit out and put it in this thing. The cockpit's over here. My guess is the, the reason why the cockpit is on one side is because. Remember, this thing is designed to launch rockets. I'll bet you launch control is in the other is on the other flight deck. That's my guess, but I don't know for sure. Um, he may have he may have talked about it while I have it muted like right now. So I'm gonna unmute. It's just absolutely fantastic to have you here, Mason. Oh, thank you for having me. I've had a great time. I very much appreciate it, John. Yeah, and Chris, it's, thank dude, you. it's a hot rodded 747. It's, it's so cool. It's one thing for us to sort of sit here so and sort of talk about cool. what we're seeing as the as the third party, you know, NASA's yeah, flight here. Yeah, thirty one. Yeah, it's made so out of leftover seven four parts. Company who can provide that insight to us. Um, it really does that's add a so lot legit, to the stream. Man, that's Chet, so cool. if y'all are over there, if you're viewing right now, say thanks it's to Mason for us. Um, he did take time out of his day here. Thank you, Mason, to join us and help us understand what was going on. Also, back in the studio, we had Mr. Chris Gebhardt. Chris is the assistant managing editor for NASA Spaceflight. Chris, I don't know, thank drummer. you so much for adding your voice into the uh, Yeah, right, Hildes? My, my pleasure. Uh, just, just like Jack, uh, t- test flights like this and watching, uh, uh, just to me, watching so many people's hard work come, come together and come to fruition like this. Dude, like, look, love look at the dudes. They're walking around underneath it. You can it. stand underneath it. That's how Absolutely. big that thing is, man. And out in She's the field, we actually had two crew in the field operating yes, cameras Riados. for us mm-hmm. to bring it works exactly all different like that. views today. Starting with Pauline Acklin. This is uh, her yeah. camera she had Mojave. over here. She's not on comms with us, but massive thanks to Pauline for being a part of Any the Lufthansa broadcast Any Lufthansa fans today. out there? And then we also had Mr. Jack Beyer. Jack was actually up on the tower out there at Mojave, providing us this angle here. Let's see as we switch to it. That was the uh, angle from Jack up on the tower out there today. Jack, we still got you on comms? I don't know, sign nerd. You sure do. And I just once again want to underscore what a cool day today was. We got to see full retract of all the gear of Rock for the very first time. We got to see it flying clean. And uh, I mean, Hey, I'll take a minute since I'm si- I'm giving my outro here. I, forgot to I got to check videos. a bucket list off uh, item off. I got to come up to the top of this tower, which how cool is that? Uh, thank you to Mojave Air and Spaceport for allowing us to film from the top of the tower, and thank you to Mason so much for the idea for putting a camera up here. Absolutely, super cool views, and I'm 100% floored. I hope uh, all the test objectives today were accomplished happily, and I'm excited for the next flight with a pylon. Moving on to further the flight envelope of rock. Jack, wow. are you excited? Oh, I think we can we can barely tell if you're excited I, or not. <laughs> I'm so excited too. I'm gonna go up on that tower with you next time. <laughs> it, it. it really was a great idea, and it's a great angle of the rock as it's here on the runway. Like this is it's stopped in the perfect spot for this shot right here. It so. really did. It's, oh, it's Mojave, perfect three quarter this is the framing. Random flight test. Mojave <laughs> Airport is this is what it is for. Yep. It's, it is. It really is. There's so many cool things that have happen here and that will happen here and i'm just going to take the moment to just gratuitously zoom in because oh my god what an angle this is so cool thank you to again to strata launch and to mojave air and spaceport for allowing us to do those aren't furs they're dodges absolutely Uh, we had a lot of fun as we were sort of waiting for the broadcast to start here this morning we saw experimental planes going all over the place and we have all our cameras up even when we're not sharing them with you viewers. So uh, we were well beast. entertained watching all the planes what and all the activity there at beast the uh, of an aircraft. That board. thing is so cool. Hey, also a massive thanks right, to Mr. Yeah. Michael Baylor. The shot here at the end of the runway, most of the tracking you saw today was uh, automated convu- computer vision tracking that Michael put together himself. I put together a camera for him. We were able to deploy it again with the help of Mojave out there at the end of the runway. And so a lot of those tracking shots you saw were courtesy of Michael Baylor. Don't normally have him on comms here, but uh, that I, I imagine he is super happy with the way some of those shots turned out today, especially when the camera looked up and the rock was going right over the top of it. What are the white arrows? Um, mean, that was Jack? that automated camera, Who's the robotic camera we placed at the end of the runway. So excellent work arrows? today, Michael. That was absolutely fantastic. And lastly here, folks, my name is John Galloway for NASA Spaceflight. You may have heard people uh, talk to me or refer to me as DOS, but I answer to both names here. And that is is going to bring us to the end of our coverage. Flight 4, Test Flight 4, 
for the straddle launch rock. Rock back safely on the ground. We'll be standing by Thank for how blue. those tests Jet went. Just place threshold. Come on now. On how straddle launch will be progressing with test flight five and beyond. For now, that is going to mark the end of our broadcast. Massive thanks to all of you for watching here. Also, massive thanks to Straddle Launch for partnering with us and helping us cover some of the costs of making this broadcast happen today. But we are going to go ahead and shut it down, and we will see you nerds later. Thank you so much for joining us. Pretty freaking cool, man. Pretty freaking cool. Make sure you go over there and follow NSF, dude. Subscribe to that YouTube channel. See that? Did you see the content they just brought you? Come on. Come on now. That's pretty freaking cool. I didn't know that that thing was going today, which is pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. All right. How long has it been since Dos Stream KSP? He's, dude, Dos. He's producing, he's the producer for NASA Spaceflight. He's the one that puts all the cameras together, sets up the cameras and stuff. Like, he, he gets the streams working and everything. Yeah, he doesn't, like, doesn't have a lot of time to stream. I, thanks for the heads up, Bandit. What did I tell you in Discord? But yeah, uh, hey, Meeps, what's going on, buddy? How are you? Hey, uh, Meeps, I got a question. Does your, uh, does your back hurt from time to time from carrying around some wings on your back? Like, does your back, does your back hurt? Like, asking, just, just genuine curiosity. Does your back hurt from the wings that you have now? Like, just, just, just wondering. Yeah, he's doing real boy stuff. Yeah, that's right, Chris. I hope I hope that someday I could get out there with him. That'd be really awesome. But then again, that's kind of the reason why I'm why we're putting the truck back together, you know? Is this still space news? What does the title say? It hurts, but you get used to it. I don't know. It's chilly in Texas today. Okay. Alright, right, right on, Meeps. It's good to see you, buddy. He did say you can come whenever. I, dude, I, hell, I'd ride. Once again, I talked, talked to Doss last week. I'm like, hey, when are we doing this? Dude, I'll, uh, you know, he's like, oh, you can come down with me next time I'm going to come down. I'm like, all right, just say when that is, dude. I'm there. Time for tank talk. That's not Meeps. Are you sure, Thomas? Hey, Zonic, what's going on? Alley Cat, 49 month resub. Anyway, uh, yeah, here, let's see what the Starship update. Let's see what the Starship update is. Is about. Uh, here, here's the here's the footage from last night, and then we'll we'll check the we'll check the live view today too. Here, take a look. Once again, it's coming from our buddies over at NASA Space Flight. Make sure you go over there and support them. It's a little foggy. How did Artemis go? We got a rollout date for SLS on the uh, on the seventeenth. NASA four K for the rollout. Yeah, maybe. Okay, so there's 20 at the launch site. Let's see. How much do each one of those hexagons cost? Yeah, I don't know. Programs in research and development, you can't really get a per unit cost when you're when you're doing R&D. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Snickers, we, we listened to the press conference. Not sure if you saw this yesterday. Are those the pictures of the crawler? 
because of the pictures of the crawler. Hold on, hold on. Before we really dive into Starship, I do want to check that out. So NASA announced rollout on the 17th for SLS, and this is the thing that's going to pull that mobile launcher. This is going to think. This is the thing that's going to pull the ML and SLS out to uh, out to the pad. Oh baby. Okay, going. Right on. Oh. Hey, Tennessee River Rock. Man, that thing. Dude, did you see it crush the rocks, dude? Oh, dude. Look at this thing. Oh, no, was, this footage is great. I love it. You know, I have my crushed rock with me. Of course I do. Oh, that thing is so freaking cool. Any IT people noticing straight up the server rack trays that they use to carry the controls for this thing? <laughs> I want one. I want, I want one. I, I want one. Chat, hey, David Clark headset, hell yeah. I, I want one. I, I I I don't I don't know why I want one. Bruma said no. <laughs> so we shall call it peaceful rat. Actually, NASA calls there's two of them. There's two crawler transport. NASA calls them Hans and Franz because they're going to pump. Do up! Oh, that is so cool! It's a hybrid, you know. Yeah, diesel electric. Look at the brakes. That's the brakes. Step on the brakes! <laughs> that's the brakes right there. There's your brake disc. Did you see that? Oh, that's so cool! That thing is so freaking sick! Those are your brakes. Right there. Actually, those brakes look like they're lifted from a tractor trailer. Implying that this thing has a pneumatic trans... A pneumatic, um... A pneumatic, uh... A braking system. Which, that looks actually about right. That is... Yeah, that's a pneumatic braking system. You gotta build up... It's like a semi-truck. You gotta build up air pressure before you can put it in gear. Like... It's like the truck in summer car. Same thing. How does the hybrid work, diesel and electric? They have two Alco 245D V16 diesel engines in the in the crawler transport's frame inside of here. Uh, they're V16 diesel motors that are as big as a tractor trailer. Uh, they would be used on like a steam shovel uh, or a um, like as a power plant backup generator. Yeah. And those are feeding batteries, and the batteries turn electric motors right here. That's what this thing is. They're turning the electric motors, and the electric motors are on a worm gear that go to a gearbox that go to the that go to the drive gear on the tracks. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it's got a Buzz Azuku exhaust. I don't know if there's any batteries in this. It might all be AC. Yeah, there's got to be some batteries on there. But yes, yeah, I nerd. I'm not a hundred percent on if if it's working. Like yeah, like how I said, I, it's. It is a hybrid though, it's diesel electric. Why not a V18? Uh, because? Yeah, they don't turn around, they drive in reverse. You guys gotta understand, this thing, this thing can change it. This thing can change its ride height. It can change the ride height because it can tilt forward, it can tilt back, it can raise itself up, it can raise itself down. It's a giant SPMT for launch pads. That is a launch pad self-propelled module, well, self-propelled transporter. It's not modular, it's... Alright, what is this? What is this, Geeson? The buttocks.
Alright. Okay. I, you know, I guess that's nice. Some, I guess somebody probably thinks that's nice somewhere, I guess. But can it hit that three-wheel motion? I don't think so, man. I don't think this thing could three-wheel. I think it'll break it. <laughs> I think it'll break it. <laughs> no, no, Giesen. No, no. That is so not right. Yeah, it shows the angle. Check this out. The reason why it has adjustable ride height is so it can do this. That's pretty neat. Yeah, that's that's pretty neat. Wow, what a piece of equipment. Up close. I can't even click on it, dude. Yeah, yeah that's nice. Eee that's nice. Those are, dude, those are pneumatic brakes. That's what they are. The, the brakes on a semi truck look exactly like that. That's really interesting. I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize it. That that's how that worked. That's a brake rotor right at the front. That that thing is so freaking cool, dude. Can I can I watch that can I watch that B-roll footage again real quick? Can we just watch this one more time? Aren't semis drum brakes though? Yes, Miles. Semi trucks use drums, but that's the actuator mechanism. From from a pneumatic brake system for a truck, yeah, that's the act. They they have actuators on them. Those are those are actuators from a truck. I mean, it's probably not exactly a, from a truck. They work similar. I don't think they went and just raided a semi truck. There's the other crawler right there, Hans and Fonz. What about regenerative braking? What, what are you gonna regenerate? This thing's max. This thing's top speed is 0.8 miles an hour. Oh, this footage is so rad, dude. Yeah, gotta keep it greased. Keep it greased, man. You don't need these parts wearing down. That looks like it would be difficult to change. Give it a rev, yeah, right. I wonder how much weight is applied per plate of the track. Chris, it's a lot. That's actually the reason why the crawlerway is made out of these rocks. They're the solution for, okay, because think about this, guys. You, you know Florida, you ever been to Florida, you know exactly what, it, it's not like it's a dry place. There's a lot of water, the ground's very muddy, very swampy. Right, and on top of that, 39A is basically right next to the ocean, so there's also a lot more water, right? So how are you gonna move? How are you gonna move a 10 million pound launch pad with rocket out to the pad? How are you gonna do that? If you try to make it out of concrete, it'll just crush it. It'll just crack the concrete. And they figure that out. And, the, and you know, the, the solution that they came up with is, oh, yeah. It'll just crack the concrete. That's a good idea. The reason why this is gravel, like why this is Tennessee River Rock, right? Here's an example of it right here. Is because this particular type of rock really, it's basically a crush core. That's what it is. 
like the crush cores on Falcon 9. The, the composition of this rock will crush under load, and that crushing will absorb the force of that huge heavy crawler transport it driving over it. The crawler way does need to be resurfaced every time, but laying down some more rock is easier than trying to repave concrete or put down asphalt. This thing will just crunch right through asphalt. It'll look like a cheese grater. Is this from the crawler way? This is Tennessee River Rock. That's all I'm saying. It's Tennessee River Rock. Okay. So they basically said, well, instead of having to repave the stupid thing every time, we'll put these rocks that like being crushed that are pretty, pretty porous, I think is the right name for it. Uh, we'll take these rocks that like being crushed and we'll just put more rocks down. It way, it's way easier. Way easier than trying to repave the stupid thing every time. Holes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. No. 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 <laughs> How often do they have to lay the rock down? Eh, every couple of times. You can see that a lot of this rock is crushed, but uh, yeah. I mean, like, take a look, Ruka. You see where the the rocks are crushed a lot right here. That that's when it needs to be. So this is uncrushed rock. That's what it's supposed to look like, and that that means this has been driven over a lot. When the rocks get like that, when they start to get paved and compacted, that means they're not going to crush under load, which means the whole crawler way will sink into the ground if you, if you move something heavy on it. Just like how we talk about Highway 4 at Boca Chica is sinking into the ground. It's literally doing that. It's crushing the asphalt and doing that. But once again, that's probably where you, that, this is probably when you'd need to change it. You just need to put more rocks down, which is way easier than trying to repave and repair a road. That's, you know, guys, I talk about all the time how the VAB and the crawler transports and the mobile launchers with the clean pad is really designed to be scaled. They did, you know, people say, oh, the crawler transport takes forever to move the rocket to the pad. Well, th the funny thing is, is that the honest truth about that is that 39, Complex 39 was designed to launch a lot of rockets. And using Tennessee River Rock is a very good example as to why. Because you can't launch a rocket every month with 39A unless you w and, and have the crawler way be made out of concrete, right? Unless you wanted to repair it after two or three moves, rockets moving back and forth from the pad. So, well, rocket and launcher to the pad, launcher on the way back, right? This is an easy solution to keep the crawler way operable and not have your launch pad sink into the ground and also be able to achieve a high flight rate. This is how, this is one of the reasons why I know 39 was designed to work. Four bays inside of the VAB, three mobile launchers, two launch pads, two crawler transports. This thing was designed to be scaled. Because you wouldn't do this. You wouldn't do this type of thing if you were going to launch once a year. you just make it out of concrete. And that way you could do move four or five rockets to the pad over five years, then repave it later. Hi. When they built 39A... Hi. In, hi. When they built Complex 39, they, they built it to be able to launch a lot. I had a very surreal moment when I came home from the grocery store and I needed to share it with you in the chat so that it doesn't freak me out as much. Okay. On my way home from the car grocery store, I was behind a car whose license plate said Grim, and then it had a little Grim Reaper sticker next to it. And I'm like, this is very odd. And why would you do this to people? Car? Uh, that's it? Yeah, it freaked me out, man. Okay. It's like being visited by the Grim Reaper. What kind of car was it? It's a Nissan? Uh, uh, you, no, you, you don't need to be freaked out by that. It's just a boy <laughs> racer. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Wait, what kind of Nissan? What did it look like? I don't know. It looked like a shoe. Yeah. 
It wasn't that, was it? I don't... I only saw the back of it, so maybe... No? Um, maybe? I didn't look at it that much, but that might have been it. It wasn't like... that. No! Okay. Yeah. Alright. Okay. And it was just very odd. You know, he was like, why would you do this to everybody you drive by? Their last name could be Grim. Grim is a last name. I don't... Th but, but then you don't have to put the photo of the Grim Reaper next to it. All right. That's all I'm saying. Exactly, Cad. Oh, tr sorry. Never mind. It was just weird. That's all. Yes, you do. <laughs> the answer is yes. Here, you want this shaft? No, I'm good, thing. You sure? Yeah. It's not very sharp. I'm not draw Chat. Please. I'm not drunk, chat. I'm on my womanly time, and it started yesterday. I'm very tired. So I'm not drunk. I'm tired and anxious. Not like this. And World War not Three started. <laughs> not, not like this. Not like this. <laughs> Not like this! Ah! <laughs> Pull the roof cord! Get away from Pull the roof cord! <laughs> Pull the roof cord! <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, that didn't just happen, did it? Oh please. <laughs> why did you why did you put your hand around it why did you do that it was a joke why'd you do that woman because I wanted to see how you and chat would react because I too am capable of trolling Hmm. Touche. <laughs> hmm. 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 Touche. All right. Okay. 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 All right, Jack. I'll take the L here. That's fine. Who really? Who really lost here? Who really lost here? Really. <laughs> I Everyone. Won. <laughs> I won. That's all that matters is I won. All right, get out of here. <laughs> I didn't have ramen. I looked. What? I didn't have ramen. Damn it! You'd offer her a nice hard shaft. It's it is hardened steel. It is hardened steel. This is the steering. This is the steering shaft from. Uh, from uh from the truck not from my truck from a truck yeah I'll, you know what Jonathan I'll take the L that's fine I'll take the loss there that's fine how does the store not have ramen it's the bodega down the street Bicarus? eh let's watch the let's watch more starship footage do you have cooked men then no I don't have that Game over, you lose. Now, Jonathan, I don't think I did. Okay, that made my day. Nice. Just buy real ramen? Real ramen? Real ramen? Did you build out an MSC?
Did you bail out of MSC because I'm not like this or something else? Uh, Hibbit, I was just tired yesterday. Um, uh, I was just tired. I... So what's today? Today is Thursday, I think. Today's Thursday. I... Yesterday was Wednesday. I spent Tuesday night, Tuesday night into Wednesday morning, so two nights ago, I tried to go and figure out what the heck's going on around the world, and uh, I lost a lot of sleep trying to figure things out, and I couldn't figure anything out, and I was tired because of that, and I talked about it when I was playing Hearts yesterday. Uh, like I was, I'm trying to. I've been like I finally decided I'm trying to figure out what's going on because it seems like seems like it's gonna get worse. Seems like stuff's gonna hit the fan soon. And yep, turns out that premonition was right. Hey, uh, um, I got chicken and steak. Do you want them both in the freezer? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right. So yeah, I lost a lot of sleep and I ended up stopping the stream a little bit early last night because I was tired. Really don't like admitting that I was right in that one, but yeah. So it was a turbo fan. Good reference. Good reference, man. Hell yeah. So yeah, I yeah I stopped. Uh, because I was tired, and then I proceeded to not get any sleep at all again last night, because I, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they're the only one trying to figure out what the heck's going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been saying it all day today, guys, just, yeah, don't, don't go to 11. All right, don't go to 11. Cool heads prevail. Let's try and figure out what's going on, try to figure out why, and go from there. But that's going to take some time. Gotta, you got to assess the situation. You got to analyze the data, just like rocket science, okay? Don't go to 11. Don't be like Twitter. Don't do that. Serious. Don't do that. But anyway, let's keep watching Starship. They're pouring concrete here. Um, I'm pretty sure while we were watching the NASA press conference, SpaceX moved all the new methane tanks into place. Uh, we did kind of, we did kind of figure they were going to move more methane tanks into place because uh, the methane tanks from the orbital farm aren't aren't up to uh, storage specifications. So they did do that today. That guy is mixing con mixing concrete, mixing concrete. See, last for some neat crawler links from the NASA archive. Oh. Thank you very little. Oh, that's sick. And it, it Cummins. Cummins? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I like that last one. Looks like he's just cleaning the equipment. Yep, yep. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That dude, single cab, long bed, dually, baby. That's a cool truck. I like, I like that. I like that a lot. It's deferred. It's deferred. Last, please. So back to the crawler. Do they dig out and regrade before adding new? Yeah, yeah, they dig. Yeah, they dig out the crushed rocks and yeah, and then they put new. Yeah, it's yeah easier that way. Yeah, they uh, yeah they just dig it up and they they put new stuff down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, the, the whole idea is that you can do it quickly, John. Um, that's the whole idea. They can resurface it in like a week, which won't throw off launch schedules. That's why, that's why I keep telling you. 39A and the VAB and everything, that was built to launch. That was built to launch rockets a lot. They were, it might not seem like it because the crawler transport is so ridiculously slow, right? But that thing was built to launch a lot of rockets. Like, we're talking, we're talking launching a Saturn V, like, 
I, I would say, like, with the Apollo hardware that was built for the VAB, they could probably handle launching easily four times a year. Easily four times a year. It could probably, you could probably do more than that. Can we talk about the semi-driving skills? Yeah, that, yeah, that's pretty good. Pretty good. Playing uh, Truck Simulator in real life. Nice Peterbilt. Did you ever show in Google Earth where the stock of Tennessee River Rock is at KSC? No, Jim, I've never shown it. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know there was one. Are you asking me or are you telling me? I get that, just wasn't sure if the rock just kept compacting and making it hard to service under the new stuff. You know what, John? Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure. Because, yeah, if you keep compacting, you make a harder surface. But they might just throw down new rock, dude. It's possible. Asking, I'm curious where it is. I don't think they have one. Here, let, let, let me pause SpaceX Trucking Simulator. Let's take a look. I, I'm not sure they have one. I think they just buy it. Tennessee River Rock is something that you can buy at the hardware store. And that's why NASA, that's part of the other reason why NASA did it. It was off the shelf, just like how SpaceX did off the shelf. This is how NASA was back in the day. Not everything had to be a specialized system, which is really freaking cool. I mean, the crawler transporters right there are, that's just a steam shovel. It's, it's, a steam, it's steam shovel parts that are put together to make a crawler transporter. That's it. It's just a steam shovel. Because steam shovel tracks and suspension are built, are built exactly like that. It's an exact application here. I mean, that thing was built... It was built by Marion Power Shovel, who make mining equipment. Yeah, see, they, you know, these things back in the day, that's what the, that's what, steam, freaking steam shovels. And those things went out of fashion pretty quick. Yep. Yeah. yeah they just, they just used steam shovel parts or, well, mining equipment parts and, and built this thing. Yeah. Yep. Just like how Strata Launcher is made out of leftover 747 parts. Same idea, Bird. All right, let's take a look on the Googles. Do we see a pile of river rock here? But yeah, yeah, ten, like I said, Tennessee River Rock something that you can buy. You can buy that from the hardware store. Now, I'm sure NASA buys in bulk, et cetera, et cetera. But look, you can see where, where different rocks that are crushed were. You can see where the crawler transport's been. In this case, the crawler transporter, you, you can see that it was parked outside of High Bay 3, which is where SLS is. SLS is being built right here in, in Bay 3. There's bay one, three, two, and four. Or one, two, three, and four. And it's interesting, this part where the road crosses, I mean, you can clearly see how it's, how it fricks up the road. Look, the paint, see where the, see where the track marks are? Where they go across the road? It's, dude, that's enough force to scrape the paint off. It just crushes the freaking paint. Is that nuts or what? That is an insane amount of weight. Look, I mean, you, you know that the crawler transports don't go over this very often. It's not like they drive over it every day. Like one or two passes, scrape the paint right off. There should be an SLS in all four. You'll get no argument from me, man. Oh, and then you take a little bit of a lefter right there. Now look at once again, you see? It's starting to scrape the paint off of that damn road. It's crazy, dude. And you <laughs> the other thing is that you can clearly see grooves in this asphalt right here where it crushed it. Sure it'd be nice if we got some track parts in KSP too. Yeah, I mean I guess. And then if you get about halfway down to the launch pads right here, uh the you know, you have a little bit of a siding right here. This was built for the uh, Saturn V fixed service structure. That was the storage post for the Saturn FSS. The Saturn V uh, had a service structure that they could attach to it, uh, that the crawler transport could pick up. And basically it was a clean room for the payload area of the rocket if they needed to do any additional checkouts. There's a good picture of it. Yep. Saturn V FSS. Look at that thing, man. It's ridiculous. It's a fixed service structure. And the crawler transporter picks it up. Oh, 
Oh, there you go, goalie. Is it Alabama River Rock or is it Tennessee River Rock? I thought it was Tennessee River Rock. Wait a minute. Have I been saying it wrong this entire time? That would be freaking embarrassing, dude. But then again, it's me, so whatever. Alabama River Rock? I could have sworn it was... The next Crawlerway upgrade will be after Artemis 1 launches. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. The results? Alright, here we go. Let's see. Here it is. Let's read. Let's see what NASA has to say. I want to make sure that I got my facts right here. Massive pair of machines called Crawler Transport has carried integrated rockets and spacecraft to 39A and 39B for more than 50 years. Their initial design called for asphalt roads, but engineers quickly encountered issues. Asphalt couldn't handle the weight of the 6.65 million pound crawler on its own, much less the weight of the rocket to add to it. The asphalt also proved too sticky and therefore would not allow the Crawler Transporter to turn properly, causing damage to its roller bearings. Oh, word. We saw the roller bearings work in this. There, there they are. All right. There's your roller bearings. Uh, those probably the, the bearings are probably inside of this. These are idler wheels. Dude, look at that. It's cotter pinned out, bolted in, locked out. Crawler weight can handle 26 million pounds. That's pretty heavy. NASA conducted a study to find a material that would allow the crawler to make a proper turn and hold, uh, proper turn and the hold the weight required. The results, river rock. The river rocks are mostly quartz. Uh, guys, don't take things for quartz, okay? And around three to four inches in diameter, and import, or, which are important features for height and weight tolerance. They act as ball bearings that allow the crawler to turn with minimal issues. When the weight of the crawler rolls over the rocks, they absorb energy from compaction, helping reduce the vibration on the surface that could cause any damage to flight hardware being transported. Yeah, they absorb the shock. There you go. In addition to being easily accessible and affordable, River Rock provides the right kind of support the crawler transport needs. That's a load of schist. Yeah, there you go. So NASA has a history of buying rocks from Alabama, Tennessee, and Georgia. Okay, well, there you go. It's quartz-based, found in rivers in those states. Got it. Cool. So I was a third right, technically. Third. I got a 33 on my test, chat. How'd I do? Dang it, Draco, that boy ain't right. I'll tell you what. And then just... And then, yep, yeah. So you take the turn out here. That's what I mean. Those turns, crawler transporter wouldn't have liked it. And then it drives right up onto the pad. And then it, it drops the thing down on the pad. There are support pegs right there. See them? One, two, three, four, five, and six. And that's what holds the mobile launcher. That's what holds the mobile launcher down. And then they hook up the fuel lines right there. Hook up the fuel lines. Hook up the sound suppressor, which is... Uh, there's three sound suppression hookups. One for the pad deluge. Uh... One is pad deluge. The other one is um, the other one is the rainbird. So the sound suppressor and pad deluge right there, and I forget what the third one does. And EJ, as far as I can tell, these river these rocks are mined from old riverbeds, not just current ones. Well, yeah, you wouldn't want to mine rocks from a current riverbed. That would create erosion. Thirty-three percent top of your class. It might be all from the same river. It's possible. Yep. Yeah, see, it's crazy. When you get to the top of the pad, it transitions to concrete. See how beefy that freaking thing is? Look at look at how look at how freaking beefy the 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 structure needs to be to hold up the crawler transport on the pad. It's it's 
It's like a, it, a dude. I'll I'll tell you, the flame trench is about the size of an eight lane highway. I've stood next to it. I've literally stood where my mouse cursor is right there and looked over. It's about the size of an eight lane highway, and I would say probably I don't know, thirty meters up from there to there. Yeah, maybe yeah, no, maybe not that. Maybe half of that. It's a long way up. Long story short, uh, it, it's big. Um, and that's how much concrete structure they needed to put underneath this thing to get to, to get it to hold up on concrete. It's big. These pads are huge, dude. You don't you don't know the scale until you go up next to them. Uh, it's ridiculous how big they are. And that, of course, is not there anymore. Uh, it's a clean pad design, so it, it looks more like how the pad how 39B looked during the Apollo era. Only the added thing is that 39B has three lightning rods on it now, which is cool. Uh, so yeah, no light, no Apollo 12 scenarios happen. And then there's your there's your water tower. It's a gravity-fed sound suppressor. Uh, and then the pipes go in here, and they connect to those three outlets right there. I legitimately wonder if the structure needed would have been more or less had it not been built on Florida land. Um. You probably wouldn't ha have had to made such a big footprint for the pads, Draco, if it was built uh, on solid ground. In fact, probably the best reference that I could get you is... Please hold. The best reference I could probably get you is over here. Frame, tr flame trench is 57 wide, 43 feet high. Yeah. She's a beast killer fun. Yeah, the, the, dude, you're high up. 70 feet long, beast mode. Uh, the best reference I can get you is probably this thing, Slick 6. Slick 6 was a shuttle's pad, so building on terra firma, or more firm ground, which this is building into the side of a hill, or a mountain, it's all solid. Uh, that's probably what you'd end up getting, something like that. Yeah, I mean, even this thing. Even this thing that doesn't have a crawler transport. I mean, look at all the concrete, dudes. Look at how thick you could, I mean, not thick. You can't really tell how thick it is from looking at it from the top, but you can clearly see that this was designed for heavy, heavy stuff. Uh, like the, it, it, it looks like, I mean, look at all, look, I mean, look at all the concrete. The thing, there's freaking concrete slabs everywhere. You wouldn't even be able to tell where this is if I just put, if I just had the camera like this. You can, there's no grass, there's no trees, there's nothing. Look at all the damn concrete. That's how that that should give you a good hint how heavy this thing is. I mean rockets rockets are heavy, man, especially rockets with solid rocket boosters. Those SRBs are heavy. You have to transport them with the fuel in them, remember? Heavy. Can't can't load up fuel at the launch site. Yeah. One of the cool fun facts about 39 is that they they ended up building the extension and grading the terrain for the extension for 39C. Now, personally, so like all the all the infrastructure is there for 39C. They even ran all the wiring and and stuff, all the wiring and the plumbing for 39C for a third pad if they needed if they needed to build it. Uh, <clears throat> which is really freaking cool. Uh, and personally, I think NASA should. I think they should build another one. They should build another pad up here, 39C, and they should build it for Starship. All right, drummer. Have a good night. Yeah, exactly, Sarnard. It's probably heavy stuff. Do you think that's where SpaceX might do? What SpaceX might do? Firework? I have a, yeah, I mean, yeah, I do. Uh, the space fan is kind of, you know, me wanting to see Starship use 39A is kind of clouding my judgment a little bit on there. I'll admit it. But NASA has slated this area for commercial users to build a commercial launch complex. And I, I noticed something, okay? So, now, we know from... uh from SpaceX that you you need to run a lot of infrastructure 
You need to run a lot of infrastructure out there for electrical, et cetera, et cetera. See the powerhouse over there? You need to run a lot of electrical infrastructure out to a launch pad. A launch pad is an industrial site and requires insane amounts of electricity, amongst other things. Um, you need electricity, you need plumbing for the sound suppression system. So you basically need industrial demands. Now, I noticed something here. NASA has slated, they've slated over here, basically right where 39C, Apollo's 39C plans were originally supposed to be. They slated pad 30, the, they basically slated where pad 39C is supposed to be is where they want to build new launch pads. It's in the exact same spot. Now, with that being said, I can't, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if SpaceX wants to use those pads. This might be LC-49. Yeah, well, they're not calling it 39C. They're calling it 49, which is dumb. They should call it 39C, but whatever. Now, you know, I'm not sure if SpaceX is going to use these pads. It's kind of implied that they are. But even, even if anyone is going to use these pads, you're going to have to run some pretty heavy infrastructure out there. Unless you're building a pad for like Astra or something where they can move the pad on trucks, in which case you just need an industrial road. If you're launching anything but a small sat launcher, so like, for instance, something like Starship, something like SLS, something like Falcon 9 or something, you're going to, any medium duty, a medium to heavy to super heavy launch vehicle is going to need some industrial power. And I kind of noticed, you know, if, <clears throat> if that's the spot where they want to build it, right, basically right where that blip is, right in line with the other pads, right? Well, I noticed something. Check this out. Look at the distance here. 2.8 miles is the closest heavy power infrastructure. Right there. 2.8 miles to the crawler way. Now, that's the closest heavy power infrastructure in that direction. If you go this way, it's 3.5 miles. The heavy infrastructure from the 39C extension on the crawler way is literally closer. It would it would be less money to build out the rest of the crawler way than it would be to build out the industrial road here. Why? Lesser, di shorter distance. Shorter distance, man. Move less material, move less things over a shorter distance is not going to cost as much. Crazy, right? What's those squiggly roads? Uh, this is a public access or, well, kind of a public access road. Um, first of all, you ain't moving any trucks on that road. That road that goes next to the train tracks is a dirt road. Second of all, this is a garden variety road. It's just an eight inch subgrade. You can just tell by looking at it. You can tell because of the way it is. No, it's if it was a road that was designed to carry something heavier, it would have a retention pond next to it, like here you would have room for discharge and drainage. It's just a regular road. See see this big road, Kennedy Parkway here? It has the discharge next to it. So this thing, this thing can carry heavier payloads. Now, if you go over here and you look at the road that was designed to carry the space shuttle from the runway back to the VAB, that is designed for extremely heavy loads because look at how much, look at how much water, water, look at how much, Ah, look at how much retention ponds that they put on the side. That's how you know it was going to carry something heavy in Florida if you have a lot of water next to it or if it's a heavy building. Um, the VAB, turning basin. See that? They dug a huge pond next to it so all the water goes over here and none of the water goes here. But that doesn't mean that you don't have discharge pipes for an industrial access road. See what I'm talking about? This is all very standard civil engineering, guys. It would literally it would literally cost less money to you know, you have a heavy infrastructure road right here. That road is not not built up. No way. It, it can carry cars and maybe some maybe some like semi trucks every once in a while. It leads to Playa Linda Beach, by the way. Um This road is not it's not built up at all. It's not that's not what it's designed to do. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the beach is where a lot of people watch launches from. That, don't get me wrong. That beach is closed when you launch from 39B. It sometimes is open for 39A, but it's mostly open when you launch when ULA launches from 41 or SpaceX launches from 40 because it's too close. So, trying to build up this road and trying to dig up that road and rebuild it. 
I have a theory that it would literally, that would be more expensive than just expanding the crawler way out to here. It would be more expensive. So you might as well, like, NASA might as well expand the freaking crawler way and then make it so if, you know, somebody wants, somebody else wants to use this pad, if they need to integrate in the VAB, well, now you have, now you have a way to get rockets and launch pads out to a clean pad design. NASA always talks about wanting to build a multi-user spaceport. Well, that's a really good way to do it. One of the mistakes I think they made, and once again, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. One of the mistakes I think they made is, is leasing out 39A to SpaceX and making it so the crawler way is inaccessible. So no one can, nobody else can use the pad but SpaceX. You really want a multi-user spaceport? Uh, you really want a multi-user spaceport and you took one of the best, one of the most historic and useful pieces of heavy launch infrastructure and you made it so only SpaceX can use it. And now don't get me wrong. I don't think that's a bad thing. I'd rather see 39A do things rather than sit abandoned, which is basically what it did from July of 2011 to July of 2015. Yeah, it, for for four years, it was basically abandoned. It, it, it killed me to see it that way. It, it killed me. The pad that we launched Apollo 11 on was abandoned from 2011 to 2015. It was just, that was very annoying. Um, so I think, I don't think that, I think that was a short-sighted thing to do. Honestly, not having two pads for your lunar program, but hey, you know what? It put the thing back to use sooner rather than later. So I'm not gonna also I'm not gonna say that SpaceX actually using the pad to launch rockets is a bad thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and it's gonna launch Starship soon too, which is gonna be pretty sweet. Um, so I think if NASA really wants to do a multi-user spaceport, they should learn from this and build another one of these suckers right here and expand the crawler way. So not only do you have a multi-user spaceport where you can use multiple pads, but also your user, you, you have multi-commercial multi -commercial users that can use the VAB as well. Th see, this will pay dividends for NASA. Why will it pay dividends? Well, if somebody leases out the high bay, that kind of helps uh, pay for the operating cost of this building, which means more money from NASA can be used to build, build and launch rockets rather than paying for the VAB's electrical bill. True story. You can offset the cost of maintenance by having somebody else use the VAB because you ain't using it. You ain't using High Bay 2. No one's used High Bay 2 ever since the VAB was built. We almost stripped it like 39B. Yeah, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Budget constraints really only allow them to maintain the, maintain the pads they already had. If that was the case, why would they want to build more pads, Firework? Do you just shoot from the hip when you say this stuff? or If NASA wanted to build more pads, why would they be curtailed by the pads that they already have in maintenance costs to not build more pads? That doesn't make any sense. VAB is space for four projects. Bingo. So that's my personal theory. And I'll be honest with you, I just want to see a Starship roll out of the VAB. Uh, I'll be honest with you. If it seems flimsy, I don't blame you. But also, you no one here can tell me that they don't want to see Starship roll out of the VAB with the orbital launch tower on a mobile launcher. No one here can say they don't want to see that. <laughs> no way. Uh-uh. You'd be lying. <laughs> I'm looking at it realistically. Would Congress approve the cash to build more pads? They, they literally already have. You're not looking at it realistically. You're guessing. And I, that's something I tell people to not do. Wait a minute. Let me, just, let me just check something here. No, EJ, space is bad. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. What's the distance here in Fedorino's 50 feet? Can you imagine a mobile launcher? Uh, a mobile launcher that SpaceX like is using? That's the middle of the ML right there. So how what's the distance here? So you have uh like here, let me get a good picture. So you have this thing, that thing right there on the ML, and then you have the orbital launch, the orbital launch pad right there. It's about 60 feet, 
to the center point right there. Or you could move it out. It could be it could even be right there. Now, Chad, I'm really wondering what's the difference between the center of the orbital launch tower and this and the middle of, in the center line of super heavy. I wonder if you could fit it on an ML. Because, dude, I mean, listen, all right? I know, once again, this is probably not going to happen. But also, let's think, think about this for a second. The orbital launch towers can build stacks. They don't necessarily need to be inside of the VAB if they were on a mobile launcher. But the VAB is also a hangar to put the mobile launchers inside of. So you could use that to integrate rockets, or you could use that to, oh, I don't know, Maybe work on the orbital launch tower if it somehow gets damaged during launch. Work on it inside. I can't imagine why that would happen. Hmm. Why would Starship's pad get damaged during launch and landing operations? See what I'm talking about? It's not that far-fetched of an idea. If, if they built 39C for SpaceX, SpaceX just build like three or four mobile launchers right? And they could go put Starship out on the pad and say a super heavy comes back down and it misses and it hits the thing and damages it. You lift it off the pad, you put it in the VAB, they fix it, and then you roll the other one to the pad and it puts a Starship, it, it could put a Starship together and launch it. Modular, modular integration towers. See? I still don't think this is going to happen, but also, that's a really good idea. That's not a bad way to do that. Is it? Look, I just want Starship to be built inside of the VAB. And I want to see it roll out of the VAB like a Saturn V, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. I may have convinced myself that this is possible, all right? It's probably not going to happen. But also, at the same time, please make that happen. The mobile launcher in the tower pick up Super Heavy. It swings over, drops it onto the table. That's on the launch pad, off to the side. Yeah, there you go. It's doable, goalie. It's a smart idea. That dude, and that could work. And firework, if they have, like you were talking about, oh, budget constraints. Well, if NASA, if somebody pays NASA to use their facilities, then the maintenance cost is offset. So now NASA has more budget so they can build more pads. See what I'm talking about, man? Yo, let's call Elon. Yo, Elon, yo. Hey, yo, build, a, build an ML. For the crawler transporter. NASA has a spare, just saying. Ah, uh, yes, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. I find it hard to believe that using the VAB involving NASA would make things cheaper and faster. No, no, not involving NASA, as master Okay, so two things. First of all, NASA's already involved with Starship. They're involved with building the lander. And if you think that the HLS is going to launch anywhere but KSC, you're out of your mind. Second of all, second of all, now you know if now it's not it's not NASA getting involved. Discovery. It's no, it's SpaceX like using NASA's facilities, which is something they already do. Yeah, a good they do a good deal of that uh, with the with the other pad at 39, 39A. Remember that part? They already do that. So why not just do it some more? Yeah, I know, Creation, we're gonna get a foot of snow. How cool would it be to see a mobile launcher orbital launch tower with chopsticks on an ML? And dude, it's doable. I'm telling you, that is totally doable. That way NASA doesn't pay for the unused high base and SLS becomes a bit cheaper. 
SLS becomes cheaper, which means they can work on building other things for SLS, like Mars transfer vehicles or something. Why do you think NASA has such a is Na why do you think NASA is trying to push Kennedy Space Center as a multi-user space spaceport so they can offset the cost of so they can bi curtail basically some of the cost of their big space flight program so they can use it to make better stuff for their big space flight programs. That's the, that's the reason why they want the spaceport to be multi-user so they don't have to pay for all the maintenance bill by themselves. Cough SpaceX prototype designs for the oil rigs on mobile launch pads. It kind of fits Lumpod, doesn't it? Hey, Vulcan, what's up? 27 months to go. Also, Artemis 3 LH2 tank was shown out and about. Yep, yep. You're getting ready to you're getting ready to put it together, dude. When will we see the Starship test do, I think? Um, April. Tyron, April. At the very... April at the very... Um, at the very least. Net, net net April, basically. Oh, that's such a fair point. Leasing a high bay or two and other parts of KSC will really cut a chunk out of the EGS cost. Bingo. Why do you, Ian, why do you think they're pushing multi-user spaceport? They're pushing multi-user spaceport so they don't have to pay for the whole maintenance bill for the Complex 39. And look, they're already working on, they're already working with SpaceX on HLS. You might as well, I mean, building them a pad is not that big of a deal. Seriously. Build it, build another pad, have SpaceX start throwing together some mobile launchers, and then maybe you can bulk buy the mobile launchers. Two mobile launchers for Starship and uh, another one for SLS Block 1B. Th this is where I need NASA to be, man. I need NASA to be on this level of crazy. That's the cool kind of crazy. That Dude, that would make, that would be awesome. And it's, it, the crazy part about this, Ian, is that it's doable. That is totally doable. Th that is not, that is not an unreasonable thing to do. That's, that's something that, that absolutely can be done. It can be done. It is with, well within the confines of, of being able to get done within NASA's budget flexibility. And it would be awesome. It would be awesome. It would be freaking awesome. That would be cool, man. You know, sometimes, sometimes it's not just all about function, dude. Sometimes with space flight, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta show off a little bit, okay? Just, just a little bit. I mean, SpaceX, SpaceX does it right. They, did they need to put lights on the orbital launch tower? No, but they did because it's freaking cool. All right? Did they have to put zoomer lights on the side of it? No, but they did. You got you to have a little bit of flair, just a little bit. Like, we can all sit here and say that, it, you know, the Saturn, oh, the Saturn V was aesthetic, you know, like it was, it was entirely purpose-built. The thing is aesthetic as hell, man. It looks great. Saturn V on the mobile launcher with the red tower and stuff, it looks amazing. All right, it looks amazing. It frankly looks way better than the gray mobile launchers. There, I said it. Zoomer lights. You know exactly what I'm talking about, 95. Also, spotted some big hardware coming down 995 today. It was notably large, silver, and aerodynamically shaped. Hmm. Huh. I said it before, I'll say it again. Red launch pads are the best. Agreed. Me and my brother were, was looking up at the sky the other night and saw a few white lights that looked like stars, but moving too slow to be shooting stars, but too fast to be a plane. Did we see satellites? Yes. White paint plus American flag. Yes. Yeah, you get it. New Roberts Road pictures from Greg Scott. I'll have to go check those out. Yeah, in the right lighting conditions, Jack, you can see, yeah, in the right lighting conditions with low light pollution, right at dusk, you'll see, dude, it'll look ridiculous. You, all of a sudden, the sun will go down and you'll just see satellites everywhere. And then the sun will go too far over the horizon and the, the earth will eclipse them and then they'll go away. That's why people, dude, Jack, why do you think people are like, oh, I saw, I saw something move across the sky and then it stopped and moved back and then it disappeared. They literally saw, they literally saw light reflecting off of a satellite. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I remember watching UFO shows. Like, I do that from time to time because they're hilarious, man. They're so goddamn funny. Like, people are like, oh, the satellite went up and it did a... Or the, the UFO went up, it did a loop, and then it went back down. I'm like, you literally saw something in a highly inclined orbit. <laughs> highly inclined ex eccentric orbit. Because with the eccentric orbit, if it hits apogee where you're, you know, up where you're looking, the satellite's going to come up over the horizon. It's going to appear to stop, and then it's going to go back down. 
an inclined eccentric orbit looks like that, like a, a Molino orbit. <laughs> it's really funny because people, people see them and they're like, oh my god, it's a UFO. No, it's just, just a satellite. It's just a satellite. Hey, Page Up, what's up, man? Yeah, oh, there's the tanks, baby. Yeah, baby. These tanks are what I've been waiting for. That's what it's all about. Rocket fuel. Yeah, it's an it's unidentified to them. You know what? That's a good point. Yo, there's a CBP truck there. Look at the white the white F-150. It's a CBP truck. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we are near the border, so it doesn't make sense. Yeah. My stream crashed. I'm missing tanks. How do you know you're missing tanks if you can't see the stream? Oh, that's really cool, John. Elvete, <laughs> Satana, helvete, satana. Those are methane tanks right there, yeah. I know that truck. I know this music. Let's change the beat. That is a sweet freaking truck. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's how you know whatever you're towing is heavy when the counterweight, when you need to put a counterweight on the back of your truck just to get the wheels to dig, to, to get traction. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean, Thomas. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that one. Oh, that's so cool. Trailer SPMT. That's really neat. Hmm. Hmm. Sheriff, I like the sheriff, the sheriff Tahoe. Yeah. So, so all five of the tanks should be in position. What a great idea, Penta, right? Yeah, it's great. I mean, look at the look at the tanks compared to the compared to the Dodge. That's a big tank, man. Peterbilt. Yep. Back onto the barge you go. Yeah. Freaking that thing. <laughs> okay. It's an SPMT trailer. Yeah, I got you. I'll check the photos in. Ooh. Oh boy. I'll check the photos in a second, Thomas. Yeah, it's a tracking antenna. SpaceX lifted those those tracking antennas from the Cape, believe it or not. They were extra tracking arrays. They're, they, it's for, that's what a ground station looks like, dudes. They were extra traffic tracking arrays that the Air Force didn't need, and SpaceX was like, I'll take those. Thank you very much. And they moved them out here on a barge. Each one of them axles is good for 50,000 pounds. Hell yeah. Yeah, Killer, I'm with you on that one. They're really cool. Dude, look at how, look at the nose cone with the dudes next to it, man. Oh, telescoping crawler crane. Very nice.
That's correct, man. Yeah. The vertical tanks are no good. They don't meet they don't meet LNG storage uh, specifications for uh, Texas LNG storage specifications, amongst other things. Tesla. A little windy. How many Raptors to turn the tank into a stage? Uh, about 350. Uh, I don't know, John. Uh, the, the honest answer is when I feel like it, dude. It's pretty cool. Yeah, John, I, I just don't want to force the issue. Dodge. Yeah, they're putting up another 11,000. Interesting. We haven't seen the base of the crane come in yet. We've just seen crane segments. I'm going to go ahead and guess that these they're going to use two 11,000s or modify the 11,000 that's already there for a, a different configuration to be able to put the gantry cranes in for the wide bay. Some more water tanks or lock storage? Methane storage, Alex. They're putting Derek and Wagon on the one that's already there. Yeah, they're gonna, yeah. I, I think they're gonna modify the one that's there already. You don't necessarily need two cranes for a lift like this. Just realized this, but why don't we see more cranes and such that have mechanum wheels? Um, not the right use of what a mechanum wheel can do. The treads can disperse the load better. See, crack it. It probably has to do with loads. I don't. I don't think mechanum can take heavy loads, but I could be wrong. I don't think you could. They can be used for heavy stuff like like tank treads could, or not tank treads, just treads. 15, 22, and 16. There they are. Can all right, all right, fellas. Does anybody else? Does anybody else want them to rotate SN15 120 degrees so they're all facing the same direction? Does Does anybody else look at that picture and be like, why is that one? Why is 15 facing the wrong way? Can we like write a letter to SpaceX to tell them to just turn 15 to in the right direction? One of those will be moving to the Brownsville Airport. That's right. Not sure if this is worth space news, but it probably is. Ground-based radar system designed to continuously detect, track, and maintain custody of deep space. Cool. Northrop Grumman awarded a three hundred or Northrop Grumman was awarded a three hundred forty-one million dollar contract for the Space Force for space situational awareness. Cool. Nice. That's neat. Yeah, yeah. Front side and rear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Anyway, let's check out these pictures from the Cape that were taken by Greg Scott. Let's see what we got here. Let's see what we got from Greg Scott. I'm sorry, I won't do that again. So Greg Scott, here's some helicopter shots I took of the Roberts Road facility. All right, let's see. Yeah, see? I wonder what that thing is for. I We know what these ones are for. Those guys are for building the tower segments. That's what these squares in the ground are for. I'm still trying to figure out what that thing is. You gotta give a warning before flashing a Saturn V stack. Yeah, that's my bad. Yeah, that was my bad. Sorry. It was with fixed service structure. Even better. I, I also want to note that the... These two cranes, see that that telescoping telescoping uh, boom uh, crawler crane, and then this small lattice crawler crane right there. I just want to point out uh, that's so those pictures are in Florida, right? And we quite quite literally saw the exact same model of that crane right there, and right there. See this one in the background, and that one right there. Those two cranes are are at. Boca Chica. Those two same types of cranes. They're not the same exact cranes. 
Those two types of cranes are, are there at Boca already. And in Greg's picture here, you see the exact same model of the, of two, of the same two cranes. Interesting, huh? Also, I want that deuce and a half right there. I'm not going to lie to you. There is a... There is an army surplus <clears throat> two and a half ton truck right there, and I want it. Yep. Yeah, I see the deuce. Yeah, I want, I want, I want that. I want, I want that. Yeah, that's, see that truck? That's a cool truck. I like that truck. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those are cool. All right, anyway, let's look at these other pictures. Why is there a disc plow on that tractor? Oh, I don't know. I don't... Let me see. What are you talking about? A disc plow on the tractor. I think that's a bulldozer. Killer fun, unless I'm stupid. In the middle of the squares... Oh, he's grading the terrain. Yeah, that's a road grader. I think. Maybe? No. Wait, no, you wouldn't do that. That's uh, You'd use the road grader. Where's where's the where's the grader? Well, there's the dirt truck. What happened to the bulldozer's tracks? <laughs> I don't you know what? What's this there? I don't know. I don't know what's going on right here. Yeah, maybe they use that to clear brush or something. Dude, I don't know. That looks like farming equipment to me. I, 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 Dude, and I don't know farming equipment. I know that's a tractor. But I don't know what the heck's going on here. It's a disc plow. What is it used for? It's a disker. What is the, what is it? It's to dry the dirt? How many tower sections were they building in parallel in Texas? Two, Bill, I think. And actually, Bill, you know what? That's a really good thing to point out. I'm going to go ahead and guess that, you know, they have one there. So they have one set there, one set there, one set there, one set there. Multiple launch pads. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do parallel construction like this if you weren't building more than one. Am I right? That's actually a really good point. That's a really good thing to point out. They have multiple sets of these things. So we know that four of them comprise one, right? So that's one segment, two segment, three segment, four segments over there. Multiple launch pads. You wouldn't, you wouldn't build all this concrete if you were just going to build one launch pad. And I, I, when I say multiple launch pads, I mean like three or four of these things. Like, think about it. Oil rigs, the two oil rigs, 39A, and we know that SpaceX and NASA have been talking about building that other pad, that 39C-ish pad that, I'm, that I keep referring to. How many segments is that? What are all the squares for? These are the jigs that they build the tower segments on, S-Master. Breaking up the ground to make it easier to use. Now we see why Elon wants to buy a crawler. Wait, Elon wants to buy a crawler? What? Wait. Don't do that. Don't do that to me. You are you kidding? You better be you better be kidding. Don't play games like that, man. Don't Don't do that. You better not be screwing with me, Tommy, cuz you know I'm not a guy to be screwed with. That was my money, Tommy. My money. Tommy Vassetti. <laughs> Thought they'd never let him out. Can't be walking around Liberty City. It'll be bad for business. So, what are we gonna do, Sonny? Vice City. 24 karat gold. The Colombians, the Mexican. Heck, even... Even... I don't know who he says after that. Rarest. Okay, what's that? Rarest. Okay. Hi, by the way. It's been a while. Elon confirms mysterious crane. Oh, no, that's the crane that's at the Boca Chica launch site, dude. 
Yeah, that's pieces of a lever 11,000. It looks, it's a crawler crane though, so. Elon has wanted to buy a crawler for probably seven to eight months now. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me that, man. Please, 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 space gods, if you listening, help, help. <laughs> um, doesn't Elon have several crawlers already? No, 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 cerebral. No, 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 no. We're not talking about crawler cranes. We're talking about the other NASA crawler. That thing. The other one is sitting there doing nothing. There's two of these. There's twins. The other one's not being used. CT2 is CT2 was restored and CT1 is just sitting there. Boca had four segment construction as well. Oh. It did? Oh, okay. Never mind then what I said about multiple pads. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see it. I see it. I see it. It looks like they started with these and said, no, it would be better to do it this way. Like, this is the Mark 1 stand building area. That's the Mark 2. Yeah, okay, cool. Never mind then. No, build when I say buy. Imagine NASA says no and he builds a third mobile pad just for fun. Oh, what's so goalie? Wait. So, Goli, wait, what do you mean no build, not buy? Wait, what does that mean? Does that mean that he wants to build another crawler transporter? Like, okay, all right, all right. When you say he wants to build another crawler, are you talking about something... Are we talking about something that can be used at 39A? You're, you're talking about the thing that crushes the rocks, that, that moves rockets around, right? This is what, this thing, that's what we're talking about, right? He wants to build one. Please, please. I know we have to confirm sources, and I know we have to confirm sources, and this is literally, there's, this isn't a concrete source at all. Just say, you know, like, Goli, I believe you, but also... I need an official source before I want to tell. I want to go around telling people that. But also at the same time, <sighs> that would be really cool. That would be that would be pretty neat. I'll tell you, that would be that would be pretty neat. Yep. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, chat. Hold on a second here. Take a look. Oh, what's going on over here? Grading out a road. It seems like a pretty typical radius on the road. So see, 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 I'm looking at the, the armpit of the road right there, and I'm comparing it to this one. Why? Why am I doing that? Well, you see, you see the concrete right there and how there's a wide radius on the, on the turn that goes into the hangar here. The radius of the road is a pretty good indicator of what's going to be moving on that road. That's one of the indicators that you can look and see, uh, to see like what SpaceX might be moving on this. Now, the reason why this has a big radius is because Falcon 9s come in here and that's Falcon 9's processing hangar. That's where the first stages go when they go check them out and they get them ready for another launch and then they send them back to the launch pads in here. However, Falcon, Falcon 9 is transported horizontally. Starship is not. Starship is transported vertically. So you might not need as big of a radius, but they are paving out that road. And we do know that whatever they're putting here is a heavy lift, is a heavy loading dock. See the concrete slab that's sticking out of this side of the building, the far side? Heavy loading dock. Now that I do know about. I worked, I worked in a shipping, um, I worked on a loading dock that moved heavy, heavy stuff around. 
for a number of years. It was the last thing I did before I streamed, before I went full-time streaming. So I know a heavy loading dock when I see something, when I see one. So that means that semis are going to come in here. So this means that th we know that that road is heavy. It's designed to carry heavy trucks like that dump truck right there and that dump truck right there. I'm not sure about this one, but then again, that road is kind of weird because it's three lanes wide, just like that road right there. Three segments of asphalt. You wouldn't make a road three segments of asphalt if you wanted the road to be crowned correctly. Now, what does that mean? Well, usually they pave one side of the road and then they pave the other side of the road. Why would you do that? Because when they pave one side, they tilt it a little bit. And when they pave the other side, they tilt it this way as well. Why do you do that? Drainage. So water gets off of the road and goes into, well, in Florida, it goes into the pond or a discharge pipe like that. This one is three lanes wide and it's not crowned. interesting also they graded they looks like they made up they graded this out and put a parking lot there or something i'm gonna i'm gonna be really curious what they do here guys i'll, I'll be honest with you if they if they do something like three things of asphalt they do it right there i mean they do they do a, basically a heavy heavy road across this pond right here that means that starships are probably going to use it no need for drainage. They have skid steers to scoop up the rainwater. <laughs> Underrated comment. Yeah, and it looks like that road has is going to have a pretty wide berth right there. Huh. Damn. Look at these pictures from Greg Scott, man. Holy crap. See what I'm talking about? The wide radius right there for the Falcon 9 transporter. It's ri literally right there. There's the Falcon 9 transport truck. The Cometo. Shuttle transporter. The radius of the road is a dead giveaway. And also, the road's concrete because it's designed to carry heavy stuff like, like rockets. That building seems close to the road. Yeah. Dude, they already have the retention pond almost dug out completely, Goal. You see that? And you see right here, they're also burning off all the brush. And then you, right there, you have pre-existing drainage. Well, it's probably a stream, let's be real. Yeah, they'll probably put down concrete here uh, for, for drainage purposes. For drainage purposes. There's the jigs, and then there's that circle disc right there. I don't know what that thing is used for. But look, guys, they, the other thing is, is that they almost have the factory footprint graded out, which is just absurd. That this is moving at an insanely fast rate. I think the round thing you saw was for tank shells. Yeah, Liam, that's probably right. What about the gators? Gators like to stay in the pond. Gators like to stay in the pond. If you don't bother them, they won't bother you. Source, lived in Florida for two years. Do not go near them. Don't piss them off. They will bite you, and it will hurt. Don't go near them. Drainage dolphins. You think this factory will be more clean room style? I think this factory goalie is going to look like Michoud. It's going to look like the Michoud assembly. That's SLS's factory right there. That's what it's going to look like. I'm almost positive. But they want scratches under their chin. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to look like this with like a, hot, a wide bay attached to it. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. We're seeing another Michoud getting made down the street from the VAB. And yeah, once again, these pictures from Greg are amazing. Very, 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 very cool pictures. And that's not all. There's, there's more of them. He has another set. These are of 39A. Let's see what they're doing here. You ever been bitten by a gator? No, because I avoided them and I didn't go near them, which is what you should do. I wonder if they're using personnel from Tesla building projects. Maybe. Lots of large footprint factory building experience. It's possible. I mean, build, I don't think it would be that far-fetched to say that we're seeing a Starship Gigafactory being made right here. 
would anybody would would anybody argue that sentiment? I th th I think we're literally seeing a Starship Gigafactory. Nice tanks in that thirty nine AP. Hey, nice tank. Where is this at? Roberts Road, KSC, S Master. The VAB is right over there. This is on Kennedy Parkway, man. I've seen the plans for this, dude. There's going to be two wide bays right here. There's going to be one there, and there's going to be one right here. And they're going to be on either side of this drainage ditch. And then the main factory floor is going to be right there. And I've, like I said, we've seen the plans. The, the factory is as big as Michoud almost. It's pretty damn close. That is a big freaking... Yeah, maybe not as big as Michoud, but yeah. Yep. And the reason why I'm like obsessing over the road grades and stuff is because we know this is for Starship, but I'm trying to figure out... I'm trying to figure out what the pipeline is. So we know that factory is for Starship, but what is it going to be doing? Is it going to be making Raptors? Is it going to be making stainless steel rings? Is it going to be making control surfaces? Is it going to be making bulkheads? And if so, are they going to be assembled there? Uh, is this a Starship assembly facility? Or is this just a subcomponent and they're going to assemble them somewhere else? See what, I'm, see, what, see what I'm getting at? I'm trying to figure out the pipeline. Like, we know that this is Starships, This is a Starship facility, and we know that they're building a 39A. I'm trying to visualize what that's going to look like. So the reason how I, the reason what, well, so like what I look for is road grades. We know that Starship is heavy. It needs that SBMT to move around. And we know it's heavy. It can't be driven on a regular road or else it'll sink into the ground, especially in Florida. That's the reason why the crawler transporter exists for the Saturn V SLS and the shuttle, right? So what is this facility going to do? Are they going to fully assemble a starship there? There, If they do, you're going to need somewhat of a heavy road because I would assume that there's going to be a starship being rolled out of this more often than not, right? So we know... That that road over there on the left, S, take a look. This one, see how it's three lanes? That road has a uh, more than a foot subgrade, meaning it's designed for industrial traffic. Now, the roll-up area to the hangar where they put Falcon 9s, that's all made out of concrete. It's made out of concrete because it's designed to have heavy stuff parked on it. So industrial roads and industrial infrastructure is really easy to spot. Uh, and I think we can, we can make sense out of that, right, from what we're looking at with the construction, and we can literally figure out the pipeline. Because if they have a gigantic heavy road that goes right to the factory, well, that'll tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> that'll tell you that, yeah, most likely you're going to see starships built and fully assembled here, and then they're going to roll to 39A on a self-propelled transporter, right? Just like they roll from Boca Chica to the launch site, which is a couple miles away. 39A is a couple miles away from here. Well, more than a couple. It's like five, but whatever. Uh, but see, see what I'm talking about? This road right here is three segments of asphalt. Two is just a regular road. Two would be like this. That's just two. See? That one is three. Like this road. So if we see a heavy road being built here, and then that road goes in here, well, that tells you everything you need to know. That tells you, yeah, this is going to build fully assembled starships. Now, and probably super heavies as well. I think the first few super heavies will come from Boca. Yeah, most likely. My guess hope is that building the three to four barrel ring stacks there and then moving them to high bay two for final stacking. Well, Ian Goley was just telling us that Elon's looking to build or buy a crawler transporter. So, I mean, I don't know. Take that for what it's worth. That might be wrong. That might, you know, I don't know. Maybe, and you know, SpaceX changes their plan. So that actually might be right information. And, you know, SpaceX changes their mind about things, you know, or Elon changes his mind about things. So, I mean, stacking starships inside of the VAB is kind of my pipe dream. But, you know, a uh, three-lane road right there, like this one, that road doesn't need to be three lanes. It's three lanes because it needs to carry something heavy on it, not because you need a three-lane road. And you see another three-lane road being built right next to it. 
a road pretty much of equal width, right? So that tells me that we might see a full starship here. The uh, full starships being rolled out, but I don't know. I, I got to wait and see for where they pave this road too. Because if that road stops right here, then yeah, you, well, you know that that's not going to be the what's going on. But if they take this and they pave it around and they make the road stop here, the heavy road goes over towards the factory. Well, there you go. Hey, Ishiku. Look at how wide the turn is. Well, that road has a pretty straight up radius on it. The radius is not comparatively to the Falcon 9 radius right there. It's more like a kind of run-of-the-mill road. See that? They have these radius... The radii are there for trucks. Uh, but, yeah, who knows? The new rolled asphalt is over dirt, not reinforced concrete. Yeah, well, this one isn't... This one has a dirt subgrade, too, Mile. I saw the blueprints for it. Yeah, I, we looked in the Florida public record because we're weird. So, I don't know. It could just be a thicker dirt subgrade, dude. But, uh, yeah. I don't know, man. And I know that I know that SpaceX is going to expand this road this way, but the road expansion that way had an 8-inch subgrade on it, meaning just regular traffic. But, yeah, I see what you're saying. But this one doesn't have concrete underneath it either. That one has just a thicker subgrade. So basically the amount of dirt you compact down underneath the road. And Mile, I know you know that. I'm explaining it for everybody else. I, Dude, I even studied the core samples around here. So you have sand on the top, lots of sand, and then you have limestone chunks just underneath the sand. And then there's uh, basically m more sand underneath that. Uh, and there's the interesting thing about the sand is that there's varying colors of sand. You have the lighter sand, and then you could see some of the limestone chunks over there, and then you have the darker sand. I think this dark stuff is could be compost. It could be compost from the brush, but yeah, I know that there's there's a darker sand somewhere in the core samples or, or whatever. Yeah, turning basin smirks. Yeah, there's a clear path to the ocean. Will SpaceX install a methane factory at the pad in Florida? Possibly. And it gets everywhere. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could it be possible that some of these asphalt roads are just quick and temporary to accommodate building everything else first? Yeah, Bill. I mean, but the plans didn't call for a heavy industrial road directly to the factory. There was nothing outstanding, you know what I mean? But there is that. So. But then again, I could be wrong about crowning in three things of asphalt. That could just be kind of the norm. I, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I'm not a civil engineer, you know? Anyway, let's see what's going on with 39A. So Greg took these pictures. Oh, methane tanks. That's ash. It's very common during land clearing. Got your rares. I believe you. How you been, by the way, dude? I, I know I, I I said hi before. I don't. I didn't see if you responded, though. How's things with you, man? This is at KSC Ishiku. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Is the access road going down the crawler way good for a tower segment? Yeah, it's an industrial road, goalie. Yep, yep. I'm okay, thanks. Keep up the good work. Right on, man. All right. Oh, pile driver. Wait, where is that? Where is that picture? Not sure if you covered this yet. Artemis 3. Oh, that's what Vulcan was telling me about. Yeah, yeah, Vulcan Vulcan told me about it, Bandit, yeah. The pile driver is at the factory site. I was going to say. Okay, so... <clears throat> so these are drilling... These are... This thing makes pilings. So basically it takes a big metal rod and forces it into the ground. It pile drives it. What are pilings used for? Pilings are used for big buildings, big heavy buildings. Basically, the pilings go down through that sandy Florida soil. They go down through the watery Florida soil, and they get down to the hard soil. The bedrock is what it's called, like like in Minecraft. Same same idea. The, the piles get down to the bedrock, and the pilings go into the bedrock so the building doesn't move. It's basically an anchor. The pilings are an anchor for the building. 
What kind of pilings? That I don't know. That one, those ones look like metal pilings to me, but I could be wrong because you know there's a bunch of metal right next to it. Firework. See, those are the pilings right there. Or at least I think they are. Now the other thing that this pile driver could be doing is just digging a hole. It could be just digging up dirt. It could have an auger at the end, and they could be just digging up dirt because firework that looks like rebar. And if that looks like rebar, that means they're going to use concrete slurry pilings. So what does that mean? So you dig up, you dig basically a well all the way down to bedrock. Like if you just look down in Minecraft and mine down, same, same idea. Only a machine does it, right? They get to the bedrock, right? And that hole is naturally going to fill up with water because it's Florida. It'll, you'll make a well. So then what they do is they take a concrete truck. Uh, they bring a concrete truck up to this thing. They take the rebar segment. Um, they take this rebar segment here. They sink that into the water. So the rebar, which is just a metal lattice, it's kind of just like a hollow metal circle with, with bars going up and down. Um, they take that, they put that in the hole, they make sure it's touching the bottom of the ground, and then they start pumping concrete in. The concrete sinks and displaces all the water, right? And all the water... You know, as they pour more concrete in Archimedes principle, it pumps the, all the water gets displaced out, and then you have a nice concrete pillar. Isn't that the drill next to the rebar? Well, let's look at Greg's photos closer. Yep. Well, like I said, these look like rebar. If it's rebar, that means they're that means that isn't a pile driver. It's a it's a auger. It's a drill. You can use a pile driver to do that. Instead of just hammering a piling in, it just drills the same, same function. It just drills it out. And then your auger is definitely right there. So yeah, there you go. They're going to use concrete slurry. This is similar to how they made the orbital launch pad, only on a much bigger scale. Yep, concrete lattice, rebar lattice tube. And how much you want to bet, guys, how much you want to bet that this distance right here, if we go look at the core samples, that's the distance to bedrock. How much you want to bet? It's spoiler alert, it is. It's the distance to bedrock. Yeah. So bedrock looks to be about 50, 60, 70 feet down. So, uh, I don't know, uh, what's 70 feet um, in meters? Uh, 30, 30, 30 meters, 25, 26 meter down. The pilings are all along that red hose. That looks like a water pipe to me, dude. But there are pilings. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so honestly, Joseph, I have no idea what the hell that is. I don't know what that thing is for. I'm not sure. Yeah, this is part of the retention pond. I don't know what that does. It, yeah, it looks like a pumper. Rares, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, it looks like a pumper, dude. It's, I mean, it definitely is. It's a diesel motor with a fluid impeller, so it's pumping water somewhere. Or it's pulling water out. Yeah, it looks like it's draining, but here, check this out. Look, so this is, this is geologist stuff. This is kind of the stuff that Rocket Sage deals with. But look, you could see the sedimentary. Uh, you could see the sediment of the ground. So when they take a core sample, they just drill a hole and then they figure out how far different parts, different, different materials are down. You could definitely see the topsoil, the top sand right there. And then you could see the darker sand, like I said. And then you could see the limestone chunks underneath it. See? The white. There it is. And then you got clay underneath that, if I'm remembering the soil samples right. See what I'm talking about? See the layers? It looks like a layered cake. But there they are. There's your topsoil. There's the sandy, the dark sandy dirt. Limestone right there. Limestone chunks. And then clay underneath that. That's exactly what the core samples said, which is really cool. It's cool to see it visualized. I think that's really neat. That makes me actually kind of happy. And also, I know how it, that makes it so I did read the core samples correctly. Yeah, we need Rocket Sage, don't we? <laughs> and then, yeah, the smoke right here, guys, is from them burning off all the brush. But see, there's that heavy loading dock that I was that I was talking about right there. And then, yeah, there's the jigs. Man, this is going very quickly. Guys, 
I'll be honest with you. This is going way faster than Boca Chica. That Roberts Road facility is going very quickly. Yeah, that's very fast, man. I can't believe that. Dude, even even them just moving around dirt, dude. They've done that in like a like two, three weeks, something like that. That's a lot of work for two to three weeks. When did they start? They started the day Elon tweeted that they're going to launch from the Cape. Um, go faster. I don't know when Elon tweeted that. I mean, someone's going to find it. Thomas will probably find it faster than I can. He's probably looking for it right now. I'm just trying to figure out when he said that. Ah, oh, Phil, you got it. Hey, Ken, what's going on, buddy? How you doing? There it is. Thanks, Phil. So, December 3rd. So, that's three... That's less than... December 3rd, January 3rd, February 3rd, March 3rd. Okay, it's about four months of work. So guys, I'll be honest, that's a lot of work for four months, considering. I would expect it... I, I would expect it to Boca is the testing... I would expect it to Boca is the testing ground. This would be a less experiment design and more the finished 1.0 design. Yeah, 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 killer. Yeah, I get you. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. I'm fast as frick, boy. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just so so, man. <laughs> Gee, I wonder what now, man. It's freaking sucks. Not like this, am I right? I'm just trying to keep everybody happy. Yeah, they could be doing better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, look at this shaft. Look at that hardened steel shaft. Yeah, isn't that cool? This is parts of the steering shaft from the F-250. Doesn't that sound nice? Look at this shaft. I'm really giving you the shaft right now. No, I'm not going to report on this stuff anymore. Uh, yeah, no, neither am I, Kim. I'm not doing that. I'm not, dude. I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, what are you kidding? Yeah, no, we ain't doing that. He's a bad mother trucker. Well, I need to get my mind out of the gutter. No, no, Edmanu, you don't. You don't. Now, I'd say today of all days is a good time to keep your mind in the gutter because that means you don't need to acknowledge what's happening in the world. Am I right? Am I right or am I right? Ah, oh, you're right. And when you're right, you're right. And you, you're always right. What did I just join into? Don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, killer fun. Yeah, for sure. What? <laughs> Facts. The gutter plus space. That We will put our minds into the space gutter. But one day you have to wake up and face the truth. Ah, firework, it's 2022. The hell you do. You can make your own damn world, remember? It's 2022. You can do whatever the frick you want. I, I, you know what? It's my own world. I can do what I want. I believe that SpaceX is going to use the VAB to build starships. Boom. There it is. It's 2022. I can think what I want. <laughs> Golly. My mind was in the gutter yesterday. It was your birthday. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Karmas, but uh, all right. I hope you had fun on your birthday. Blue Origin tried the space gutter and got mocked for it. <laughs> uh, all right, it took a second. <laughs> it, took, it, took a se <laughs> it took a second. 
Since it rains methane on Titan, would future sediments, settlement buildings there need cryoproofed gutters? No, you just need a winter coat. It needs to be really freaking cold for methane to exist as a liquid at atmospheric pressure. Yeah, you just need... It's going to get a little cold. My mind was in the gutter, but I managed to move it into the street instead. Streets can have gutters too, racist. What the hell's the matter with you? Don't be insensitive in here. Not like that. Maybe some beam? <laughs> I don't know, man. Discovery, go at throttle up. We don't take too kindly to intolerant types around here, fool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> You won't leave until he makes the sale. Nice. Diaz, what's up, man? Thank you for the entertainment. Yeah, yeah, I got you, man. I got you. Oh, boy. I think we got all of it. I think that's everything. See, last pretty please, kind sir. Sure, man. What's up? Speaking of space, I have something to ask you. If you ever built this in Lockheed, the lock, uh, built this in KSP, the Lockheed flatbed. I've never built it in KSP, Shadow Man, but I could build it in KSP. But also, it wouldn't work very well. The reason why is that because there's no fluid dynamics. So that the Lockheed flatbed works because the, the nose of the plane pushes the air out of the way and you have low pressure behind that and that's why you could just keep the trucks open. So the Lockheed flatbed is exactly what you think. Picture, picture an airplane in your mind with no fuselage. There's just fuselage at the front for the cockpit and then there's literally a flatbed with some wings attached to it. Like, think a convertible convertible C5. Yeah, that's what the Lockheed flatbed idea was. You, I can do that in KSP. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I can do it. It just won't fly like the real one because in real life, the trucks, the nose cone of the plane is pushing the air out of the way so whatever, like a tank or a truck, whatever's on the back is not causing a lot of drag. Uh, yeah, you can't do that in KSP. These will make you laugh. It's a test vehicle for truck tires. What the hell did the... What, what did they do to that poor DS? Why... What did you do? What... What did you do to that poor Citron? Oh yeah, do it in a minute. It's for testing truck tires at high speed. Chad, is this cool or not? I can't tell. It wasn't me this time. Is this cool or not? I, I, I can't tell. <laughs> no, no, James, no. This is so not right. I, I can't tell if the, I can't tell if that's cool or not. It's French, so no. <laughs> Damn. Damn. Is this a hearse? No, Derek, it's for testing truck tires. See, they got the truck tire in the center, and you probably get this thing up to speed, and then the truck tire, yeah. So they can look at the tire up close while they're testing it. I mean, a camera and a, a truck would probably solve this same problem. But also, I mean, that's pretty neat. It's actually pretty cool. Okay. KSP flatbed with a Saturn V on the back. Jeez. Oh, well, it 
mana. That's good. Oh boy. I want to see it. Want to see the thing moving? Discovery. Go and throttle up. If the truck comes apart, does the driver survive? I mean, I don't. Bill, I don't know about you. I really don't want to have a truck tire delaminate inside of a car while the car is going down the road. I'll tell you, that's something I don't want. Yeah. No. I, I you know, that sounds fun, but no. No. No, I don't no, I don't want that. I yeah. Are you still planning on covering No. No, S. No. Absolutely not. No way. <laughs> no. Nah. Dude, no. Absolutely not. No. No way. <laughs> no, we're good. Yeah, I hope there's some steel plating in there, right, Chop? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, are you kidding this? Yeah, no, we're not doing that. Video of the thing. Okay. All right, let's look at video of the thing. Après deux années d'études et une année de réalisation, naquit ce véhicule. Pour son époque, sa conception était révolutionnaire. Et aujourd'hui encore, on peut se demander si ce n'est pas le fruit de l'imagination d'un génie mécanicien amoureux de la seule mécanique, plutôt qu'un moyen étudié pour la stricte... What the frick is this? What is... Dude, is that cool or not? I can't tell. I'm like, I'm torn. I can't really decide whether that's really cool or really stupid. Look at it. I'm not touching that today, dude. I have no idea. If the back was a flatbed, it'd be cool. All right. It's coolant. Indeed. It's got two motors right in the rear. Okay, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. It's ridiculous, but it's also cool. Durant plusieurs années, oh God, le seul moyen d'essai pour tester dans des conditions réelles de roulage routier, un pneumatique pour poids lourd à des vitesses élevées et soutenues. <laughs> Toutes les parties constitutives sont directement issues. Dude, that thing is booking, man. Look at this. She's going fast. That's a lot of mass to move that quick, man. Very aerodynamic. I mean, 110 for that big of a vehicle is... That's fast, Shadow. I don't know, it doesn't seem like it, but... I mean, it looks like it's using parts of a Citroen DS. So you guys want to see? You guys want to realize how big this thing is? Look, there's the A pillars from the Citroen. So that's how wide a normal car is. See that? This thing is quite literally as big as a semi truck. And I, I don't know about you. When's the last time you saw a semi truck go 110 miles an hour? That's 170, 175, 180 kph. It's pretty fast for a semi truck. She dick. A vérin permet d'appliquer une charge de 2000 à 3250 kilos à la roue centrale sur laquelle est monté le pneu à tester. What the frick? Yeah. On a eu recours à deux moteurs Chevrolet 350. I want to make a wide joke, but also I don't want to make a wide joke. Huit cylindres placés à l'arrière. Le droit pour les trois trains arrière et le gauche pour la roue centrale. What V8s are those? Can somebody can somebody translate French? Il permet d'appliquer une charge de 2000 à 3250 kilos à la roue centrale sur laquelle est monté le pneu à tester. Pour propulser 9 tonnes à 170 km h on a eu recours à deux moteurs Chevrolet 350, 8 cylindres placés à l'arrière. No way! Those are big block Chevys! I heard the right words! Those are big block Chevys!
Oh man, no wonder this thing screams. Two Chevrolet ten cylinders? Yeah, uh, Ian, yeah, that, no, that's right, that's right. Just the fact that it's road legal is impressive. Those are yeah, no, I heard the I heard the right words. Listen again. De 2000 à 3250 kilos à la roue centrale sur laquelle est monté le pneu à tester. Pour propulser 9 tonnes à 170 km h on a eu recours à deux moteurs Chevrolet 350, 8 cylindres placés à l'arrière. Le... I know those words. <laughs> I know those words. All right, let's see the drive article. Let me take a look. Let's see. It's like they put a SR71 start cart in the back of this car. That's exactly what they did. Okay. Ten tons, seven hundred horsepower, eleven tires actually touching the ground. All right, let me. Where's the Where's the part about the engine? At the rear of the vehicle, you could peer into one of its three hatch-mounted rear windows to see not one but two five-point-seven small-block V8s from the C3 Corvette. Each engine produced three hundred fifty horsepower, so about seven hundred ponies total. Well, five-point-seven is a three fifty. That's not. That's a small block. That's not a big block. Here. I'll be able to tell you from these pictures. Yep, those are 350s. Yeah, those are Chevy 350s. The, uh, I could, those are actually early Chevy 350s. So these actually, well, they said 5.7. So this is like, <sighs> Chevy knowledge. Uh, what is it? 66, 67? Because look at the, the exhaust manifold. It's got the, um, the, the wavy exhaust manifolds. Yeah. Yeah, look at the two big radiators in front of them. One is driving three axles and the other one is driving a big wheel. Yeah, the ram horn. Yeah, that's what it's called, Hellfish. Yeah, those are early small block Chevy exhaust manifolds. Those are really early small block Chevy exhaust manifolds. They they didn't have the ram the ram horns were from the the mid to late 60s and then they switched to a kind of um, they switched it to kind of something that goes down and under like that. Yeah, car ramrod. Car ramrod, get it? That's really cool. Interesting interesting thing there. If we put 900 horsepower in this, could we get it to 150 miles an hour? Yeah, probably. Sent you something neat. Ooh. Give me one second. Not space news, but I found something interesting. I wonder what the heck is this? They're actually some of the best manifolds that Chevy made, I believe you. Mutter, what do we got here? Weight and robustness is everything when it comes to flight. What is this? So, Flowcopter. That's a... Yep. Yeah, that's what I thought that was. That is a hydraulic drone using hydraulic motors. Closed loop hydraulic motors. Oh, Mutter, I get it. It's using closed loop hydraulic motors because guess what? It takes a lot less electricity to keep that hydraulic pump going than it does to keep four electric motors going. Ah, that's actually really neat. All right, let's check it.
That is the strangest sound I've ever heard coming from something that flies. That is the strangest sound I've ever heard. That's a hy that's a hydraulic drone. It's so angry. Is this American? I, I don't know. Oh, that's... That's... What the frick? I can't believe this actually works, Mutter. Bro, you want to make a flying car, there you go. What? What is... Wait. It's got a Rotax engine in it? Yo, this thing is huge! Oh, d yo, that's a Connex right there. Oh my goodness. Yo, this thing's the size of a smart car. No! No, never mind. I was about to say, never mind a flying car. Dude, this doesn't even use an electric motor. It has a it has a it has an internal combustion engine that's moving to a hydraulic pump. And that hydraulic pump with a pressure flow regulator can regulate the RPM on the four blades. With, with electromechanical control. Yo, that's really freaking cool, man. Mutter, that's sick. And beca because it's, because, yeah. because it's using an internal combustion engine, it can go forever. Yeah, see? Yeah. Well. Well then. Ah, yes, I can see some magical snails down there. Chat, you see the magical snail? You see this? Bill, do you see the magical snail? Ah, <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. Also, the company is from Scotland. Right? Fly around, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty nice. Well, that boy ain't right. I tell you what, boy. No, 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 no. Not having a strong. Just doing an impression of a Scotsman. Purple burglar alarm. Purple purple burglar alarm. <laughs> Ever show the Lands Bulldog? Ten liter single ten liter single cylinder two stroke tractor can idle at zero RPM. <laughs> no Al Desert, but that's cool. I'm gonna let drone man. Ah no, Steve, uh, I'm not talking about any Roscosmos news. For a long time. Yeah, yeah, we're not doing yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're not doing that. Give me one second, guys. Give me one second, dudes. Gotta answer this. <laughs> uh, yeah, engine Uber. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we're not doing that no more. You know how I don't talk about the Chinese space program either. Yeah, didn't really want to do that, but uh, 
Yeah, here, look at this hydraulic drone again. That's really cool. Here, the noise, though. <laughs> it's got a drive shaft going through it. See that? Look at the drive shaft. <laughs> Yo, that thing is awesome. Oh, yeah, Swiss Channel, oh, of course. Yeah, Danny, I don't, dude, I don't want to talk about it, homie. Like, you guys know what, you guys know how I am. I'm usually not zero tolerance about anything. I think that zero tolerance is stupid. Zero tolerance is a good way to indicate to somebody that you have zero tolerance for common sense. But, yeah, I'm not talking about that stuff, bro. You linked the you linked a picture of the size of the thing. Oh, the Madur Festival. No. Yeah, that thing is big, dude. I totally misjudged the size. I do an approach to the freaking lights are flashing in a bent floor cup. There is a little whirlpool for the graphic, mate. See, yeah, Chops, you you know, you're saying, oh, you could probably make the motors electric. Now, now what I'm wondering is, you know, airplanes, airplanes, right, have, um, airplanes have tur turbo fans on them, right? They have a bypass turbo fan, and that generates thrust. Now, what about a hybrid airplane that just has an APU in the back that generates electricity, and then you have electric motor ducted fans underneath the wings? Could that, that could generate as much thrust. And now the real question is, would it use up as much electricity? Or was it, would it use up, would it use the same amount of fuel or would it be more fuel efficient? The APU is heavy. I mean, chow dubs, it's nothing that a plane doesn't already have. That's a lot of weight, boss. I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, the APU would have to be insane. It would have to be really big to be able to generate, like, have two ducted fans generate, like, 500 kilonewtons of thrust or, some, uh, thrust or something. I think that's the... In Chops, the reason why I asked this question is, well, that's the reason why they're using a hydraulic flow control system, because that... You're, yeah, because a hybrid plane doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Energy is lost when it has to be converted. Yeah, so am I when I listen to you. Got him. Hmm. Interesting. Reports, no wings. Okay. Yeah, that has wings. That's a, uh, a Magnus Effect plane. Yeah, it has wings. They're just spinning, like it. Yeah. Magnus Effect's cool. Great Scott! <laughs> How about a nuclear powered drone? That's like the size of a... Okay. All right. What if we just took a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier and we just put gigantic ducted fans on the sides that run off electricity? It's not like the nuclear-powered carrier wouldn't be able to generate enough electricity to keep them going. You know what I'm saying? Like... I mean... Could look like that. It would look really nice. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is from anything or anything. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no. I mean, like, the Hell Carrier's not that far-fetched of an idea now, is it? I mean, those fans, though. Those fans would have to...
those fans would have to be insane, insanely big, and they would have to generate an insane amount of thrust. Yeah, uh, can you imagine, Devlin, every time this thing wanted to go land in the water, it would cause a tsunami. It would cause a freaking tidal wave. Wouldn't that be loud? Yeah. But the things that it launches are also loud, so, you know, whatever. <sighs> Interesting. Imagine the vibrations with those fans. Well, Kobe, if they were contra-rotating fans, so if you had the front right and the back left spinning in unison, and the front left and the back right spinning in unison, they would cancel the vibrations out. It would actually be a really smooth ride. Like, it would be like a big drone, only nuclear-powered and f flying. How much thrust would you need to generate to get an aircraft carrier to lift out of the water? The real I issue is, imagine landing a plane right in between all those turb turb turbulence and vortexes that those props make. I mean, it wouldn't... You'd have to basically crash the plane onto the flight deck, which is not something that doesn't happen anyway. I wonder how fast the blades that size would have to turn to provide enough lift. Yeah, Devlin, I know, I know. We're, it doesn't really make a lot of practical sense on the battlefield, but also at the same time, I want a floating aircraft carrier. could build one in KSB and find out. We could build one in KSB and find out. But yeah. All right. Anyway, fellas, it's about 7.30. I put in... I, I haven't really streamed a lot today. We only did six hours. But also at the same time, I'm a little bit on the tired side because of uh, reasons. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to play any games tonight, dudes. I, I know. I know. I... I probably should, but uh, I'll be 100% real. I didn't really feel like streaming today. <laughs> you could put two and two together as to why. Um, I streamed because I, I, you know, I thought the Europe, people from Europe would probably need something to watch. So, so no Navy satellite video, John. We could watch it for break tomorrow, dude. Nice, is you, Uber? Yeah. Don't forget I talked you into it. Yeah, whatever. Gonna leave me alone in the sea of Elden Ring? Don't do this to me. I don't know what that means, Toasted. I'll be honest with you. Cool, that channel sends a good content. Yeah, and if it's U.S. Navy, John, it's public public resource, which means we should be able to watch it. Oh, yeah, let's get physical, let's stay. So, yeah... Rest up for the Starlink launch tomorrow, indeed. So, yeah, were you discussing drones earlier? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um, so, yeah, fellas, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it a little bit early tonight. Uh, but yeah, I I really wanted to be here today for uh, folks that watch that are in the um, uh, that are in Eastern Europe. Uh, but yeah, most of those folks probably are asleep by now, so. I'm, uh, for the rest of us over here, yeah, it's been a tough day, uh, but probably not as tough as those guys have it, so I put on my brave face today, but I, I really didn't, I really didn't want to stream. <laughs> I didn't really feel like it, man. But I, I will say, you guys are actually pretty good today. I thought, I thought chat was going to be a nightmare today, so thanks for being cool, and, uh, yeah, keep, uh, keep those folks overseas in your thoughts, all right? This whole thing sucks, man. But, hey, it is what it is. We'll get through it. So, I'm going to head off. Let's see who we can raid. Uh, but, yeah, I just, I'm just a little exhausted over the past couple of days. Now, I'm going to rest up. I'm going to get some sleep tonight. And, uh...
We'll see where we can go from there. Let's go see what Tarader's up to. He's working on his Minecraft save with the Nether Pit. Uh, and let's go from there. I'm ready to move to Mars after today. Yep. He has a wig on. He does have a wig on. I All right. Okay. So go see what he's up to, guys. I'll talk to you guys all tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, same time, same place. We got a Starlink launch tomorrow, so that should hopefully uh, keep us a little bit distracted. We It is basically, well, 12.08 p.m. That's, yeah, right right at the start time. So, yeah, right, right when I start, there's a Falcon 9 going. So I'll be here probably a little bit earlier than my regular start time uh, to get into that Starlink launch. Noon time tomorrow, we got a Falcon 9 launching out of Vandenberg, Starlink 38. Which is pretty cool, um, John. I know you asked a little bit earlier. Yeah, I'll cover the I'll cover the electron launch. Um, yeah, so I should I should be able to cover it at least.